Uh, good morning, dear friends. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all this Sunday morning. Uh, the 2nd of August, the first weekend of August, where we usually have our August of Thalmika, which is the flagship program of the Cochin of Thalmi Club. Uh, we have been having it for the past uh, about 17, 18 years now. And this is the first time that we are going uh, on a full webinar. We initially even thought of having a, a small meeting and then beaming it live. Then finally, we decided against that. So we are, we are having a full webinar like our like we have every Sunday. But this is a very special day as far as Cochin of Thalmi Club is concerned. Uh, in the inaugural function, uh, I'll be briefing about the short history of August of Thalmika. Uh, Narana Gutti sir will be uh, introducing uh, late Professor Gopinath Menon to the, uh, to the audience. And uh, Davis will be introducing the oration recipient, uh, Dr. A. Girida. So without much delay, I request uh, uh, the Cochin of Thalmi Club Secretary, Dr. Gopal S. Pillai, uh, to make a brief opening remark and then the panelists for the first session will take over. Dr. Gopal, please. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the August of Talmika theme this time is preferred practice patterns, protocols, and perspectives. So uh, basically, this time we have uh, increased the time for discussion. And we have a case-based or problem-based diagnostic and management approach. So each of the uh, speakers will be speaking on a problem in a particular patient. It is not necessarily a full case presentation, but that is a starting point where you start about that. And then how to diagnose, manage, what are the preferred practice approaches is what we will be discussing. And the major change from usual webinars is that we have given ample time for discussion, as much time for didactics, as much for discussion. And I think we will, all the uh, faculty and uh, panelists will make great use of it. Without moving um, uh, you know, much into that, I will basically invite Dr. Sanita Satyan and Dr. Laila Mohan are the speakers of this pediatric ophthalmology session. And uh, Dr. Elizabeth, jo Elizabeth Joseph, Dr. Meena CK, and uh, Dr. Nina R would be the panelists for discussion. So let the pediatric ophthalmology start. Over to you, Elizabeth Madam. Uh, Meena CK and uh, Nina. Sanita can share your presentation. Okay, sir. A very good morning to all of you. I hope my screen is visible to all and yes. I'm audio. Yes, it's visible. Okay. okay. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank COC for having me here as the opening batsman of uh, August of Telmica 2020. So I'll be dealing with refraction and spectacle prescription in a child who is five years old. I'm sorry, uh, I'm just skipping this. So uh, at five years, we know the children are usually a little cranky when they come to uh, ocular examination. Most of them are pre-literate and poor subjective responses is another issue. And you have to deal with a child who has a very short attention span and to elicit maximum responses from such a child. So these are the major challenges. What I usually do in any child uh, is this uh, algorithm, like in a five-year-old, we usually go for a visual acuity screening first, followed by auto refraction or other photo screeners also may be used. We always try for a subjective refraction and we also do a dry retinoscopy if possible. And then we ask uh, for a cycloplegic retinoscopy. Following this, I usually take a um, auto refractometric reading and the cycloplegia also. Uh, we can give uh, spectacles then and there, but always you can call the child for a post test also. So this is the usual algorithm in a 
uh, child. But when you uh, consider a child who is five year old, the child may be pre-literate. If the child can read a snail in, well and good. But otherwise, you will have to go for all these charts, which are age appropriate visual acuity charts for children. Uh, we have Lee Symbols chart, uh, HOTV ch chart, K pictures, LN pictures, Land.C. All these charts give uh, approximate values of visual acuity in uh, log mass. And these could be used instead of the routine Snellen screening. Then we could use the autorefractors. So there are various autorefractors available in the market. And for children, especially, we have the Retinomax, Welshaline Suresight um, um, screener, and also the Plus Optics photo screener. Uh, I have had experience with Plus Optics and uh, Welshaline Suresight, and most of the literature says that it is, uh, they are very good in terms of screening for mass screening. And our own data has said that even for um, uh, in the clinic also, they do give reliable values. But again, you will have to uh, substantiate your findings with a cycloplegic or a dry retinoscopy. So subjective refraction, we always try for subjective refraction in a small kit, but the reliability of measurements is always questionable. Some children may be very cooperative and you could get a reliable measurements while others may not. So uh, in children, basically what we do is I try to get maximum amount of data possible. Like uh, I look for AR cycloplegic, AR after uh, cycloplegic dry retinoscopy, subjective retinoscopy, because you don't want to err in these children and you, you will have to uh, rely more on objective methods uh, for giving a suitable uh, prescription. Cycloplegia is mandatory because in children we know accommodative uh, is, is very uh, strong and it is mandatory to relax accommodation. You have to instill the uh, cycloplegic drops and attain complete cycloplegia before doing cycloplegic retinoscopy because incomplete cycloplegia can lead to false estimation of refractive errors. So this uh, is categorically stated in this paper because uh, do we need atropine always? Atropine is not needed always because even cyclopentylate uh, is good enough uh, with less uh, duration of action when compared to atropine. So for clinical purposes, cyclopentylate uh, can uh, replace atropine, but in laboratory studies, they say there is a little bit of difference. So uh, although we are talking about refraction, these additional tests are very good and very useful when uh, children are concerned. Like you have to test for near vision, accommodation, convergence, always do a cover and uncover test, and also a basic stereo acuity measurements, because these are also indications of uh, visual functions in these children. Coming to the prescription of uh, glasses. So the most important concern in uh, while uh, doing children's retinoscopy, I think is when to prescribe and how much to prescribe. So uh, to answer these questions, we have a lot of guidelines. We have the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus guidelines. I think all of us must be familiar with this. This usually gives the uh, guidelines for prescription. Uh, in children up to two to three years of age. And the guidelines are based upon the presence of refractive error, type of refractive error, magnitude, and also the presence of anisometropia or ESO deviation. Similarly, we have a Indian guideline also, national consensus statement regarding pediatric eye examination. Uh, as pediatric ophthalmologists, most of us are very familiar with these guidelines and we go usually roughly according to these guidelines. So the workup of a child with refractive error uh, at five years would essentially be answering these three basic questions. One, is this error amblyogenic? Two, is this error significant for the age-related visual needs of the child? Three, will this error cause any effect on strabismus if present? So if you are answering in affirmative to any of these questions, so prescribe the glasses, that is what the guidelines say, even if there is no subjective response. As I told, we rely here more on objective measurements than the subjective response. So the, all the guidelines say, if you have an amblyogenic factor, which is uh, interfering with the proper uh, development of the child, you have to uh, sort it out at uh, appropriate age. 
So this would be a basic framework for uh, workup of uh, such young children. And again, uh, we have to consider the process of emetropization also, because uh, around six years, seven years, uh, the eye is slowly changing from an emetropic state to an emetropic state. So I've put this graphs because, uh, see, this is at three months of age. This is a normal distribution. This is the distribution of uh, refractive errors in children who are three months of age. Again, this is a normal Gaussian kind of distribution, but you can see that it's a more uh, uh, the, uh, central tendencies are actually spread apart. But when you come towards uh, a little bit uh, higher age group, say nine months, you can have a bit more concentration of the central tendencies here. But when you uh, talk about an adult, this is the normal distribution of re uh, refractive errors. So from very young age group through uh, uh, teenage to adulthood, the children are correcting their emetropias to a more emetropic distribution. So this is called as emetropization. And at five years and six years, the child is undergoing a lot of changes in terms of uh, axial length, in terms of uh, corneal curvature and the lens uh, curvature. Uh, this has also to be taken into account when describing the glasses. So let's discuss each refractive error at a five-year-old girl. A five-year-old five kid. So uh, usually the child will be in preschool. So in school-going children at five years, it is always better to give a full correction. Uh, Overcorrecting myopia can lead to use of more accommodative effort. So and this can lead to accommodative spasm and esotropia. I usually give the full correction in case of uh, myopia in school children. But then when I say this, uh, it's, uh, sometimes a child may be coming with 0.5, minus 0.5 of uh, uh, sphere. And then uh, the child, if the child has a, a, a specific complaint, we can always ask the child uh, for a cycloplegic retinoscopy. And again, uh, for a five-year child, if it is not that troublesome, we can always wait and watch. Ask the child for a follow-up. And uh, if it is more than um, minus one diopter or so, and if it is significant, uh, we have to give the correction. So I would like to say that although the guidelines say that um, up to uh, 612 uh, visual acuity is okay in myopic children, most of our children, uh, they are more demanding as far as the visual tasks are uh, concerned especially in this age of online classes also there is more role of correcting small refractive errors any child with symptoms i think it is better to correct and very small ch children you can do a cycloplegic ret retinoscopy and ask them for a follow-up also so for each child also this is a little bit customized and uh, guidelines are uh, guidelines we have to uh, make our clinical decisions depending on each patient Hypermetropia is a little more tricky because we know there is more risk of amblyopia. And hypermetropes with ESO deviation, we know, we give the full cycloplegic correction. And in other uh, uh, small amounts of hypermetropia also, we need to be very careful while correcting these young adults, young children. And uncorrected hypermetropic child, usually by use of excess accommodation, the child will be able to see clearly for near. So when you introduce glasses to this child, Initially, the accommodation may take some time to relax. So you have to warn the patients and the parents that the vision may be blurred for initial, say, one week or so. But uh, you have to continue wearing glasses for better compliance. So astigmatism. Astigmatism, I think, is very common in our population. Uh, small uh, astigmatism like minus 0.5 uh, or 0.75 can cause a lot of asthenopic symptoms, especially when the child is going to higher classes. And the aim of refractive correction is basically to give a focused retinal image. So uh, any child presenting with uh, symptoms or any child who uh, reads even six, six parts uh, should be considered for correction, uh, taking care of other factors also. And astigmatism can also produce something called as meridional amblyopia, which usually resolves after proper refractive correction. But what you, uh, I think more important about astigmatism is that sometimes we, uh, we find children who are not corrected fully uh, uh, the astigmatic error. These children may not go into a dense amblyopia also, but they always uh, present with a reduced stereoacuity, which is of course preventable at this young age. And giving uh, cylinders in children, 
uh, I usually give the full cylinder that can be tolerated. And uh, usually children tolerate cylinders better than adults. Of course, if the prescription of cylinders is right, because uh, the, uh, the, ch um, the child has mechanisms, uh, better mechanisms to deal with all these astigmatic blur and anisoconia induced changes than the adult. So don't worry, you can give whatever uh, you think is optimum for the child. No need to undercorrect in the sense. There are some special situations, like as I already told, anisometropia is a powerful amblyogenic factor. And in this case, we can always try for contact lenses also if the anisometropia is significant. Suppose the child has a unilateral high myopia of minus 10 and the other eye is emetropic with 6x. So this child is a good candidate for giving contact lenses because this clears his anisometropia better and this provides him with a better retinal image which and he has better chances of fighting amblyopia than when using spectacles. We always are concerned about the use of uh, contact lenses in such small children, but believe me, you teach them well, you uh, educate the parents, motivate the parents. Most of them do very well with contact lenses. And uh, of course, if they do not tolerate contact lenses, we do have an option of giving spectacles also. Strabismus. So as a uh, strabismus surgeon, I usually correct any small refractive error before correcting squint because it has also uh, the literature says that it has uh, many things to do with post-operative alignment and um, uh, post-operative gain of stereo acuity also. And in ch uh, children with high AC by A ratio, uh, like in a refractive accommodative isotropia with high AC by A ratio, we prefer bifocal uh, ads for near. In pseudophagic children, full correction, as there is no residual accommodation because you already you have taken out the lens. And uh, near correction, we can give bifocals or even progressive glasses. And this slide was projected because we do have many kids who are special kids in whom subjective and objective retinoscopy uh, is a little difficult because you have to see the uh, patient and then you have to put the trial frame, you have to change the lenses. All this is a little cumbersome in this special kids whose attention span is much, much low. So this is called a lens bar. You can actually flash the lens bar in front of the child. This is a very uh, uh, cheap, uh, it doesn't cost that much, but it is very useful uh, for refracting uh, kids with special needs. And uh, most often the parents ask us, will the child tolerate spectacles? These children, like those with Down syndrome, those with uh, cerebral palsies, etc., have high incidence of uh, myopia than in the normal population. Correcting these uh, errors in these children will go a long way in uh, their cognitive and also motor development also. So it's very important uh, to mention. Coming about the frames, this, this slide, uh, a child always uh, wants to use spectacles because um, it uh, adds to his uh, mental satisfaction and um, uh, appearance. So uh, educate them again uh, about the uses and uh, give them colorful frames. And those with elastic headbands are also uh, available. And uh, below you can see those with uh, soft ear support. So uh, introduce the spectacles as a status symbol to the child. Never think of it as a negative thing. Uh, and uh, this is one of the uh, tricks which we, pediatric ophthalmologists, you should routinely do in case of children. And while starting the use of spectacles, see this girl is looking over the glass. This is one common um, appearance which we get when the child initially uses the glasses, especially for small errors like a minus point, a minus one astigmatism, she can very well see without glasses. But you have to instruct the child to, uh, that you have to wear the glasses over your eyes and in front of your eyes and not over the nose. And sometimes we come to see children with a lot of damaged uh, frames and damaged lenses. Uh, the child may not always complain about uh, having a blurry vision but uh, may discard the spectacle as such. So it is very important in follow-ups to check regarding the uh, type of uh, spectacle correction they are wearing and give uh, proper advices. This helps, of course, in their better complaints. And whatever said and done, refraction and prescribing glasses is just a very small step, if I could say, in uh, preventing uh, visual impairment in children. What is more important is regular follow-up and uh, uh, steps towards 
better compliance of glasses. So worldwide, most of the studies say that the uh, compliance rights in children are very, very, very low. Once you give the spectacle at three months, it is about 20% ranging from uh, 20 to around 55 percent so more than 50 percent of children whom we prescribe glasses do not use spectacles that's from a public health point of view so uh, i think this is the issue which has to be addressed and uh, we have to uh, review them periodically and if a child is not using spectacles just talk to them and try to understand why the reason, uh, why they really do not use a spectacle. Is it because of a broken frame, a tilted frame, which makes vision even more difficult? All these are small, small issues, but they should be addressed properly and also uh, motivate the parents and give support to the children regarding their spectacle use. So I think this is the most important slide and most important thing. And a child will throw away uh, many spectacles, especially when he is five years old. But again, be persistent, try uh, asking them uh, uh, to motivate them to wear spectacles. And this is the way to go for prevention of uh, preventable blindness in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Am I audible? Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes ma'am. Okay, uh, thank you Sanita for that wonderful talk. Should we go on to the discussion or uh, is Laila madam presenting? I think we can have a very brief discussion. Yeah. Uh, because uh, Dr. Sanita has over short time. So yeah, I know. We, we can have so, a very brief discussion and then move on to the next talk. Okay, so as Sanita said, post uh, this follow-up is extremely important and um, about prescription, if you actually we wanted some scenarios in a five-year-old where we can discuss like if the child comes with a one diopter astigmatism, will you be giving glasses? A five-year-old child. Most of these children, when they yeah. come to us at five years, usually they are literate. Yeah, that I think that was uh, discussed in my talk, madam. Uh, we have to see for uh, getting a good retinal image. If it is uh, agreed upon with uh, cycloplegic retinoscopy also, it is better to correct uh, even minus one of astigmatism. Of course, you have to consider the uh, uh, visual needs of the child also. I usually correct minus one of astigmatism in five-year-olds. Because usually it's said like myopic astigmatism, you can wait for a while. More than in hypermetropic astigmatism, it's better to give glasses early. So it's like uh, most of these children at five years, we can see that they usually respond to your charts. And so you can always wait and give them glasses because it keeps on changing. So as uh, Sanita mentioned, this follow-up is extremely important. So maybe the first visit maybe could be at least three months after giving glasses. So we can see, and many a times the child will refuse to wear glasses. Then make it a point to check the PG power, which is very important because they might be purchasing it from somewhere else and the cylinder could be wrong. So that is a very important point. So anything to add Nina and Elizabeth, madam? Yeah, uh, as Dr. Nina said, I think uh, astigmatism, uh, one diopter or less, probably we can wait in a five-year-old child. But I also would like to add a point. Before doing all the cycloplegic refraction and autorefractometer checkings, I usually prefer to watch the child in my clinic, how they enter the clinic, how they watch the television, how, how are they on a distant object viewing. You know, sometimes you get clues uh, regarding head postures because parents' complaints would be like mm -hmm. child is keeping an abnormal head posture or squeezing eyes. So if any of these symptoms are there, then I may actually consider giving glasses, even if the refractive error is mild. Also, if there is any squint association uh, with squint or uh, any other abnormal ocular findings, uh, which uh, may help if I give the glasses. So these are the other things which I look. I prefer to watch the child viewing a distant object and uh, near object. Also, I, I like to see the stereopsis if it's possible, how the stereopsis is. Okay, can we, uh, Madam is there, Elizabeth, Madam? Yeah. Uh, uh, madam. Madam. Madam has to unmute. Madam yeah, has to unmute. Yeah, yeah, I would like to add uh, two things uh, to this talk. Dr. Sanita, you have done wonderful. You have covered the topic exhaustively. One, uh, one thing is that um, you can give glasses for um, cerebral visual impairment. Many of these children may be having accommodative problems. So uh, a plus two for an accommodative uh, correction in a cerebral visual impairment and some special children. That is very good. And another thing is that um, in this current situation, many people are using 
uh, atropine for prevention of progression of myopia. That also is very widely used now. And uh, as a message to the audience, I would say that 0.01% uh, um, atropine is now routinely used uh, to prevent uh, progression of myopia. I just wanted to add these two things to your talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. One more point. What about using of progressive lenses in high myopia? Because we get so many patients coming from abroad who come with progressive lenses and asking us whether we should continue this and what are your experiences, madam? Yes, sir. Under correction of myopia, is, uh, is some people say that it is uh, it will prevent progression of myopia. Under correction for near. Uh, in that perspective, people are giving uh, progressive glasses. Uh, but, you know, uh, recent set studies, many studies do not substantiate this. And uh, current uh, guideline by Myopia Institute, which is already published, says that there is uh, not much use giving it. But uh, anyway, you can try that. But uh, it's not proved beyond doubt that undercorrecting myopia for near will prevent the progression. That is not uh, proved beyond doubt. But still people are giving. Okay. Can we go on to the next? Okay. Yeah, I think we can go to the next talk. Next talk. We have only 10 more minutes, I think. 12 yeah, minutes. Back. No, I think okay. we can go till 8.45. Okay, fine. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yes, yes madam. Okay. So I'll straight ahead, go ahead with the uh, topic. It is esotropia in a five-year-old child. So convergent strabismus or esotropia can easily be categorized etiologically into essential accommodative, cyclical, sensory, or paralytic or restrictive by a proper history taking and meticulous examination. Since amblyopia is common in long-standing mm -hmm. esotropia, as already mentioned, uh, immediate treatment should be instituted in a five-year-old child. So there are a lot of clues from history. Was it there before six months of age? Then it points to an essential isotropia or a Duane's or a congenital six nerve palsy. And birth history uh, and neurological issues are important because it's more common in these children. Mm -hmm. And an onset after two to three years points to accommodative component. And is it switching between the two eyes? Is it there all the time or variable when concentrating more for near work? All these point to accommodative component. And the best time to observe is as the child is brought in, is there a head posture which points to an incompetent uh, uh, strabismus? And here you can see a face turn to left, uh, which may indicate a left lateral lepus palsy or a Duane's. So observe child's behavior as and when you take history and establish a good rapport. And even before actual checking of visual equity, you can look for any fixation preference by a simple cover test. A simple cover test, you can see a prominent epicanthus or a small IPD can produce a pseudoisotropia, which is very common. So a cover test with an equal visual equity and no movement under cover shows that it is a pseudoisotropia. And here you can see there is a, uh, you can also get an uh, idea of whether he has a, she has an amblyopia. Here there is a left isotropia. She is taking up central fixation, but not maintained. It goes back to uh, LET again. And versions and ductions are very important. Uh, here you can see a freely alternating isotropia. There is a dextroversion. There is a, a, a um, uh, restricted dextroversion in right eye. You have to cover the other eye and see whether there is abduction restriction as well. And over elevation in adduction, as we call now, so pointing to inferior oblique overaction is very important to rule out because this uh, this uh, um, uh, changes modifies our plan of management. Uh, and there is a V pattern, as you can see with an inferior oblique overaction. And uh, a full ophthalmic evaluation with fundus and slit lamp to rule out any sensory component. And visual equity has been already discussed. Measurement of deviation. Hirschberg is not the ideal because it can overestimate uh, uh, nesotropia. And uh, prism bar cover test is the ideal. With and without glasses, if the, patient, if the child is wearing glasses and for near and far. And a full cycloplegic refraction Especially in an isotropic child, it is better to do an atropine refraction and give full hypermetropic correction even before the atropine wears off. There is no need to look for a post-midriatic test. You can give the full correction 
so that the child will be more compliant to wear glasses even when the atropine effect is there. And if it is of acute onset of isotropy at five years, and if there is no hypermetropia, then further investigations may be necessary and neuroimaging may have to be done. In a child at five, these are the broadly we have to see, look for committent and incommittent. Committent, uh, these are the uh, accommodative is essential isotropia, sensory, cyclic, and acute onset, which we will discuss, and incompetent, either paralytic or veins. Accommodative is the uh, chunk of isotropes at five years are accommodative, accounting for about 45 to 50 percent of them. And it may be either fully accommodative, partially accommodative, refractive, and also accommodative, non-refractive. So let us see the accommodative refractive. Uh, here, the child comes with an intermittent squinting at five years, which has been there since some uh, one or two years. And there is an uncorrected hypermetropia. There is accommodative convergence, which produces the convergence screen. So as soon as you give a full correction of hypermetropia, the child uh, becomes straight, usually. The onset is usually two to six years. And nowadays, it is earlier due to the use of mobiles. And atropin refraction and full hypermetropy correction should be given. And they should be followed up every four to six months. Follow up is very important, as already pointed out in refraction uh, by Dr. Sanita and others. And uh, in these children, especially so, because up to seven years, you may have to increase the PUP plus correction. And thereafter, you must reduce in steps of 0.5, following muscle balance also along with that to facilitate immetropization as already pointed out by Dr. Sanita. Immetropization in children is very important. So undercorrected accommodative isotropia, if you do not follow them up to fully correct the hypermetropia, this leads to constant deviation and even with glasses and lead to amblyopia. Here you can see this child was fully corrected with plus three. And loss of follow-up, she comes with a decompensated uh, isotropia. And here you have to do a repeat atropin refraction, a full correction. And once amblyopia develops, then is isotropia may not be fully corrected and they become partially accommodated. Here, this child presented after three years of onset of isotropia. There is a large left isotropia with the left amblyopia, 70 prisms without glass, 40 prisms with plus four. Vision was 66636, and after patching six hours, he was followed up and he improved to 618 in left eye after three months. And repeat atropin refraction was done, which did not change the refraction. So we went ahead and did a recess resection in the left eye, and he improved to eight prisms esophoria only. And it has to be continued with patching. And he improved to 6.9 partial with six, uh, in six months. The most important point here is surgery has to be done only for the residual isotropia, not the full isotropia. Here, 40 prisms was corrected by the research resection. And then this is the non-refractive accommodative isotropia where an accommodative convergence AC by A ratio is very high. So when near isotropia is more than 10 prisms or more, more than the distant devi deviation, even after full correction of hypermetropia, if there is any, there need not be hypermetropia. That means near he is dissociating. So we have to give a bifocal add of plus 2.5 or three. So bif bifocals, it's very important to see, see this child uh, is isotropic when he is looking through the upper segment and becomes ortho when he is looking through the uh, bifocal uh, lower segment. So that is very important when they don't use it properly and they are not compliment to, uh, com, uh, uh, compliant to use uh, bifocals, then you have to go ahead and do a medial rectus posterior fixation with or without recession. So now we come to another big uh, chunk of children who may come at five years, not corrected earlier. It should have been corrected much earlier, essentially isotropia. The onset is before six months. And Pedig has shown it is not at birth, as we say, congenital, it does not, doesn't uh, appear at birth. And a constant large isotropia freely alternating with visual equity equal and cyclorefraction was normal, then you go ahead and do a bilateral BMR, bilateral medial rectus recession. If hypermetropic, then try prescribing uh, hypermetropic correction. 
see him after another month and do the uh, uh, prismbar cover test to see if the deviation is different if amblyopic you have to start patching and if once vision improves resource resection of the isotropic eye and patching has to be continued it's very important that these children be followed up for amblyopia management so in this children early surgery by one year is has more likelihood of maintaining alignment and some peripheral fusion at 5 years alignment may be achieved but no stereopsis and associated amblyopia nystagmus inferoblique overaction dvd all these should be looked for and plan of surgery will have to be modified accordingly and in if there is inferoblique overaction or dvd inferoblique resection or inferoblique anteriorization may have to be done von noden has said 70% of these children may go for oblique overaction or dvd now we come to sensory isotopia which has to be ruled out at the onset by a detailed fundus examination and to rule out any macular pathology toxoplasmic uh, macular scar is not uncommon media opacities a slit lamp examination to rule out a corneal or lenticular opacity and even a subtle corneal opacity can produce isotropia you can see there is a posterior polar cataract in this child very small but he presented with the isotropia then we have to correct the uh, do surgery for the cataract and uh, even uh, uh, dm tear you can see there is a vertical decimet tear uh, due to birth injury can also produce a isotropia later so management is primary pathology has to be corrected if, uh, and refractive correction is very important and then start patching acute onset acquired con concomitant uh, non accommodative isotropia Uh, it occurs by about five or uh, year, five years or above, and uh, it presents with diplopia in older children. Younger children, five years, they may not say about diplopia also, and it is not uncommon as previously thought. About uh, Mihir Gautari has shown a ten percent incidence of uh, isotropes presenting with acute onset. We do see many acute onset acquired non-accommodative isotropia. Uh, probably due to mobile use also there are some papers saying that near vision uh, and digital media is contributing to this also and meticulous evaluation to rule out six nerve palsy even if competent neuro evaluation is a must after ruling out any accommodative component is in these cases if no problems after neuro evaluation follow them every six weeks to pa and patch alternate eyes to see that both eyes they don't go for amblyopia and after 6 months if it is a stable isotropia go ahead with surgical correction cyclic isotropia this boy was brought with complaints of intermittent squinting on alternate days Inter uh, intelligent parents uh, say about the periodic nature every 24 to 48 hours ophthalmic evaluation normal and regular periodic nature gives the clue it's not very common but we do see one or two a year and they become constant usually when surgery has to be done so uh, this is the committent isotropes and in committent isotropia mostly duvains isotropic duvains drs type 1 they present with the face turn and palpebral fissure changes as you can see here and very minimal face turn uh, can be uh, uh, managed by observation and give refractive correction if there is even small refractive correction should be corrected surgery can wait and only if there is marked head first as you see here there is a up shoot and down shoot in a drs then for cosmetic purposes we may have to do the surgery and paralytic uh, this 5 year old child was um, brought after a fall with a, an abnormal head posture on examination there was face turn to right and paral uh, on the right paralytic side abduction was minus 3 isotropia more when he pitched with the paralytic right side if a paralytic isotropia has acute onset and it has to be neurologically investigated by mri or ct if you suspect a bony defect botulinum toxin injection may be tried to restore early binocularity which reduces diplopia also and surgical correction only after 6 months of stable deviation rarely a blunt trauma Uh, produces a white type blowout fracture of medial wall which can produce medial rectus entrapment in a fall after a fall this has to be ruled out by a ct scan and uh, in children at this age fdt is not possible in the op clinic you may have to do it on the table so the take home messages are a good majority are accommodative so rule out accommodative isotropia repeat cycloplegic refraction if not fully corrected 
only residual deviation should be surgically corrected. Essential isotropes to be surgically corrected as early as possible. Amblyopia to be managed before surgery and it has to be continued even after surgery. Acute onset acquired may need imaging and neuroevaluation. Follow-up is the most important, even in refractive curves, as, you, as she has already, um, Dr. Sanita has already mentioned. And in these children, follow-up is very, very important, most important. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Nina, you were discussing something, no? Yeah. Can you continue uh, with that? Uh, yeah. yeah, actually, I wanted to add a point. Uh, very often we see isot myopes with isotropia. So uh, one thing is always check uh, whether they have a very high AC by ratio for near. So some of them may be ortho for distance with their myopic glasses. And suppose they are having isotropia for near with their myopic glasses. It's a good idea to give them uh, progressives or bifocals so that, you know, that isotropia can be taken care of. That's yeah. one condition that you can give bifocals. So isotropia of myopia I have not discussed here because uh, it is not very common, but we do come across in a high myope also. Isotropia for distance also we do see them. So and also uh, that's true, madam, because I think we should discuss because hypermetropia, everyone knows that you have to give full correction. But there are so many children, they come with high myopia and with an ET. So in such yes, cases, what will be your problem. management? Yes, but so under correction a confusing not, scenario. Hmm. Under correction does not you always correct when there is a high myopia, under correction does not always correct the isotropia. So we may have to deal with the isotropia. After full evaluation, as Dr. Nina pointed out, a high AC by A ratio has to be also looked for. We have only one more minute left. Yeah, there are two scenarios. One is an isotropia, especially an ROP child comes with isotropy and high myopia. For distance and near, I think you can give the myopic correction and see what happens to the isotropia later if required as the child, uh, you know, put them on patch and then do surgery. But if the isotropia is only for near, always go back and re-refract if possible with atropin and see that you are not overcorrected the myopia. Because an overcorrected myopia can also uh, present yeah. with isotropia. True. So that's a very uh, important thing which I've learned. Mm -hmm. The second thing is if the isotropia is only for near, do look at the AC by ratio. And I've had children who do very well with bifocals uh, because you may need to give a little less minus for near. Yes, uh, uh, yes uh, bifocals we can give for if isotropia is for near, but quite often we see isotropia for far rather than near also in myopes and high myopes. Uh, you have to think about hypoaccommodative type also. Hy hypoaccommodative isotropia also can occur because the they're, uh, they're, they have defective near vision. Distant vision may be normal and they have, uh, in that case also you can give a bifocal. I would like to ask the opinion of Dr. Laila about active vision therapy in amblyopia. Is convergence screen with amblyopia, do you give only occlusion or do you give any active vision therapy? So along with the mo most, uh, most of the amblyopes, I give along with amblyopia uh, patching, uh, active, uh, I mean, near vision uh, with tablets also, I encourage them using tablets. Nowadays, we are, uh, re um, we are asked no, uh, asked to advise against tab gadgets but uh, in amblyopia i do advise them to use their these uh, mm. uh, uh, games along with patching especially when patching they can be given these gadgets to encourage active stimulation i do good very good okay i think, so I think uh, we have to wind up now it's already 8 46 yes. so thank you everyone uh, it was a wonderful discussion. Maybe we could have discussed a little more, but still, I think time is up. So maybe we'll hand over it to the Oculoplasty team. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, uh, we will, we will, without any further delay, we will move on to Dr. Marian Poli and Dr. Annie Sridhar, who are speaking on uh, specific case scenarios of ptosis and proptosis, and to the Oculoplasty panel including Dr. Uh, e. Ravindra Mohan, Dr. Fairuz, and Dr. Sujitra. Uh, please stick to time as we have a lot of talks and a lot of discussions to follow. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Gopal and all friends. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gopal and Cochin Ophthalmological Society for this 
wonderful opportunity to be part of this academic uh, feast today. Hi, Dr. Uh, Marian, and hi, yeah. Dr. Annie. Hi, Dr. Ravindra Mohan. Yeah, hi, all. Hi. Yeah. Good morning, all. Yeah, good morning, all. Yeah, hope uh, I can start. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. My screen is visible. You can start, start yeah, and yeah, keep yeah. to time. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Visible and audible. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you, uh, COC, for giving me this opportunity. So I'm just discussing about the moderate doses in a 52-year-old uh, patient, basically. Lady man, I changed. Uh, just to brief, like two measurements in uh, doses evaluation, palpable fissure height, margin reflex distance, LPS action, margin increased distance. So my first case is a 55-year-old female, grouping since one year, gradually increasing, uh, gradually increasing over a period of one year. There is a mild uh, increase towards the evening, but no diplopia, um, <clears throat> no other systemic comorbidities like diabetes or hypertension. She had uh, both sides intraocular surgery, cataract surgery three years back. So this is my first case. On evaluating the throsis, she has got a PFH right eye 11, left eye five millimeters, MRD1 plus 4 in the right eye, left eye minus 1. LPS action 16 both eyes. Margin crease distance 6 and uh, 12. Uh, Bells is good. Ocular motility is full. Then we, I have done eye test. Eye test is negative. Then uh, her rings <coughs> on lifting the left eye, the right eye is drooping a little bit. How to proceed with this case? Eyes open for discussion. I thought I will present one case scenario and will put for discussion what to do. Right. I think so. Vision is normal. Vision fundus, everything is normal. Yeah. And in down gaze, the yeah, down gaze of is increasing. Upper, yes, down gaze the doses is, is increasing. Increasing, yeah. And the head crease distance. Yeah, it is more. It is right. more in the left eye compared to the right eye. And also the uh, fatigue test. Yeah, fatigue test I did, it is negative. She gave a history yeah. of uh, increase in ptosis towards the evening. But Belsi is good. Uh, fatigability is negative. Eyes test is negative. And ocular motility is full. And any right. surgery, previous intraocular surgery? Yeah, she had a cataract surgery three years back. Under periorbital block. Yeah, under periorbital block. In our hospital only. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Just a couple of quick, quick uh, questions. Yeah. The first, first is, of course, did you find any kind of a supratarsal thinning? If yeah. you just compared the region yes. above the tarsal plate. Yeah. There so, is a. Uh, when you look, I uh, sorry, I don't have the down gaze picture. Actually, okay. there is a minimal supratarsal thinning here. You can see here okay. the. Uh, full, the focus sure. is full, yeah. Yeah, so with this kind of a clinical picture that is increased lid crease uh, distance, yes. the, the margin crease distance, uh -huh. age, previous cataract surgery as uh, Madam asked with the block and um, negative eye spec test and clearly some kind of a supratarsal thinning. Yeah. I think the diagnosis is very clear and one can proceed possibly with yeah. surgical Upper management. Yeah. So this is a clear-cut case of uh, upper neurotic ptosis. I did LPS reattachment under local anesthesia. Uh, just to share one another case, this is again a case of upper neurotic ptosis. It is bilateral. Actually, patient came for left eye ptosis because left eye ptosis is more compared to the right eye. Uh, so I operated left eye and you can see the right eye has drooped. So this is a bilateral upper neurotic ptosis. Uh, for which we did uh, bilateral LPC attachment under local anesthesia. He did well. Okay, now I'll move I to the to next. Comment one. something, uh, Marian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So basically, yes, it's a very classical presentation of an acquired aponeurotic ptosis in an old patient. Yeah. So in your first case, when we saw, like there is a little bit of eyelid retraction. Yes. Right. And yeah. mainly it's due to the herring's phenomenon. Fine. But then we should always, uh, you know, warn these patients before going for the surgery that, you know, since it is a bilateral condition in this old patient that the other eye might droop subsequently yes. and you might need a surgery because there yeah. are instances when the surgeon doesn't, uh, you know, counsel accordingly, they might come back to you telling that you touched one eye and the other eye started, uh, you know, drooping. Yeah. So all these things have to be taken care during counseling. Yeah. 
Uh, we, routinely, we, do, we know TOSIS evaluation is a 14 point uh, clinical examination. Since because of the lack of time, I'm not putting the, all the 14 things in all the pictures, I'm putting only relevant things. Okay. So, coming to my second case. So, which approach, excuse me, which Let, is it anterior approach, anterior approach or approach. Approach. Let approach. Let Anterior approach, yeah. Uh, so, coming to the next case, uh, he is a 55 year old presented to us for a defective vision and drooping this long standing defective vision since 40 years and drooping of eyelids since 30 years <clears throat> and she is a known diabetic and hypertension on treatment so this is her clinical picture we can see uh, <clears throat> there is a eyebrow elevation frontalis is uh, actually there is frontalis overaction but not very obvious to more or less uh, severe ptosis in the left eye and uh, moderate to severe ptosis in the right eye. Orbicularis tone is weak. She is a high myopia and a retinal detachment in the left eye. Her motility is restricted in all directions. Um, elevation, depression, adduction, abduction. Eyes test is negative. Fatigability is negative. Bells is poor. So now what next? I mean, this is... Uh, what next in this case can be done? Even though she came for defective vision, she was evaluated in retina department and uh, advised uh, observation because uh, left eye had a long-standing retina detachment. Now she wants to see more clearly in the right eye. So now how to proceed? So yeah. basically any Any fund, other fundus changes here? Yeah, like she had like myopic it. changes in the right eye, retina detachment in the left eye that was already taken care of by the retina department. Any family history, Marian, uh, of no. uh, Actually, she doesn't have any family history. Um, only thing, it is very long standing. Uh, she is now 55, started at the age of 25. It was gradually progressing. No yeah. diplopia, no diagonal variation. So this is basically a case of uh, ptosis along with external ophthalmoplegia. Yes. Right, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, you have done eyes test. Which yeah, is I have negative. done eyes test. It is negative. Yeah, so two things that we would think of in such scenarios would be early onset, you know, uh, progressive uh, external ophthalmoplegia along with blepharoptosis. One would be definitely ocular myasthenia gravis. We want to rule it out. Yes. Same thing would be a chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. We right. all know that eye test is very specific. It's almost 98% specific. Uh, but despite having a negative eye test, we would definitely want to go and evaluate for a ocular myasthenia first because it can be conservatively managed and patients really respond good to, you know, pyridostigmand and other conservative management. So was it done, Marian? Yeah, actually, she underwent a neurology evaluation to rule out ocular myasthenia almost five years back and I already ruled out ocular myasthenia. And she no specific family history also. Yeah. All right. Marianne, a couple of things I need to add. I yeah. more or less agree with what Dr. Fairuz mentioned. Uh, yes, sir. But uh, uh, the few things that we need to do is how being one-eyed, actually, she's virtually one-eyed. Yeah. She would have a lot of difficulty and would have to keep lifting her lid. Yes. Uh, yeah. No, in few selected cases, mm. you know, this is all capitals, underlined, bold, yeah. black, or bold red. In few selected cases, a limited silicon sling in an educated patient living near a health facility with a clear explanation that if the cornea doesn't handle the exposure, we would reverse it. So with mm -hmm. all these riders, a few cases, in fact, in younger patients, I have done more, like a girl who had to get married and then she's been good for about 12, 13 years. In an elderly person, the problems are even more compounded if you do rule out dry eye. And then if the patient fits into all these criteria, you could do a minimal elevation yeah. and that could help. Other than that, crutch classes are easy to prescribe, very hard to use. Mm -hmm. So often the patient will just keep it somewhere and bring it to show it to you. So. Okay. Yeah, so this was actually a case of CPO, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, and she underwent sling, as uh, ERM Sars has said. And she. Uh, Marian? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Have you done a muscle biopsy in this case to prove? Uh, sorry, no. I mean, actually, uh, thought of doing muscle biopsy, but it needs electron microscopy, all those things to see the ragged red fibers and all. And second thing, I mean, 
muscle biopsy uh, might not change your uh, plan of management. management yeah so actually it can it should be done ideally ideally it should be done if the facilities are available nearby and if financial status also allows but in this case i didn't do she just want to see the right so i just did this frontalis like yeah one thing i understand uh, management is definitely necessary for the patient but lead, i mean reaching a diagnosis is also very yeah. important yes. so even uh, you this- know five years back i understand she has done an electromyography but uh, just for the audience sake you know the most sensitive yeah. test as far as my you know myography is considered is the single no, yeah. muscle fiber yeah. uh, you know yeah. myography so yeah. if they have not done yeah. it it's uh, quite mandatory now to go for the most uh, uh, sensitive test uh, the single nerve muscle fiber uh, and the thing i want to add here is here the patient is more prone for exposure keratitis after torsus surgery so that we need to address you have to give uh, lubricants and yes, liberally yes. and you have to explain more frequent follow up because there is poor bills so they are prone for exposure keratitis Absolutely. that is one Ag- thing i want to say aggressive stress. lubrication as madam mentioned aggressive lubrication close follow up and to report instantly if the eye gets red watery lid edema etc so if the patient can follow all that plus i think uh, taking off from where dr fairuz mentioned nimhans bangalore was offering the service and uh, many patients have undergone surgeries and biopsies and uh, they have been very good with providing the diagnosis including mitochondrial uh, disease yes so it's done in bangalore i think yeah, there yeah. are centers in other states also yeah so i think most the uh, third case she is a 58 year old drooping right eye since 6 months she is a non hypothyroid on treatment since 13 years she gave a vague history of muscle weakness on the right side of the neck at the age of 20 but uh, the history is not very clear so this is her uh, clinical picture you can see uh, there is uh, the palpable fissure height in the right eye is less compared to the compared to the left eye and uh, you can see an eyebrow has drooped uh, rest of the ocular examination is within normal limits she has got good vision also on close examination of her face uh, you can see this uh, nasolabial fold is uh, flat compared to the left left side uh, and on uh, clenching the teeth this is her clinical picture so this i would like to show uh, the brow ptosis as a cause of uh, pseudotosis any comments facial nerve palsy usually can lead to a uh blepharo spasm on the same side yes after some years so maybe that is the cause of that yes so this is just to share like pseudotosis has to be ruled out uh, while we see a patient with the drooping yeah so uh, like how dr sujitra earlier uh, pointed out in your first case regarding the lid crease distance so an old uh, patient presenting with a ptosis when you compare the first picture the lid crease is absolutely fine yeah. which is you know like kind of uh, telling us that it's not something which is common that is an aponeurotic uh, uh, ptosis so yes so we would look in for something more in these situations ruling out an acquired aponeurotic ptosis okay. uh, similarly another case of brow ptosis uh, again uh, caused a pseudo ptosis the role of pseudo ptosis so examination of the face is necessary in the evaluation of ptosis look for hypotropia in ophthalmos condylateral retraction etc come to the fourth case now i'm moving to male so uh, he is a 72 year old male drooping right eye <clears throat> upper lid since two months following an uneventful phaco emulsification under peribulbar anesthesia no history of any diplopia or diurnal variation he is a known diabetic since 10 years uh dyslipidemia and non case of bronchial asthma and ischemic heart disease on treatment for uh, multiple comorbidities so this is his uh, uh clinical picture that is a mild brotosis coming to the uh, this evaluation pfh is 0 8 in the left eye margin reflex minus 5 lps action is 12 face distance is more or less the same in both eyes bells is good ocular motility is full i stressed i have done it is negative um herings uh, actually herings i forgot to do in his case so i'm sorry so this is uh, 
uh, he has got a good orbicularity stone. So any thoughts? He is uh, 72 year old, present him with the ptosis following cataract surgery two months before uh, under peribulbar anesthesia. So now, how is the what, pupil, uh, Marian? Pupil is normal. The rest of the ophthalmic examination is normal other than pseudophilia in the right eye. Vision is 66, pupil normal, ocular motility full. He has you got a total ptosis. You with, mentioned total ptosis, but with good levator action. Yes. So, yes, yes correct, sir. So, and full mo movements, I think it's yes. even like case, case one. I think yeah. there's a severe degree of uh, levator aponeurosis, dehiscence, or uh, something. Because the common things we think of are third nerve palsy. Yes, sir. So, actually, out, yeah. yeah. Out, and strictly unilateral, we would kind of rule out things like myasteria and all prima facie. Yeah. Because an ice pack can be done. Uh, yeah. Kind of odd things can happen with myasthenia. So, so this is this was actually a very tricky case for me. I would like to share this case because uh, this can happen to all of us. So we thought of like our sir, sir initially thought of third nerve palsy because he has got uh, three comorbidities like hyperlipidemia, diabetes, long standing. So uh, but we waited for two months, no improvement. Uh, we sent to a neurologist. Actually, we did an MRI, MRA, and had taken a neurology opinion also. So these were the three differential diagnoses. Either it is a third nerve palsy, but movements are normal. Myasthenia gravis, we have done ice test, so it is ruled out. Then whether it is a dehiscence of levator due to speculum during cataract surgery, but the findings are not correlating because margin crease distance are more or less the same on both sides. So we waited for three months, but there was no improvement. Uh, since so, was, yeah, this imaging, which of the screen already? Sorry? No, no, the um, sorry, was to talk about imaging of superior orbit. Imaging of the orbit, I think. Superior orbit, yes. yeah. 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 That's the only thing which I slipped up, yeah. Yeah, okay. Both uh, brain and orbit we have done, including MRA and everything, angioidum also we have done. MRA showed some ischemic changes uh, that is expected in a 70-year-old male. So we waited for uh, three months, two to three months for spontaneous improvement, but there was no improvement at all. Since the patient was very uh, <clears throat> uh, insisting, like I did surgery to see, but now my eyes are totally closed. So we did an LPS exploration. Uh, with the reattachment with informed consent because this was a very tricky case we know and so we did an, a surgery under an informed consent. So this is his uh, one week post LPS reattachment. It, it has uh, <clears throat> improved, the dosis has improved but not fully. So at that time it was an undercorrected dosis. So again I did an ice test. So now ice test turned to be positive. Now I mean the diagnosis is evident now. He has got uh, ocular myasthenia gravis. We refer to another neurologist and he was diagnosed as uh, ocular myasthenia based on acetylcholine receptor antibody and positive nerve stimulation study. Patient was started on all the treatment and improved. So in this case, I would like to uh, specify it's like when the levator is severely affected, ice test may not produce enough improvement in the function to be clinically apparent can give you false negative results. So this was a very tricky case, but at the same time, it was a learning case also. When the ptosis is very severe, ice test might not give you a, a clear-cut result in case of ocular myasthenia. Any comments? Marine, another thing that I would like to add here is like ice test, we always say it's like two minutes. Yes. Uh, so uh, anything more, like even up to five minutes, we can go if there is an external ophthalmoplegia. But yeah. if it is kept for a longer duration, the ice is kept uh, for a longer duration over the eyelid, mm. again, we can have a false negative because there is uh, uh, the muscle has effect of the eyes and then we may not get a positive eyes test. So there can be a false uh, negativity. Negative. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Duration is also very Another important. Another thing I also like to add here is, uh, here I think there are two components. Yeah. My gravis plus levator distance. Yeah. So I even when so. we hmm. evaluate for fatigue test or ice pack test, even though the levator muscle is contracting, it is not manifested as the eyelid elevation. That is another possibility here. Yeah. So once you the levator, you are able to elicit that test. 
So it's a very, very interesting case, Marian, that you uh, yes, yes, have uh, shared with us. Can and I... uh, it's a takeaway that you have to do an ice pack test in any acquired process possible. Yes, That's what I do in my clinic. And because of that, such an extreme case, you know, got picked up and uh, managed as well. Yeah. Uh, we Marian, routinely... Marian, is this, is this that cataract case? This, this yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. My, my case. Yeah, sir, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was we... really a troublesome guy, you know. Had yeah, good yeah, routine, yeah. But, uh, you know, had severe ptosis after a nice cataract surgery and uh, Marian was... <laughs> can't, can't blame uh, him. Can't blame him. For, <laughs> for a few months, he was also eating my head. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we routinely do a uh, neostigmin test, IV neostigmin, oh. uh, very diluted. And uh, uh, as we give neostigmin, we can see the lid lift up. We don't routinely do ice tests, but we do a neostigmin test. And I think if you had done that, may have come. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah. But under anesthesia, is... under anesthesia monitoring. Yeah, yes. Okay, and we you. have never had, uh, except for mild bradycardia and uh, gastrointestinal yeah. uh, pain, we have never had a major setback. We had we had even uh, studied that those cases, yeah. about 40, 50 cases. So I will just uh, conclude. Just want to remind you that uh, oculoplasty time is still 9.30 at max. Oh, okay. Okay, so, my, yeah. my case. One yeah. more case. Can I present one more or should I stop with this? I think Ani can, Ani can take over, no? Yeah, fine. Thank have you. some discussion with any also. Yeah. Okay. Can you? You can share your screen, any. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, contrary to what has been given in the brochure, I am speaking on childhood proptosis. So we had a two-year-old girl who had come to us in 2006, I think, with a, a history of fall two months before presentation. And she had a slight abrasion there, which improved, but the later she developed a swelling around the left side, uh, which was gradually increasing and it was painless. So there was no history of any systemic complaints like fever, rashes, uh, bleeding tendencies, recent weight loss. She was immunized till date. And on examination, there was a firm swelling in the infratemporal cotton, which is extending up to the uh, area of the lateral palpebral ligament. And the, it was approximately two into two centimeters, non tender, not mobile over the underlying bone. It was not pulsatile and the extraocular movements were full and the fundus examination was also normal. And uh, there was a soft tissue mass in the extracondral compartment of the left orbit on CT scan with the bone erosion of the lateral wall of the orbit. And you could see an erosion of the greater wing of the sphenoid and it was um, extending to the inferior temporal fossa. So it was an infiltrating mass with bone erosion. So uh, we uh, all these uh, differential diagnoses uh, went through our mind. Uh, benign lesions like ossifying fibroma, eosinophilic granuloma, uh, hemangioma, interosseous sort of old abscess with extensive bone destruction. But as the uh, duration was very short of only two months, we had to think more about these malignant lesions which are neuroblastoma secondaries Chloroma secondaries, uh, which is usually bilateral living sarcoma or a rhabdomyosarcoma uh, with an intranasal extension, which, which I've seen in the CT. All these pictures I had taken from the net. So the differential diagnosis uh, or differential diagnosis were uh, traumatic fat necrosis, asinophilic granuloma, leukemias, neuroblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, living sarcoma because of the acute presentation. Uh, apart from a low hemoglobin, uh, all the other investigations were normal. Uh, Mando test was negative. 24-hour uh, urine vanile mandelic acid was uh, normal. Uh, so we excluded uh, neuroblastoma secondary. Alkaline phosphatase was also normal. So we went in for an incision biopsy through the inferior phonics and we could see yellowish uh, colored fluid uh, on uh, incision and a sagograin yellowish appearance. And histopathology showed plenty of eosinophils with giant histiocytes and uh, degenerated blood elements. So uh, the diagnosis could be narrowed down to uh, either a Langerhans cell histiocytosis or a post-traumatic uh, uh, fat necrosis. But immunohistochemistry clinched the diagnosis at a, uh, to a Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So uh, it was coined by Lichtenstein in 1953, this term. And uh, there is an abnormal proliferation of Langerhans cells, which are dendritic cells. So it consists of three entities, eosinophilic granuloma, which is uh, unifocal, 
Ancillary Christian disease, which could be multifocal, uh, but confined to a system, and literacy of disease, which is a disseminated disease. So the pathogenesis is the Langerhans cells present antigen to the T cells, and they proliferate, producing interleukin and osteoclast activating factor, which inhibit bone formation, and there is bone destruction and absent new bone formation. So the commonest stage is 1 to 15 years. The uh, commonest site in children is a bone in 80%. Long bones are involved. The bones of the hand and the feet are not involved at all. And uh, uh, fractures can occur. Trauma insights and also cures the lesion. So orbital involvement is seen in one, up to 20 percentage. The frontal bone is the most common involved because that is a hemopoietically active bone. And maxilla and cygoma lose their hemopoietic activity by early childhood. So uh, with this diagnosis for future, by future removal under GA, we gave her an in intralational injection of triamcillinone also. But by then the mass had resolved completely. You can see the photograph taken at future removal. And uh, so our questioners did biopsy itself cure the lesion. So now we had to rule out systemic histiocytosis. Uh, all these liver and renal function tests were normal. Urine osmolarity was done to rule out diabetes insipidus, which is also normal. And uh, systemic bone scan did not uh, fish out any lesion. So it was uh, unifocal orbital Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And eight months after we did a, a repeat CT and we found that the bone had completely remodeled, the lesion had completely disappeared. Uh, so further follow-ups every year had been done to rule out any systemic involvement uh, because if the orbit was involved, uh, diabetes insipidus was reported to be more common. So urine osmolality was done and uh, CNS involvement was also uh, looked for. And at 13 years of age, uh, she had attained puberty and uh, uh, her height and weight were normal. And uh, except for a little mildly lower uh, vitamin D3, all the other, she had no endocrine problems. So thank you. So I think we can discuss about uh, the malignant lesions, uh, bone eroding lesions, which can occur in the orbit. Uh, so uh, Ferus and Dr. Ravindra, in your experience, how did, uh, have you experienced any case of uh, neuroblastoma secondaries or Chloromas. Yeah. yeah, we have we have certainly seen in, in clinical practice. These are uh, seen once in a while uh, in regular oculoplasty practice. Uh, so, the eosinophilic random again is a, is a great diagnosis to get because in a child with sudden unilateral proptosis, one starts thinking of all the more dangerous life-threatening conditions. Yeah, like malignant deposits or a, or a malignancy of some kind, uh, including, uh, you know, metastatic disease. But uh, once you get this diagnosis, actually, it's very, very good for the patient and the uh, family of the child also. So it's a great diagnosis. to get. It can also be diagnosed intraoperatively by your pathologist. And you can actually prognos prognosticate and tell the family before you get out of the theater. So in that sense, it's a good diagnosis to get. But of course, there are a huge number of other conditions, malignant ones. Maybe I think virus can possibly organize it a little better and tell us about that. Excellent case, Dr. Annie. Thank you for sharing it. So yeah, whenever there is an uh, erosive uh, uh, orbital lesion, what we would think is, what are the benign ones which can cause erosions, which can rarely do as in this case. And mostly the bony erosion, the bone gets eaten up by a malignancy. So apart from uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis or eosinophilic granuloma, in a high-risk uh, TB endemic area like India, we can also consider orbital tuberculosis uh, as one of the differential diagnoses. So whenever you go inside uh, to take a biopsy, what I would do is uh, definitely in this bone eroding situation uh, in a child or uh, a teenager or a middle-aged individual, we would also send the biopsy for microbiology. Yes. So microbiology PCR. We had sent it. We had sent for tuberculosis. Yes. PCR. And another thing which is quite rare is uh, again fungal granuloma in the organ. Yeah. Yeah. Aspergilloma can also cause uh, bony erosion involving the sinuses. So these are the benign lesions along with eosinophilic granuloma. So the cases that I have in my series of eosinophilic granuloma, these children present with kind of an inflammatory 
situation. You know, they will have erythema, they will have even pain, associated pain, which is quite unlikely with a malignancy like a rhabdomyosarcoma, which is common in children. So then you think of in an inflammatory, uh, you know, uh, situation. So there are patients, I have two patients who have been treated as, you know, preceptal cellulitis and orbital cellulitis, put on steroids and after the steroids are tapered because one of the treatment in uh, eosinophilic granuloma and histiocytosis is steroids. So it just goes away. And then, you know, again, there is a recurrence of uh, uh, the symptoms and signs in these children. So uh, that is one thing. And of course, malignancy is the most scarier part in children whenever there is a bony erosion, especially eosinophilic granuloma being affecting the frontal uh, uh, bone uh, in the lacrimal gland area, but she's too small to have a lacrimal gland malignancy, but still we would rule it out. Another lethal malignancy that we, has to be ruled out is, uh, you know, uh, PNET and uh, having sarcoma, which can cause erosion of the uh, sphenoid bone and the, you know, the triangle over there. So that has to be definitely ruled out. This I have is, had uh, more experience with uh, uh, PNET than uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. Actually, I've had more cases of PNET than rhabdomyosarcoma. Yeah, and I'm sure you have seen this bony erosion, which is very significant in the uh, sphenoid bone in uh, along with the uh, PNET. So that is very, very classical presentation of PNET in children. And ma'am, I have a question for you. Uh, so I'm sure uh, the, you know, uh, the intralesional steroids, if you want to share the dose with the audience, it will be really, really helpful. Yeah, it is uh, kind of uh, use, like yeah. specific steroids. Yeah, it can, it comes in two, this thing, 4 mg per ml and 2, 2 mg per ml. We used, I think it's an intralesional steroid. So 4 mg per ml, uh, I think it is uh, 2 ml. Yeah, and so basically it's directly injected into the thing. And if you want, you can, uh, along with the local anesthetic also you can. So the patient won't have post-operative pain. But uh, is it necessary even to take a biopsy if you have, if you're clinically diagnosing it? As Dr. Ravindra Mohan said, can you yeah, just yeah. Uh, take an aspiration, then see the histiocytes yeah. and then inject? Yeah. Uh, aspiration, I think the patholog pathologists are never happy with aspiration. Uh, okay. Right, they, they want issue to so yeah. in that sense it's a very simple it's often very accessible yeah. some some lesions can be a little deeper but still always accessible and yeah, even nothing like histopathology even even we would be pathology. happy with i had man, i had read it somewhere it's aspiration is necessary but i think that's not enough yeah. ma'am uh, one of the three i mean the treatment I, I would go treatment modality is curatage if you can actually mm -hmm. Even if there is a clinical yeah. suspicion Correct. that there is a eosinophilic granuloma in this child, it's mm -hmm. always good to go inside, do the curatage as safe curatage mm -hmm. as much as possible. And then yeah. even under, you know, frozen section where you can actually send the sample to the histopathologist, if you have uh, the facility in your center, immediately diagnose, you know, the diagnosis comes within 15 minutes and on the table at the same time, intra-op, you can uh, give an intralesional steroid injection as well. So curatage is very, very important in eosinophilic granuloma because I have just read a, a report uh, where, you know, there has been uh, partial resolution even after a steroid injection where the child was given uh, chemotherapy because chemotherapy is one of the treatment modality they give in Christine and, uh, you know, uh, uh, cisplatin or even vinblastin in these cases where there is no resolution. Because again, uh, eosinophilic granuloma histiocytosis has a myeloid uh, predilection. It's a myeloid neoplasm. Yeah. And recently they have seen positivity of BRAF and KRAF mutation also. So if it is not resolving and well, there are indications of uh, systemic uh, treatment, including systemic chemotherapy, when an isolated orbital eosinophilic granuloma is associated with CNS uh, lesion, if they're associated with multiple bone lesions, and specific site like lungs, uh, liver, spleen is involved, which of course you have ruled out with the imaging and stuff. So there is uh, indications for systemic chemotherapy. So it's always good to go inside, cure it as much as possible and then inject for uh, you know uh, better resolution of the lesion and 
reduce the recurrence rate. Okay. Yeah, I, I, if, one, if one moves a little away from the bone involvement to another child who has presented with sudden inflammatory masks or inflammatory lesion, which masquerades in orbital cellulitis. So one of the things which I'm sure all of us have burnt our uh, fingers and we've seen our colleagues and seniors, our teachers burning their fingers is the acute presentation of an acute leukemia, which deposits yes. in, the, in the orbit. So in that sense, a, a peripheral blood smear uh, is something, may not be in this child particularly, but if we really look at it overall, it's such a simple test. And uh, often it is done after you've done a biopsy and found a le leukemia and the blood was always uh, diagnostic. So I think a simple peripheral blood smear, uh, the counts may show abnormality. If it shows abnormality, it's easy to pick up. But certainly a, a peripheral blood smear in every child Every presents case. with an acute proptosis and is not clearly a, an ab orbital abscess or something infective. I think, or even in those cases. Even in those cases, yeah. Rupees, we yes. can be, it's a simple test, no, we can always. Yeah. You get the neutro, neutro, you know, philia and other details as well. So in that sense, that is something that we should keep in mind. Yeah, very valid point. So that is exactly we also uh, go through any child presenting with a proptosis along with the routine blood evaluation. Peripheral blood smear is definitely 100% sent. Very valid point. Yeah, uh, okay. Marian, do you have anything to contribute? Yeah, you so, yeah. See, same thing only in this child, like I prefer to do intrafrosal section. You know whether it is inflammatory or malignant. Inflammatory, basically, you have to rule out uh, tuberculosis. So once tuberculosis is ruled out, I think same setting itself, we can give intralitional triumphs in alone. I mean, one GA can be avoided, especially. Um, yeah. In fact, even if those who do not have frozen section, I think an yeah. intraoperative squash or yes. a crush or a touch slide, if the, your pathologist is reasonably confident of uh, cytopathology, can uh, we've had the privilege of working with people like Dr. Krishna Kumar and Dr. Yes, JB, yeah. who are always very good? Uh -huh. But uh, even other pathologists, like I work in a multi specialty hospital, you can have the person look at the cytopathology and come yeah. to some kind of a conclusion. Some of these are diagnostic, mm -hmm. the cells are more or less diagnostic, the material is uh, uh, shows clear picture. Then I think there should be an effort for intraoperative diagnosis, yes. as Dr. Yeah. Yeah. mentioned. And ma'am, a okay. uh, wonderful picture where she has turned into a teenager that has yeah. actually yeah, uh, expressed the importance of a long-term follow-up, which is very, very important in these children. Oh, okay. Because even subsequently, they can develop these lesions in the lungs, in the liver, in the spleen, and in other parts of the bone. So very, very nice to see her at 30 years. Yeah, years. but her only complaint, her mother, is she's a little slow in studies. That is, every mother in Kerala will have that complaint. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the only complaint. I have uh, told them to look for any masses along the bones, everything. So, yes. Dr. Sujitra? Uh, uh, her next complaint, I was out of connection. So I didn't go through the entire case. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am, we were talking about a yeah. uh, uh, lesion in the orbit of the child with bony erosion. So we were just, uh, you know, discussing about the differential diagnosis and the management of finally yeah. turned out to be a snuffleic granuloma. Uh, uh, Fairuz, what is your experience about Ewing sarcoma? How do they present actually? Ma'am, Ewing sarcoma, uh, well, uh, there, there are many presentations. Mostly, definitely, it's an orbital lesion, usually involving the superior uh, orbit, okay. the temporal orbit, and the sphenoid bone uh, with bony erosion. So I have even had a baby who was like three and a half year old, which was a very unusual presentation where she had a very well-defined mass in the superior orbit. Usually, it is like an extensive mass that presents with bony erosion and very, very minimal uh, bony excavation and erosion, which was not really fitting into, which I thought it was a rhabdomyosarcoma, almost 100% confident with the clinical presentation. But then it came out as uh, uh, Evin sarcoma, PNET. So uh, orbital lesion, very common with uh, bony erosion, and depending upon the progression and the stage at what they present, uh, you know, the bony involvement and the orbital involvement will be uh, aggressive, yeah. 
So uh, this, this was a case, the 18 year old with uh, PNET. Yes. It was suspected to be an Ewing sac with extensive bone destruction and mass. Yes, ma'am. And he has expired. This was another case with history of trauma. You can see the abrasion on the skin. With the mass lesion, not much bone erosion because she is a child. You could not, uh, it was very rapidly enlarging mass. This was also a PNET. Okay. So that is my experience with PNET. Yeah. Uh, but Ewing sarcoma, I've never had a case. That's why I asked you. Is it um, totally amenable to therapy? Uh, Evings, yes. So now there are certain genetic tests that they do for uh, the Evings family of tumors. Uh, so depending upon the positivity of the uh, test that they do, uh, indicating the Evings family of tumors, whether it's positive or negative, they can actually, uh, you know, predict the prognosis in these patients. Yeah. And definitely so all these patients undergo chemotherapy okay. and radiotherapy to the okay. orbit as well in order to improve the survival and the outcome in these patients. And uh, non-orbital non doctors on behalf of them, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Okay. See, yes. see, this Ewing's group and this primary neuroectodermal, they're all the same group of tumors or is it a new classification or something? Yeah, so there is basically uh, PNET, uh, the Evings family of tumors comes under PNET. So according to the classification, there is PPNET, where it's the Evings uh, tumor. Then we, they also have the CPNET, where the central nervous system is involved. So they are all comes under the same family. And uh, another thing, neuroblastoma and Williams tumor and all secondary is a patient. The child will be very ill, you know. The child will be ill and then they get a second. So we have a clue to the diagnosis. But in, uh, I think in chloroma, we may be in a sub leukemic phase. The patient may have a deposit. The deposit may be the first thing um, that we pick up, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Sometimes they present with bilateral proptosis. Yeah, chloroma usually bilateral. Uh, bilateral and the child may not be that ill. We have had a case the uh, the only presenting complaint was a mass, mass in the organ. It was unilateral, but it, the child smear and all were negative because the child was in the subleukemic phase. So that can also happen. And fundus, I think, will give a, an idea. Fundus picture will give an idea if there are rock spot and all. You have to examine yes. the dilated fundus in every case to rule out uh, leukemia before you go in for a biopsy. Yes. The other test that people talk about and which I think is important, of course, the child, as you mentioned, would be very sick, but is an ultrasound yeah. abdomen and a CT chest to, okay. to rule out any masses in the abdomen or uh, in the chest. Um, yeah, once again, I would like to say this, like tuberculosis definitely has to be ruled out in these uh, situations. But in, uh, but in such young children, it will be a primary complex. In older children only, we'll get a bone eroding mass and mass organ. That is also good. No? Yeah. Uh, it's 9.30, Gopal, can we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think... Yeah. So thank you very much uh, to the entire Orbit team. Thank you very much. Yaram sir, thank Fairuz, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All of you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. It was thank a wonderful you. discussion, I would say. Very much problem-based yeah, diagnosis yeah. and management. This is what we really want. Really, really good. Appreciate it. Thank that. you. Thank you, thank Gopal. You for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Ani. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Can we go on to the inaugural function? Yes. Good morning, all. Am I audible? Clear? Yes, yes. 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 very yes. much. So we are now beginning our official inaugural function. And to welcome all of you in an official format, uh, I invite Dr. Thomas Arun Burgis, the Chairman, Scientific Committee of Cochin of Talmi Club. Dr. Thomas Arun Vergis, sir. Yeah. Thomas, you are not audible. Thomas, you are not audible. Meena, madam, good morning. 
in a madam's joint yeah 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 giridha sir good morning morning sir thomas i think you check your audio problem with his audio yeah i think uh, we will require to take over sir you can't uh... whether he has unmuted no yes, no no yes. he has unmuted, he unmuted but his audio is not audio. Uh, yeah yeah it's not audible at all yeah i, I think, think uh, we should move on with the inter, uh, with the uh, i think i welcome. think i'll do the welcome yeah, and correct. the presidential address together yeah, is that yeah. okay I thomas so. i think so that's okay i think that we should do that yeah yeah so it gives me um, utmost pleasure to be here this morning uh the august of thalmika which is the flagship program of the cochin of thalmika club has been going on uninterrupted since 2002 and it is my very very pleasant duty to uh, welcome all of you to this very important meeting of the cochin of thalmika club uh, can i first uh, welcome the president of the ksos dr meena chakravarti thank you madam for uh, sparing time this sunday morning uh, to be with us uh, dr giridhar is the recipient of the professor gopinath menon uh, memorial oration this year welcome sir to this meeting uh, professor sundari menon uh, madam uh, again makes it a point to uh, attend all the august of thalmikas year after year and welcome uh, madam to this meeting Uh, i also welcome all the faculty the moderators the discussants uh, of the various uh, sessions uh, we have uh, finished two sessions we have four more to go so i welcome all of them and uh, to top it up all the seniors and friends of cochin of thalmi club and all the delegates who are watching this and the sponsors of this meeting which is zivira uh August of Thalmika as you all know was started in the year of 2002 if i may take a few seconds to briefly mention the history of August of Thalmika uh, it was in 1999 when a conference of ksos was held in munar and uh, out of the proceeds of the munar conference a small amount was earmarked to conduct an annual meeting of the cochin of thalmika club year after year uh, and uh, credit goes to dr radha krishnan dr e j mani and dr r r verma uh, who uh, were the uh, main organizers of this meeting in munar uh, and some amount was earmarked for the august of thalmika the initially it was two years was the uh, program was conducted by an organizing committee uh, which also included dr narayanan kutti late dr noel monis uh, dr giridhar etc and then it became an annual program of the cochin of thalmika club Uh, and every year we have been uh, handing over the uh, gopinatha menon memorial oration to illustrious uh, speakers illustrious uh, ophthalmologists from all over the country uh, and in between uh, to top it up uh, we had uh, a contribution from the family of uh, professor gopinatha menon uh, dr sundari menon and family was gracious enough to add rupees 1 lakh to the corpus fund which was initially earmarked for this and it is from this corpus fund that we we give away the uh, one sovereign gold medal and the citation that is given every year year after year to the recipients of the award and uh, before i conclude i also take this opportunity to just read out the roll of honor of all the people who have received the gopinatha menon memorial oration they include dr babu rajendran dr abhay vasavada dr ms ravindra dr gurbak singh Dr Santosh Honawar Dr K Narayanan Kutti Dr Jyotirmay Biswas Dr L Vijaya Dr AK Grover Dr Amod Gupta Professor Sushila Prabhakaran Dr Vijay Raghavan Dr Pradeep Sharma Dr Thomas Kuriyakos Dr Jagatram Dr Subhadra Jalali Dr Mohan Rajan Dr Susan Jacob and this year in 2020 it is none other none other than Dr A Giridhar so uh, i am sure this is going to be 
a wonderful oration and uh, wonderful sessions uh, coming up uh, and i also once again take this opportunity to welcome all the uh, special guests of kitchen of salmi club all the speakers and all the delegates who are joining us on youtube live as well as facebook live to watch this program thank you very much thank you sir for that double role now i invite dr meena chakrabarti ma'am the honorable president of kerala society of ophthalmic surgeons and uh, she'll officially inaugurate august of talmika 2020 with her inaugural address madam please unmute madam sorry good morning friends respected dignitaries on this virtual dais dear friends and colleagues i'm extremely happy to be here today as part as a participant in this inaugural function of uh, august of talmika 2020 which has been a flagship meeting of the kochin of talmika club since 2000 two i think sir isn't it since 2002 year after year they run a very good scientific program and i'm also be i'm also very happy to be part of the inaugural session where the award is given to a very worthy recipient dr giridhar and as a tribute to the astute physician that uh, dr professor t gopinath menon sir was dr giridhar will be sharing with us his collection of uh, clinical cases which will be i think a great boon to the comprehensive ophthalmologist this meeting with this emphasis on on giving pearls of information to the comprehensive ophthalmologist is a very very relevant uh, way to conduct a meeting instead of having some specialty meetings and i am very happy to be part of this inaugural session and i declare this meeting as inaugural thank you very much thank you ma'am Next, we will listen, listen to a reminiscence by uh, Dr. K. Narayan Gutti, sir, a senior member and academician from Kochin of Talmik Club, about Professor Dr. T. Gobinath Menon, sir. Good morning to all. Professor Dr. T. Gobinath Menon was an astute clinician, excellent teacher, a born leader and organizer, well liked and admi admired by his colleagues and students alike. He was a very friendly person with both senior as well as junior doctors. Uh, he is very friendly with these people, showing no difference in his comradeship, and all of them felt very comfortable and at ease in his presence. He always travelled in group to attend conferences, and will make the journey very pleasant and interesting with his anecdotes and jokes. When he came back from London after completing his WHO fellowship, he brought with him. alpha chymotrypsin and he was the first to use sonolysin with ercifac to make intracapsular cataract extraction an easy procedure but later he had to abandon this technique due to secondary glaucoma he was a native of irinyalakuda uh, belonged to famous tarail family his father dr manakot masko menon was a successful and popular general practitioner in trichu he was born in 1927 and had his school education in irinyalakuda he took his mbbs in 1953 and do in 1956 both from madras medical college later he took his ms degree in ophthalmology from kg hospital lucknow in 1959 he joined kerala health services in 1956 and worked at gh chernakulam along with dr philip a renowned ophthalmologist of those time he joined medical college service in 1957 and after that he has worked in trivandrum medical college Calicut Medical College and Kottayam Medical College. Mostly his career was in Kottayam Medical College. He became professor in HOD in MCS Kottayam in 1965, where he continued till his retirement in 1982. After his retirement, he started private practice in Arunachalam and was teaching PG students in LF Hospital till his demise in 1994. He died in harness, working till his last breath, and even on the day of his death on 19 February 1994 morning. a patient was waiting for cataract surgery at sri sudhidra hospital he went on who fellowship to london and had his training in retina and cornea from moorfield sai hospital he was president ks ks in 1981 82 and second president of the coc in 1984 organizing committee secretary of the first ai os annual conference in kerala which was held in kochi in savida 
Sarita and Sangeeta Theatre. He was organizing committee chairman of KSOI's annual conference in India, 1986. Organizing committee chairman, SROC Kochi, 1994. He was honored by KSOS by conferring Dr. C. Human Memorial Lifetime Achievement Award in 1992. His wife, Professor Dr. Sundari Menon, who has graced this occasion by her online presence today for this meeting, has retired from MCH LAP as a HOD and Professor of Medicine. She has been a great source of strength and support to him in all his endeavors. They are blessed with two sons and one daughter well settled in life. To conclude, Professor Dr. T. Govinath Menon was a versatile leader, a leading ophthalmologist, and above all, a great human being. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, Dr. Devi Sakkara, the past president of Cochin Ophthalmic Club, will introduce the Oration Award winner for this year. Please go to share screen, uh, I mean, full screen, screen show. So just a slideshow. On top, slide show. A, on top, there is a thing called yeah, yeah, slideshow. Okay. Ah, that is enough. That's enough. Good morning, friends. Happy Onam to everyone. May this Onam fill with joy, happiness, and prosperity. August of Thalmika is always linked to the festival of Onam. Festival of joy, happiness, and prosperity. Let me wish you all a happy Onam in advance. I pray and hope we'll be able to contain the coronavirus in a short while. Giridha, an unassuming, friendly, and lovable person, did his graduation and post-graduation from Jipma Pondicherry. He was awarded the Thiru Kumaraswamy Best Outgoing Postgraduate post Gold Medal Award by Madras University. After completing post-graduation, Dr. Giridha did his fellowship in vitreo retinal surgery at Shankaranetra Laya and was Dr. Badrinath's favorite. Basically from Palgar, deciding on where to start practice after the training was a big uh, decision to make. He had to choose between Palgar, Coimbatore and Cochin. Finally, he decided to set up the retina department in Medical Trust Hospital, Ernakula. Dr. Giridha was the HOD of the Medical Trust Hospital for 11 years. Giridha started the Giridha Institute in 1997. He, was, he formed a team of dedicated doctors who took the institution to a tertiary level referral center with such specialities in ophthalmology. Dr. Giridha founded the SSMI Research Foundation, a public charitable trust in the year 2005. The trust helps in subsidizing the treatment for the less fortunate with complicated vitreoretinal diseases. A metriculous organizer was the organizing secretary of AIOS in 2012 in Cochin. He had delivered over 200 lectures in various and international forums, national and international forums. He has conducted over 20 CMEs and pertaining to the vitreoretinal diseases. He has over 50 published articles in peer-reviewed journals. And he has received a number of national and international awards. 
excellence in ophthalmology vision award c women oration award apao distinguished service award ijo golden gold award are all the and, and there are so many awards I, I, it will take a long time if i continue uh, enumerating all the awards that he has received this is a gist of what we have what he has received and i present to you dr giridha a lovable unassuming friendly person over to you giridha is the award presentation ceremony video not playing gopal yeah can you see my screen yeah you can see your screen yeah yeah so i was waiting for that confirmation yeah, so yeah. Um, uh, so this is um, we had uh, gone to uh, sir's place and uh, it gives us immense pleasure to actually give this particular award to him so we have all there me dr sai the president yeah can you hear also yeah 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 can you see dr sai can you hear dr sai speaking the, the audio from the video audio. is not there audio from sai the video is not there speak right now i mean he can speak right yeah. now yeah 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 this is the uh, what the plaque which reads uh, the professor t gopinath menon memorial oration award 2020 awarded to dr a giridhar for his exemplary contribution to the field of vitreo retinal surgery presented on this the second day of august 2020 along with august of thalmica i think the video is a bit jerky yeah is it looped is it playing again and again no it is not looped sir it looks like yeah taking too much time actually yeah so this is the gold medal uh, which is being given uh, i'll play the next video a president dr alexander sir gold medal presented to uh, giridhar sir professor t alexander past president uh, uh, is actually adorning dr giridhar with the gold medal i think and go on to the next video and then uh, we had uh, the endowment awards the endowment uh, being given to uh, cochin 
uh, Rotary Global Foundation. And uh, Mrs. Lini, who is the recipient of that, uh, is here. She's uh, in charge of the Cochin uh, Rotary Global Foundation, which actually uh, takes care of uh, blind people into computer education and rehabilitates them. Our two. This is one of the recipients, Mr. Najim. Uh, the other recipient is uh, Mr. Anish. You can just show his face. Yeah, also. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, uh, Mr. Anish, who is also he's from Trivandrum. This is uh, Mr. Anish. Can you see this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this is the handing over of the check to Mrs. Lini, uh, who is part of the Cochin Global Foundation. I have to acknowledge uh, Dr. T. A. Alexander here, who took the initiative to set up the initial corpus fund uh, for the endowment. Uh, and, Prof and Dr. Jogi Joseph and Dr. Minakshi there were the president and secretary of Cochin of Talmi Club while this endowment was initiated. And we are handing over a check of rupees 30,000 to uh, Mrs. Lini, 15,000 each to the two blind persons which we showed earlier. We acknowledge the presence of Mrs. Lini. Welcome, Lini, to the. Yeah, Lini is part of the Zoom meeting. Welcome, Lini, to this meeting. And then finally, uh, we had presented. Uh, we had presented a check of uh, fifty thousand uh, from the Cochin of Talme Club to the COC. To the KSOS. To the to the uh, to the KSOS. Since we are practically conducting a, a webinars almost every Sunday, so we uh, contributed rupees fifty thousand to the KSOS, and Dr. Gopal is handing over the check of fifty thousand to Dr. Mahesh, who is the general secretary of the KSOS. Yeah. Sorry for the technical glitches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Deepa. Thank you all for the video presentations. Next, we have uh, felicitations by Dr. Sundari Menon, wife of Professor Gopinatha Menon. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, madam, very yes. much. Yeah. Respected President, Dr. Meena Chakravarti, congratulations, Dr. Giridhar, and my dear friends. Namaste, smile morning to everybody. I am very thankful for inviting me to this August meet of ophthalmology in connection of my husband, Dr. Gopinatha Menon Soration. Now we are living with the corona season. Corona is not a missile, but a microbe. There's a lot of human casualty. Corona has taught us a lot of good lessons. Do you agree with me? Patience, mental strength, helping hand, peaceful life at home, and more relaxation with good sleep, etc. And minimum expenses, not, no costly shopping. I do not know whether I, any eye problem like viral keratitis by corona. Have you met it? Any eye keratitis during this season? No. No, not no. much, madam. Maybe some mild conjunctivitis, which was supposed to be due okay, to okay. No, the virus. Okay, okay. Since it's a viral, it can cause keratitis also. We do not know whether there is any um, when this corona will vanish from the world. But yesterday, I had a, this um, WhatsApp message from one of the magician, one of the um, Jyotishin. He told me that till 
31st March next year. It will vanish, but it will aggravate by 20th December. Anyhow, we have to. Nado orang mana dewe orang mana le paraya. Aduh, vale we have to live in this season. Best home is home. Best age is courage, and best smile is smile. I Suresh Gopi cinema ini pernah bela. Ida wanu da poi. And best stand is understand. Best end is friend. The best day is today. And lastly. I want to quote one Abdul Kalam's words. The door of a house is small than a home. The lock is still smaller and the smallest is the key of the lock. That key is enough to open the entire house. So a small decision or thought is enough to solve most of the problems. Let today be the best day. I am very thankful and grateful in participating in this meet during this Corona season. Wish you all a very happy and prosperous, joyful Onam. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam. Next, Dr. Gopalas Pillai, Secretary COC, will deliver the vote of thanks. Okay. It gives me indeed a great pleasure to uh, give the thanks to all yeah, the people again, who have uh, come here. So, uh, first of all, I should thank uh, Dr. Meena Chakrabarti, ma'am, uh, the president of the KSOS, who graciously has uh, accepted each of our invitation week after week, every week. Every Sunday is basically, madam is with us. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. And obviously, uh, Dr. Mahesh and Dr. Rajiv Sukumaran, who are two of her right hand and left hand, who takes the uh, KSOS uh, forward. Um, I thank uh, Dr. Giridhar deeply, who graciously accepted our uh, uh, Professor T. Gopinatha Menon oration and is going to speak us uh, basically on tribute to a great clinician. Thank you very much, sir. Sundari, madam, again, year after year, you come, you are with us on this particular day, August of Thalmika, and lighting us with your words of wisdom. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Alexander, sir. Uh, you have been instrumental in instituting this uh, uh, endowment, which helps a lot of lives and it lights up a lot of lives, sir. And Alexander, sir, um, perseverant thought process is that we in the Cochin of Talmic Club should actually swell up this endowment to help more people. And we definitely will have to take that forward. Thank you very much, sir, uh, Alexander, sir, for that. Mrs. Lini, thank you very much for joining us and being an instrument in, uh, you know, furthering the Cochin of Talmic Club's wishes in, uh, you know, lighting up a vision of people. Senior colleagues like uh, Narayan Kuti, sir, who very readily accepted uh, the invitation. Dr. Shashi, sir, who, Shashi, sir, and Radha Vishnan, sir, who has always phoned up and all problems are getting solved uh, right before they start. Thank you very much to all senior colleagues of my, uh, of my Cochin of Talmi Club. Devi Sakra, sir, um, uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us and uh, introducing uh, our award recipient. So, uh, I, would, I would like to thank uh, our Cochin of Talmi Club executive members, including Sony, um, Thomas Arun, Deepa, Mahesh, Thomas, all these people who have been instrumental in helping me organize all these meetings. And Prashob is an integral part of this, every meeting, because at 7.30, I will call him Prashob, we should start. And then slowly, we the technical part of this particular meeting will start. Thank you very much, Prashob, for doing that. The speakers and panelists are doing an excellent job timing so far. And I think we have a lot of speakers uh, and discussion to go. So I thank you deeply. And no meeting is successful without the audience. And uh, I know that by the end of the day, usually in all of our meetings, close to 1,000 people join and uh, then uh, hear them on YouTube or Facebook. Thank you very much. And finally, I want to thank Zivera for kindly supporting us do this program. Thank you very much all for this. Over to uh, Deepa. Thank you, sir. With that, we conclude the official inauguration function or meeting. Next, we move on to the most awaited oration of the day, Professor T. Gopinatha Menon Memorial Oration by Dr. A. Giridhar. Uh, 
Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. So, good morning to you all. And uh, I'm extremely grateful to be put in Ophthalmic Club. Its president, Dr. Sai Kumar, Dr. Gopal Pillai, Dr. Thomas Arun Verghese, for having uh, chosen me as the recipient for this year's uh, Gopinatha Menon oration. I thank uh, Dr. Sundari Menon for her kind words and Dr. Davis for that introduction. I think Davis managed to get a lot of information, much more than what I handed over to him. Thank you, Davis. It was very unexpected. I mean, I have to admit, it was very unexpected. It was most unexpected. I was, uh, as Professor Sundari Menon said, I think the Corona COVID-19 epidemic has to a certain extent changed our mindset and approach to life. And uh, probably this is something that uh, triggered in some adrenaline into the system and also to use the, I mean, to stimulate the brain and start thinking a little bit. I became a little, it kindled a lot of old memories to me uh, because I shared a very special relationship with Professor. As uh, Dr. Narayan Guti rightly said, he was a very friendly person and he had a knack or that special gift with which he could mix with everyone, young and old, with ease. I think there are very few people who can do that. And Professor had that uh, uncanny knack of doing it. He was a very big pillar of strength and a source of inspiration to me in my very early years in Kerala between the 1985 and 1990 during my very formative years. And uh, the first, one of my earliest interactions with him was uh, at, during a meeting in Madura Courts. We had a COC meeting there. There was a speaker from Germany who was visiting from LF Hospital. And after the meeting, actually, I did not have a vehicle at that time. So Professor and me returned in his car. He had a driver. And I still remember one uh, few things that we discussed. He asked me, it was just before an annual meeting with All India Ophthalmological Society. And Professor asked me, are you presenting any paper? I said, no. So he said, if you don't blow your trumpet, who's going to blow it for you? In the, those early years, I used to take a lot of patients to his clinic. I visited his house many times. And uh, one of the cases that I took, I still distinctly remember, it was a patient who was operated for pterygium elsewhere. And he was coming to me a couple of months after the surgery with severe pain. And I still remember the name of that gentleman. And I rang him up and I told him I have a patient like this. I was thinking of a diagnosis of post-surgical necrotizing scleritis, but I had never seen this clinical entity at all. So I took, the, he immediately said, you bring the patient, it was late evening. And I took the patient to his house and he agreed with the diagnosis. But as uh, Dr. Narayan Kuti said, he was a very astute clinician. And he was very keen that this patient be taken to LF hospital and uh, shown to the postgraduate students. I mean, these are very old memories. So he was a, an extremely a, a thorough clinician. And that's why I thought that this talk, I gave the, talk, the title of this talk like that. I mean, uh, that is a challenging cases, a tribute to an astute clinician. And basically. 
So it's indeed a great honor, and probably of all the accomplishments that I've had during the course of the last 30, 35 years that I've spent in Kerala, this is something very special for me. So my title is Collection of Challenging Case Scenarios for the Comprehensive Ophthalmologist. Tribute to an astute clinician. What I'm going to show in the next 25 to 30 minutes is a few cases which I don't know whether it will interest an average ophthalmologist because these are very difficult clinical situations and many of us in our practice probably would prefer to send these patients off to a bigger institution or a better clinician. So uh, these are cases like that and these are clinical cases where one in a, I mean, from all the experience that I've had, these are very rare clinical situations. And uh, that's why I thought I will share this uh, uh, presentation with you all. And I'd like to make it very clear that I'm not an authority in any of these uh, situations or scenarios that I am uh, explaining here. And there can be differences of opinion. And probably I'm treading on a path much different from what I normally talk about for the last many years. So what is a challenging case? It's a very unusual case. It's a very uncommon case. It questions your clinical acumen. And that's the most important thing. It makes you reassess your decisions, rethink and re-examine your patient time and again. And sometimes it forces you to open your books and in today's world probably open the PubMed or the Google search to see whether you can get any additional information which will help in the management of this particular patient. It also forces you to consult peers, people whom you feel are in a position to give you better advice in the interest of the patient and yourself. And it also tests your ability to convince patients and also keep the patient under your care so that you are able to it gives you an opportunity. It gives you a difficult opportunity, I would say, to see whether you can really see a happy patient at the end of the day. So this is my first patient. Actually, these are patients whom I have seen, I have examined, I have treated to a large extent. And these are from my archives. And you know, the reason why we remember some of these patients is because they were difficult situations. We always remember Patients who have bad outcomes, maybe because of the natural cause of the disease, but patients who have bad outcomes always linger in our minds. That is one of the, I mean, drawbacks of probably the medical profession, but probably that is one thing that pushes us to perform better. So the first case was seen by me way back in 2012, nearly nine years ago. This was a 27 year old female who presented to me, who was actually brought to me by one of my well wishers. And uh, this patient had a defective vision, slight defective vision and metamorphopsy on the left eye. The patient had already been examined in two other hospitals and already some necessary tests had been done. She was a mild myope. She was, had POCD. She was a hypothyroid on treatment. She was very obese, but she was a very young and bright lady she actually was from northern part of India, but she married a Malayali and who was having a job here and that's how she landed here. So this was the clinical picture of this particular patient. If you're in the patient, as I told you, she had blurring of, she had a good vision, six, nine, but the near visual acuity was affected. What you can see here are these discrete, deep, well-defined yellow lesions in the posterior pole of the retina. As I said, this patient was seen about 10 years ago and she had a small subretinal hemorrhage. I don't know whether you can make here, so I may appreciate it, and an area of edema, and this is probably a neovascular membrane. So considering this young lady who is only 27 years old, this is a case probably of a choroidal neovascular membrane, and seeing these yellow lesions here, it's a case of a post-inflammatory choroidal neovascular membrane. The fluorescein angiography had already been done elsewhere, but you can see the 
OCT in various sections. And I would like you to see this particular section here, which is taken through that yellow lesion, which probably is quite very difficult to comment on what exactly this is. There is a hyperreflective area, which is involving the outer retina and the, uh, and the outer retinal bands with an irregularity of the retinal pigment epithelium. Passing through the area of the hemorrhage and that particular membrane, there is a hyperreflective area here. There is intraretinal edema. Therefore, clinically, it's a case of a choroidal neovascular membrane in a young woman in one eye. Today, if you have octa, probably you would do that, and that may just clinch your diagnosis. This was a fluorescein angiogram that was done elsewhere. But surprisingly, the fluorescein angiogram in the area of the neovascular membrane does not show the normal fussy fluorescence that is usually equated with a choroidal neovascular membrane. But personally, I felt that could be possibly because of the presence of the hemorrhage and also the edema, which sometimes masks the, uh, I mean, the, the neovascular leakage that usually happens in a neovascular membrane. Coming to these areas, which are, these are all hyperfluorescent, even in the very early phases of the fluorescein angiogram, but none of them are showing any leakage. They are just, you know, staining that particular lesion. The right eye also had a small yellow patch, and that was also showing the same hyperfluorescence. This patient was treated with intravitreal anti vegf agents, and there was a very good response. And you can see here, the patient was also happy the visual acuity improved to six by six N6. Subsequently, this lady used to come on an intermittent basis. She used to visit me. So, but then for a quite some time, she was doing extremely well. These yellow patches continued to be there, but there was no sign of any increase in size. The membrane was not reforming again. And for nearly a year or so, she maintained good visual acuity but once in a while, she underwent a fluorescein angiogram, and she also underwent an OCT on a very regular basis to see whether there is a reactivation of the neovascular complex. However, after a gap of six months, she suddenly came out, I mean, reappeared in the outpatient department with blurring of vision in the, in the left eye again. And if you see, compare from what it was in December, there was a significant increase in the size of these yellow lesions. Their numbers also had increased, but there is no evidence of any inflammation in the form of vitritis or no anterior segment inflammation. And more importantly, there is a re-exacerbation of this particular area here, whether it is just inflammation or whether it's also associated neovascularization is a doubt just from the clinical picture alone. However, there is no evidence of any fresh hemorrhage. Therefore, my diagnosis at that time was a reactivation of the inflammatory content. And autofluorescence is quite useful in these sort of situations where it shows you these white patches, which tells you that, yes, there is active disease. In autofluorescence, actually, you've got dark and white. White shows that there is an area of in, I mean, active disease Black shows areas of heel disease. I think that's all we can interpret from a very, very simple point of view. So the patient again underwent the ICG and the fluorescein angiogram. The ICG shows patches of decreased hypocyanescence or hypofluorescence corresponding to the lesions all blocked. It may be because of the infiltrate. It is not choroidal ischemia, I feel. It's all because of the infiltrate. The fluorescein angiogram was quite interesting at that stage because patient had, you know, you can see here, there are patches, I mean, this is 56 seconds, and you can see here, it's sometimes basically whether it's the early hyper with light hyper, and basically this had blooming here. But if you see again, probably again, the lesions are all getting stained. But here I felt that there is a, something like a fussy hyperfluorescence, suggestive that probably there is also a reactivation of the membrane. At that moment of time, consulting, the patient was very reluctant. There are a lot of, there are a lot of social issues as far as this particular patient was concerned. 
because she was recently married there was the husband was not very conducive to any form of investigation and treatment and with a lot of effort i referred the patient to an endocrinologist at that time i distinctly remember so that she has her uh, her uh, thyroid and also obesity and also the pocd and the control i anyway started her on steroids i was very keen to start her on refer her for immunomodulatory treatment but unfortunately the patient was not very much willing at that period of time but nonetheless you can see here the patient after steroid therapy here you can see that the patient in spite of the steroid the steroid therapy did help in resolution of these inflammatory areas but then you can see here there was a subretinal fibrosis like picture and the visual acuity decreased to 1 by 60 therefore somewhere down the line the neovascular membrane has got reactivated and probably apart from the inflammation there was also a reactivation of the neovascular membrane which had to be attended to and that at the period of time the patient received one and it was a bevacizumab map and subsequently the patient was uh, expressed her desire to move to her place from which she came from in northern india for further management and the last time i saw this particular patient was on the 13th of december 2014 my final diagnosis in this particular case is punctate in a choroid because this is a patient where the lesions were mainly in the posterior pole the patient was young it was a myopic woman the mean age of presentation in pic is 32 years it's a very rare disease it's usually bilateral and if you see the other eye also has got some small changes which is still asymptomatic it's of unknown etiology it's got two dangerous complications with this particular patient had the choroidal neovascular membrane and the subretinal fibrosis there could be certain differential diagnosis which i'll come to later but the treatment is observation if there's hardly any active disease steroids and mycophenolate mofetil antibody of injection in case there is neovascularization and i'd like to say that you can get neovascularization in the absence of active inflammation and some of these patients may require a combination of both inflammatory treatment and also treatment for the neovascular complex could this patient have been managed better or probably an earlier intervention in the form of a, a, a oral steroids or probably immunomodulatory treatment which might could have prevented the relapse is difficult to decide at this particular juncture because always as i told you when outcomes are not favorable in the management of any disease we always question ourselves as to whether the things have gone the way we wanted and whether our decisions have been right at any period of time so multifocal choroiditis could be a differential diagnosis but then this is a picture of a patient with multifocal choroiditis but you can see here the patches are much more extensive they cover the whole of the posterior area unlike pic which is more or less in the macula and multifocal choroiditis also can cause a choroidal neovascular membrane but the inflammatory component in the form of vitreitis etc is significant in multifocal choroiditis and practically absent in pic so multi apm pp where the looking at those yellowish lesions probably apm pp but then neovascular complexes are not seen in apm pp and therefore finally i personally feel that this was an uncommon case of pic and i don't think in my long years of practice i might have missed other cases of pic but i don't remember having treated a patient with punctate in a choroidopathy with choroidal neovascularization my second case again is a very really rare presentation and this was again you know these are patients as i told you which you know keeps you i mean never goes from your memory this is a 33 year old male who presented about one and a half two years ago i still remember this patient came to me late evening actually he was there in my list of patients he was one of the last patients i saw in that particular day and this patient actually directly flew in from colombo in sri lanka he was a malayali only he was not a sri lankan he presented with sudden defective vision in the left eye one week duration visual acuity was practically nil in the left eye but normal practically normal in the right eye he had minimal vitreitis and the intraocular pressure was normal now this was a clinical picture of this particular patient the right eye looked quite normal at that period of time and basically if you see the left eye you see this yellowish discrete necrotic this is a patch of necrotic retinitis very classic picture of necrotic retinitis in the posterior pole of the retina 
So this is really a very dangerous clinical situation. So if you see the optos, the wide angle picture, the right eye, this is very important. The reason why I'm showing you the right eye, right angle picture is the right eye at that moment of time is absolutely normal. And as far as the left eye is concerned, there is no peripheral area of necrotizing retinitis. In acute retinal necrosis, at least all the cases that I have seen in the last 25, 30 years, all cases present initially with peripheral necrotic retinitis, with significant vitritis. And basically patients have significant floaters and some of them even have pain and redness because of anterior, some element of anterior uveitis. But this patient actually hardly had, you can see here the picture is so clear. So for there's hardly any vitreous inflammation and the lesion is completely restricted to the posterior pole with some vague patches here, but no, and then there's here the slight perivascular sheathing in certain vessels and some small patches of yellowish white infiltrate in the peripheral retina. The right eye OCT was normal. The left eye, as I told you, there are in autofluorescence, as I told you, these patches of increased autofluorescence tells you about active disease. But what was interesting were the OCT findings, which shows the necrosis. Now, if you see the neck, these are all necrotic retina. These hyporeflective areas are areas of retinal necrosis. And basically what you're seeing is small tags of retinal tissue overlying retinal pigment epithelium. Now, if you see the OCT, this is a top cut picture, and this is showing that the inner retina is still reasonably okay, and there is some hyperreflectivity, which shows there is a element of vasculitis resulting in ischemia. But as you come down the picture here, there is total loss of retinal tissue, and if you see the foveal section, it's completely gone. Therefore, that probably the inflammation has started from here, and it is progressing up and down on either side. So this is where it has hit early. And this is very interesting to see the complete loss and just the internal limiting membrane. So these are, I mean, today with a spectral domain OCT, we have been able to define some of these very characteristic features in uh, optical coherence tomography. Fluorescein angiography was done elsewhere. This was done much earlier, a week before he has come. There's an area of hyperfluorescence here, which is more or less remaining the same. Probably this is the area of active retinitis earlier, and that pro progressed to a necrosis in the, uh, in the later phase within a few days. Therefore, to summarize, this is a case of necrotizing retinitis in the posterior pole in what appears to be an immunocompetent patient. HIV was negative, but unfortunately, we didn't do the CD4 cell count at that time. And that probably was one thing which we could have done, although the HIV was negative. VDRL and DPHA was negative. History was taken in detail by me, and there was nothing very positive in the history. At least he was not willing to give any positive history. And these are the differential diagnosis here. Toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, which is usually when you see, the, I mean, the only in the immunocompromised patients, you get such a severe retinochoroiditis in a toxoplasmosis, HSV, VSHV, CMV, and of course, tuberculosis comes in India for any differential diagnosis. So we sent the anterior chamber tap for these tests, and the AC tap came positive for VSV and immediately started him about 10 to 15 milligram per kg intravenous acyclovir. And considering the severity of the inflammation and the inflammation slowly appearing in the other eye, we, after consulting a very, very senior UVI specialist from uh, elsewhere who is a good friend of mine, because in these sort of situations, I always, you know, take an opinion because I am very reluctant because these are sight-threatening diseases and we should we give the patient the best possible outcomes at least in this period of time. So intravitreal GAN cyclovir also was given in both the eyes, but, and, but then the, in fact, the inflammation started in the other eye. Why I'm showing you the series of OCT is that the inflammation in the other eye started in the inner retina. You can see here the hyperreflective area somewhere in the inner plexiform layer. And you can see that slowly progressing. It's very unfortunate. In the, it's right in front of your eye, in spite of intensive treatment, you see a patient progressively losing vision. And, you know, from 6'9", he dropped to counting fingers within a matter of 24 to 48 hours. And you can see how the necrosis is slowly progressing. Therefore, the necrosis started in the inner retina, not in the outer retina, as has been described in certain other conditions, which I'll come to later. But nonetheless, the disease progressed in the other eye very rapidly in spite of the intervention. 
and you can see the multicolor photograph which shows you the area of retinitis here in greenish color which is progressively increasing in size increasing in size and a small patch of hemorrhage also here and i would like to emphasize there is hardly any vitreous inflammation sequential oct images of early macular necrosis that was that particular case was our case which was published in the indian journal of ophthalmology by one of our fellows dr rt jain and this is also a case in literature where they have again shown the sequential oct images where the inflammation starts in the inner retina and progresses to the outer retina so this is another case but then in this particular case you can see here there is also a peripheral involvement as we see in classic acute retinal necrosis this is a very interesting article that i came across because this particular presentation forced me to sit and read a little bit and this is a very interesting article by zimmerman zimmerman was a very famous ocular pathologist i do not know whether the younger generation of ophthalmologists know that but nonetheless he actually did an uh, uh, i mean removed the blind eye in a patient with a ret necrotic retinitis and he showed that even in patients of po and the definition is wrong that progressive outer retinal necrosis which actually means that the necrosis starts in the outer retina he showed with his logical examination that even in these cases the inflammation actually starts in the inner retina and not in the outer retina at all and this again has been explained in this particular article that varicella zoster virus reactivation is believed to involve retrograde axonal spread along ganglion cell axons from the lateral geniculate <coughs> nucleus and we should remember both pon and arn is actually re re reactivation of latent herpetic infection therefore to conclude therefore pon versus arn in this particular patient the absence of pain or inflammation in the anterior segment of vitreous and the poor response to treatment and the absence of peripheral involvement is probably suggestive of a progressive outer retinal necrosis although the progression of the disease in the other eye did not really show then the oct to start in the outer retina but as i told you the definition itself is little controversial and what probably goes against the patient is the immunocompromised patient but this was immunocompetent patient at least till the time he was with us in our hospital the third case is again a very unusual case again we have a lot of surprises clinical surprises after cataract surgery it's very common especially as you do more and more cataract surgery once in a while you land up with a clinical situation or a procedure after surgery where the patient is unhappy the patient comes to you with sudden decrease in vision etc and that is the probably the most difficult at least in our hospital you know you can see the whole thing fluttering around that oh patient i mean is unhappy because it's a very unhappy patient it's a very unhappy situation so this is a 58 year old lady who in 2017 underwent a very neat cataract surgery got back normal visual acuity and was very happy but then she reappeared in january 2018 that is nearly about 2 months after the cataract surgery with decrease in vision in the operated eye and she also i mean when the if you see the photograph here there are choroidal folds here choroidal folds can be seen in a lot of clinical conditions that is not the purview of my presentation but anyway that tells you that there may be some inflammation also and this is the uh, uh, montage photograph taken at that time actually this patient i went through the case file this patient was initially seen by one of our senior fellows in the retina department and that patient and he had actually more or less thought that it could be a rheumatogenous detachment and he diagnosed this particular area as presence of proliferative vitreo retinopathy but then looking at this clinical picture an experienced clinician will all be automatically say this probably is a case of exudative retinal detachment you can see an yellowish color discoloration here which is very very characteristic of an exudative retinal detachment most importantly the patient if you do see the oct he has she has got this uh, subretinal fluid here and what it tells you is the chronicity of the subretinal fluid you can see here that is it's been there for quite some time and as you go down inferiorly the separation is much more just to show you that it's an inferior detachment so it was a shifting subretinal fluid actually the patient had an exudative uh, retinal detachment there was no choroidal detachment it's very important to look for that because you want to rule out uveal diffusion syndrome which you may get after cataract surgery but one of the characteristic features of uveal diffusion is the presence of choroidal detachment and there was no thickening of the choroid also in this case it was a purely a retinal detachment with shifting subretinal fluid
So it is important at this point to do a fluorescein angiography. And if you see the fluorescein angiography, you can see in this upper nasal quadrant, there's an area of leakage, which is progressed significant increase in the leakage here. Of course, this is a toxicity of the vessels is because of the presence of the subretinal fluid. But what was interviewing was the uh, hypofluorescence in the optic disc. I, this is something which I have not noted in my notes in the particular case, but I noticed this when I was preparing for this particular talk, and I had a doubt looking at the clinical picture, whether there are any drusenoid changes in the optic disc, which again, because it's all seen in the periphery, there's nothing, I mean, on the center of the optic disc, like we characteristically see in a patient with a, uh, with a, with a, with a disc leakage. So nonetheless, we had a patient, so this looks like what we call is an atypical central serous chorioretinopathy. So the left eye was absolutely normal. Therefore, this is a case of an atypical central serous chorioretinopathy, which could be misdiagnosed as a rectomatogenous retinal detachment or a case of an uveal effusion syndrome. This is quite uncommon because we are seeing this condition in a patient that is quite elderly. She is a female patient. She is quite old, and it has been noticed after a cataract surgery. And it's not that the cataract surgery is the cause for that. Probably she had some element of uh, you know, fluid even earlier. So anyway, I gave a focal laser to the leak in the upper nasal, I advised focal laser to the leak in the upper nasal quadrant because that area, you know, once you make the patient sit, the fluid decreases. Stop topical steroids, which is on a very low dose because steroids can increase the uh, subretinal fluid. But there was no response to this conservative treatment and visual acuity further worsened to one meter. At this point of time, she underwent an external drainage of the subretinal fluid. I'm not showing you the procedure. But what I would like to show you is within 24 hours, you can see the change in the particular case. This photograph was taken the next day. What was more, what is more important in the management is that you can see the OCT also. It shows that there is a significant decrease in this is the pre-treatment OCT, this is the post-treatment OCT within 24 hours, showing that there is a significant decrease in the subretinal fluid. But it's very important to repeat the fluorescein angiogram immediately because if there are areas of leakage, we have to treat it. Otherwise, the fluid is going to come back again. So the fluorescein angiogram was repeated within 24 hours, and it shows this particular leakage here. This particular area, which was treated earlier, actually on the operating table, after removing the subretinal fluid, I also gave some laser indirect treatment in this particular area. But here, I thought there was not much of a leakage. This area of leakage was noted. This was not that earlier, probably because of the presence of significant fluid. And additional laser photocoagulation was given to these areas of leakage which was detected. And subsequently, the patient did extremely well. And actually, the last checkup, she recently had come to the hospital about a couple of months back. And the visual equity in that I had improved to 61269. So the take-home message is basically the presence of a rare post-operative circulate or cataract surgery. And it's quite rare and uncommon considering the age, sex, and the type of presentation and could be easily misdiagnosed in many uh, centers. The fourth case is a 19-year-old female, again, who was referred to our center by a senior ophthalmologist way back in 2019. This is about one year back with the defective. This, again, is a very difficult case. I'm not really sure what I'm doing is really correct for this particular patient. But then, as I told you, I always, you know, nowadays I take the picture. I consult my colleagues in the hospital, et cetera, in more than one occasion. And the visual acuity was 6 by 12. And this is the picture I saw. This is a small whitish lesion here. And there is some element of fluid in the fovea, in the macula. This is the picture. Now, when you see the autofluorescent, this is dark, meaning that this is not a recent lesion. This is an old lesion. And more importantly, there is no hyperautofluorescence around it. See, if there is an active disease, there will be hyperautofluorescence around it, which probably, I, I, I mean, I don't think there is anything, but most of the changes are right here in the center of the macula. So we did the OCT at that period of time. I didn't do a fluorescein angiography in the initial checkup to complete the investigation. I don't know why I did not do it, probably because I was overconfident with the diagnosis with the OCT itself. It showed there are some changes in the outer retina, but it also showed that there are some changes in the inner retina too. And most importantly, there is a little bit of foveal atrophy and there is a distortion of the inner retina layers. But if you see that particular area where you see the whitish patch, I did not see anything very significant here except for minimal hyperreflectivity, but I saw nothing that to suggest that there is any uh, gross inflammation and there is little hyperreflectivity in the choroid also. This patient, I immediately, I did some tests which were all not significant. Montu was negative, done elsewhere. Patient was put on a 
course of oral steroids and tapered and uh, as usual you know steroids is uh, is good because it free it gives improvement but it can the, the downside of steroid is it can mask what actually has been happening there so this patient actually showed improvement you can see the reformation of the ellipsoid zone and the uh, and, and the and the and the external limiting membrane the fovea also regaining normal size and the autofluorescence also showed that these areas of increased autofluorescence had decreased and the patient also was happy for a couple of months the patient was happy this is not retinal pigment epithelitis because this is an OCT of a retinal pigment epithelitis. The changes are mainly in the outer retina. And here you see there are some changes in the inner retina too, but retinal pigment epithelitis is a very self-limiting disease. And probably it's a, uh, it's a diagnosis more of exclusion than anything else. But anyway, this patient was managed just with oral steroids initially. And however, the patient came back after about four to five months with a recurrence, with again a defective vision, again with floaters in the right eye. And the visual acuity this time had dramatically decreased, much less than what it was earlier. Now, if you see the color photograph here, this is uh, again the particular lesion which was there earlier. There's a little bit of in, I mean, fluid collection. There is not much of vitritis. Again, see, active retinochoroiditis, actually, you find a lot of vitreous inflammation. But there is, there is inflammation because the OCT shows cells in the vitreous. You can see here, there are cells in the vitreous. I would not say that there is no inflammation in the vitreous, but there is not significant inflammation, which is acting as an impediment to your examination, like what you see in some of the cases of toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, et cetera. So anyway, at this period of time, you can see the increased autofluorescence around this particular lesion. Suggestive, probably there is an reactivation around that area also. Patient underwent a fluorescein angiogram, which shows a hyperfluorescence of this patch, which is normally seen in all these inflammatory conditions. Patient was started, actually, I did the toxotiter. Again, the toxotiter was not increased much. I mean, this is not usually in cases of toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis. It increases much more than what this is. Patient was put on Bactrim along with uh, steroids again. And again, the patient showed progressive improvement. But unfortunately, the corona COVID-19 uh, pandemic settled in and the patient actually was on a, on a teleconsultation and the patient had all stopped the bathroom and the steroid on, on their own because she had some rashes, etc. And therefore, I told her to stop the treatment because coming to hospital is going to be difficult. But nonetheless, during a visit in April and just immediately after the lockdown, there was an improvement in the clinical condition. The visual acuity also had improved from 636 to 612. However, again, the patient just recently came back with a recurrence, and I felt the recurrence is mainly because of the inadequate treatment, because the treatment in the last time was not done completely. And my favorite treatment for, for I, my final diagnosis is toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, which I uh, consulted with some people, and finally, they also agreed with me. And finally, the patient is on oral clindamycin. This time, I started clindamycin. I didn't start steroids for some period of time, because I wanted to give a loading dose, because the patient has had steroids steroids and I did not want to overload the patient with steroids so started clindamycin for some uh, some period of time a week or so before I initiated the steroid treatment the patient again is showing improvement in the sense that this uh, hyperreflective therefore these hyperreflective patches involving the retina is one of the SDOCT features in cases of toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, as has been shown in this particular case report. And in NFAS imaging, you can see these dilated inflamed choroidal vessels, which decrease over a period of time following treatment. Therefore, this particular case I felt is a case of a, but then the presentation was unusual. That's what I felt. This is not a classic presentation that we see because um, the lesion is usually adjacent, which was not really very significant. There was hardly any vitreous inflammation or a vasculitis in the, in the fundus flows in angiography. So this was, a, this is the, my last case. This again is a very, very interesting case. Now, this lady actually is from Palakkad. She came and consulted me in uh, October 2019. Her left eye was practically blind. The left eye actually on examination showed granulomatous inflammation. She had been treated elsewhere. Uh, granulomatous inflammation, intraocular pressure was low. It's something like going into at what we, in, our, in my younger days, we used to call as atrophic bulbi because of chronic inflammation. There was not a seclusio pupillae. There was seclusio pupillae. There was broad-based synecae, all suggestive of granulomatous inflammation, cataractous lens. But most importantly, the patient came with a decrease in vision in the right eye. And this is the picture of an area of arterial occlusion. Now, looking at this, 
not the classic celioretinal distribution. If you really see, this is involving the papillomacular bundle. Usually, in a case of a celioretinal artery, you see a little bit of involvement in the temporal area also like this. But nonetheless, this patient had an arterial occlusion. And uh, basically, considering the glandomatous inflammation in the other eye for the last one year, which has had a very bad outcome, and a picture like this in the right eye, I mean, obviously, we need to think of an inflammatory element in this particular patient. So the patient, again, was fully investigated. Montu was strongly positive done elsewhere, 40 millimeter ESR was raised. She also underwent all the tests. The anterior chamber tap was done elsewhere. It was FOXO positive and therefore earlier on the other eye. That was for the other eye. And the patient had been treated for toxoplasmosis. But then looking at the eye, I was quite sure that this is not toxochorioretinitis uh, at all. And the patient actually had shifted to Ayurvedic treatment because of the in, 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 I mean, un, I mean uh, unfavorable outcomes that she has had. So if you look at the right eye now, that is an arterial occlusion here is this hyperreflective band of the inner retina is very, very characteristic of an arterial uh, occlusion because of edema and ischemia. And the, uh, she underwent the fluorescein angiography. I'm talking a little fast because I think I'm crossing my time. But anyway, you can see that this leakage suggestive that there is inflammation. But what I would like you all to see is that there is, at least in the posterior pole, there is no other in, I mean, inflammatory patches except for some areas of blocked choroidal fluorescence here. And this is mainly because of the arterial occlusion and the edema which is blocking the underlying choroidal uh, 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 fluorescence. So fortunately for the patient, she improved. She just automatically improved. You can see here, and you can see the OCT after that also. At this moment of time, I sent the patient to a rheumatologist for complete evaluation. And uh, T, apart from the strong Montu positive, which I told earlier, Quantifron Gold was positive, but all other tests were negative. She also had an HRCT of the chest for mediastinal lymphadenopathy, which was negative. She had a very raised homocysteine. Now, I do not know whether that was a cause for the vascular uh, occlusion. Anyway, she was started on folic acid. And uh, the rheumatologist, who is an aggressive rheumatologist, suggested the ATT plus minus immunosuppression oral steroids in case of worsening. Now, this patient actually was a teacher in a school. She has a very worried and she may, did not come for two weeks, but then she returned within about 15 days with a defective vision. And you can see the picture that has changed now. Within a matter of 15 days, these are, this is the photograph that I'm seeing with the patient where you see all these uh, very discrete, yellowish, deep patches. You can see the retinal vessel going over it. And this particular area, you can see a very, not a well demarcated, but definitely a zone where there is underlying probably choroidal inflammation, you can see here, and this area of hypofluorescence here. Therefore, you can see the wide angle picture, which has to show you. Now, if you look at it very carefully, now is it, uh, I mean, my differential di I mean, our diagnosis at that period of time, is it sarcoid or is it tuberculosis? Although systemically evaluation sarcoid was totally negative, but again, there is not much of vitreous inflammation, but the perivas, some of the lesions are perivascular in uh, distribution, like what we see, perivenous in distribution, like what we see in sarcoid, but considering the strong Montu positivity and also the presence of a positive quantiferon gold, which has got actually very limited use in an Indian population. Nonetheless, there was a strong opinion to start the patient. Now, at this moment of time, I took an opinion from two very senior retina specialists in our country as to what exactly is the uh, uh, is the is the I mean could be the cause and basically one said it could be sarcoid the other side so basically that's what is all about uveitis it's very difficult sometimes when you see these unusual and uncommon presentations to give one single opinion anyway the patient was started on oral anti tuberculosis treatment and steroids at the patient of time what I would like to see I mean what I would like to show you is this particular picture from a textbook recently released by Vishali and company uh, basically to show you a choroidal grand loma in a patient with a, with a, with a tuberculosis, which is again a very uh, diffuse uh, lesion. It's not a very well demarcated lesion, uh, basically like what we are seeing in our particular case. But if you see the OCT through that area, significant elevation, you just see the elevation here, significant elevation all over the posterior pole. Some, I mean, so, and it is not that, you know, you're seeing a granuloma here, like what has been described in multimodal imaging in, choroid, in uh, tuberculous choroiditis. But there is a significant elevation here and in, uh, involving the whole of the posterior pole, looking very scary at this particular point of time. 
and <clears throat> I mean, basically, I looked into recently the literature in of OCT in choroidal therapy, and it was interesting that one of my good friends, uh, Dr. Amjad Salman from uh, Joseph I. Hospital, has described the OCT findings uh, many years ago. What they call as the contact sign, where there is a presence of elevation with the uh, with an addition of the retinal pigment epithelium and choreo capillaries with the overlying neurosensory retina at what the at the apex of the lesion, where along with the presence of serous macular detachment, what they describe as a contact sign, and which has again been recently been shown in another uh, presentation of uh, multimodal imaging. Now, in EDI, they are able to show this well demarcated lesion. In our case, however, the EDI could not be done initially because of the significant elevation. Fluorescein angiography at that time again showed leakage, but what I would like to show is there's no significant peripheral vasculitis in the sense that there is no much peripheral perivascular leakage from vessels like what we see in vasculitis. Um, but nonetheless, basically, there was focal areas of uh, corresponding to the various lesions. You could see the changes. There is no phlebitis like what we see both in cases of sarcoid and tuberculosis. So at that moment of time, considering the significant elevation as advised by the two senior UVR specialists, the steroid was a little, bit, little hiked up to 60 milligram, and it was slowly decreased along with the anti-tuberculous treatment, and this showed a good response to treatment. Now, this patient continued the treatment for the couple of six months uh, of uh, ATT treatment. The patient could not come regularly for checkup. The I mean, she came in February. At that time itself, you can see these healed patches here, but there is no evidence of any pigmentation as yet in this particular thing. And the most recent uh, visit was 2660. She had completely responded to the treatment, as you can see in the OCT at that period of time. You can see here completely responded. There is a, I mean, the whole elevation has completely gone. Therefore, the patient actually has done well. She is asymptomatic at this period of time. Time. But nonetheless, I would not be surprised that whether the, the patient comes back to us with again another recurrence. So these are the five cases I thought I will just share with you all. I do not know whether it had some anything interesting for any one of you. But then from the point of view of the young generation of ophthalmologists who are there in our city and in our state, I thought these are all uh, things that can just stimulate some interest in clinical ophthalmology. Because uh, that is what is, I think, losing its importance in, a, in, a, in, in the present time because of the, you know, the focus on the surgical training, etc. So I thought that just uh, taking from the net, they let the young know they ne will never find a more interesting, more interest, instructive book than the patient himself. I think that is the most important. That is what keeps the medical science challenging. That is what keeps the medical science interesting. That is what keeps all of us going. That's what keeps us learning even at the, after many, many years of experience. And I always feel a good physician treats the disease, but a great physician treats the patient who has the disease. It's very important to look at the patient as a whole, and it's not. And we have to spend time with history taking, etc., which again is losing its charm in the present day uh, situation. So I would like to actually, I mean, there probably is an opportunity for me. I do not know whether I will get another opportunity in my career, which is now reaching the to light. I want to actually pay my respects to my teacher, late Professor Pierre Lamba, who was my professor and head, and who was my guide for my thesis when I was doing my post-graduation in Jipmer uh, Pondicherry. He was actually a great clinician. His uh, case discussions used to be really wonderful. In fact, our pulse rate will be about 120, 130. I used to always have palpitations during his uh, uh, case discussions, you know, with so much of stress and tension. And what I would like to appreciate is that just with a direct ophthalmoscope under slit lamp, these people could do uh, wonders as far as clinical examination is concerned. And that holds true even for Professor Gopinath Menon. Actually, I still remember a particular retinal detachment that he uh, referred to me in a very, very later part of his life, probably even a one or two months prior to his sudden demise one morning. And basically, and he rang me up later and asked me, wasn't there not a horseshoe tear in the upper temporal column? So that's the sort of enthusiasm they, these uh, people have in examining patients and elucidating minute details. I would also like to place and record my sincere uh, gratitude to two senior ophthalmologists. Actually, in my very early years in Kerala, actually, there have been some ophthalmologists who have played a very critical role in, uh, you know, in my in, in my growth, if I may say so. 
who showed a lot of trust and faith in my in my in my in my approach in my practice and i think i would like to place and record uh, my sincere thanks to dr krishan kuti and both of the mary kuriakos who probably both of them are not working now but nonetheless i still remember in the early 90s the sort of uh, Uh, support they gave me in my in my career. There are so many other ophthalmologists. I don't want to name them. In fact, people like John Williams, <coughs> Casey Mathai, etc., who have been so close to me over the years. The Medical Trust Hospital actually was really the ground where I actually where I started my career, and I think the consultants there, late A.K. Abraham, late Dr. Subba Rao, etc., were so much you know I mean helpful in my early years. And the senior anesthetists, even now, Dr. Vinod. Philip John, the psychiatrist, and the physician, uh, Dr. Sujit Vasudevan. Actually, in my early years, he used to be. He had. A, he was a very busy practitioner. The who and why in Kochi with his patients, and he used to send so many of them to me with a, uh, assuring them that look here, I'm sending you to the right man. And late Dr. Babu Peter was an hematologist, a close family friend of my mine. and my wife actually i visited his house in angabali many times he was also a man who really used to instill a lot of confidence in the early years of my life so with these few words thank you all for this great opportunity i hope i could really make sense of what this all award uh, is and i think i should take this opportunity also to just uh, show this particular award to you all this is the award that i was given to me and this is the medal that was handed over to me i thank the kochin ophthalmic society for having been kind enough to do the same thank you once again thank you very much sir that was a really fantastic uh, oration what an oration should actually be you know uh, the the exposition of uh, the scientific knowledge exposition of the years of experience that you have gathered uh, and uh, even even you know in, even though i work with him in the same institute i wish i was uh, 50% or 20% as meticulous as him in gathering uh, information in gathering evidence in keeping track of old patients and things like that and i am sure the entire uh, audience on youtube facebook and zoom has really enjoyed your oration thank you so much sir for accepting our invitation thank you thank you very much thank you it's been a great oration thank you gopal shall we go on to the cornea session can the team cornea take over vinay yes sir gopal can you introduce the cornea team you are not audible gopal sir you should unmute i am unmuted yeah 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 can you hear me yeah yes so vinay and uh, sujith will be speaking and uh, uh anil uh, anita and uh, freddy will be the panelists um, good morning everybody uh, thank you dr gopal for this you know opportunity now the question that dr gopal gave to me was a 55 year old diabetic with central corneal ulcer with 1 mm hypopia okay like everything else he is very particular you know and very specific in the question and luckily he didn't Say whether it was a male or female, and incidentally, uh, it is known that diabetic males are more likely to have a corneal ulcer than diabetic females. Now, when we are given a you know clinical scenario like this, most often the picture that comes to our mind is something like this: you know, a dirty-looking, whitish, yellowish white, you know, necrotic lesion in the center of the cornea with a small hypopia. But it can be like this too: a dense, thick, yellowish white. a uh, dry looking lesion in the center with multiple yellowish lesions around it with hypopen or something like that nearly normal central cornea with a central edema some infiltrate around that and a hypopen now what are the differences between these cases and how will we approach them that is the crux of uh, the whole you know today's discussion so when we see something like this what we intend to do first is to find out a cause for this try to remove the cause uh, you know address the ancillary problems restore a normal function and address the you know symptomatic uh, patient too so the cause the main problem which we have to differentiate is is it infectious or it's non infectious and now in these cases uh, uh, the our 
assessment starts right from the history. As uh, Kirita sir was mentioning, history, you know, nothing can replace a proper history taking. Trauma, as you all of all of us know, is very important history, and what with what is also very important. Diabetes mellitus is very important because, as uh, as a recent publication from Taiwan has shown that people with diabetes are more likely to get corneal infiltrates and corneal infections about 1.3 times more likely to get a corneal ulcer. <clears throat> so history of diabetes is very important and the status of diabetes is also quite important. Now, next aspect, which most of us forget to ask is the medication use. What sort of medications has the per person used? There are two important aspects here. One is an injudicious use of uh, steroids and the second is uh, previous antimicrobials the patient has been because it can uh, really change the clinical picture the patient has compared to the organism causing the infection. Duration, as all of you know, is very important. Short, rapid presentation most likely is because, is because of the bacteria. And ask for and look for other predisposing conditions which can uh, you know, trigger problems. Now, in these three cases, if you, if you see, you know, there are central yellowish thick uh, uh, infiltrate in one, uh, you know, and uh, 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 fluffy infiltrate with the reduction in the corneal clarity and hypopia, and most likely in infection. But compare it to with this case, there is an infiltrate which is peripheral, cornea is clear, localized congestion. So, is that infection? Probably not. But then, is that probably is or probably not enough for us to proceed? Is a microbiological evaluation necessary? The answer is definitely yes. It is mandatory in these cases to get a microbiology. And what do you mean by microbiology? On a scraping for smears, for uh, KOH and grams, which gives you results in a few hours time and culture. Culture, routinely we take for bacteria and fungus and by blood, chocolate, agars and SDAs. So these are mandatory, which is available in almost all uh, labs in our uh, uh, you know, city. But then can we do away this, you know, this crazy stuff for sc uh, scraping and uh, Again, the answer is yes. So am I contradicting myself? No. You may decide to not to do scraping in very, very selected cases. And what are these selected cases? Think about one, two, three. One, in cases where the anterior chamber reaction is much, uh, you know, less than one, uh, one plus cells. Uh, infiltrate size is very small, less than two millimeter, probably, you know, away from the visual axis. In these cases, and of course, these are virgin infections where no prior treatment has been given. Then probably you can think about not doing and starting on treatment. And by treatment, what we mean is only antibacterials and nothing else. And if they are not responding in 48 hours, I mean time, then they need further evaluation. So this is uh, what the result we got. Uh, the first one, as we all know, the clinical picture sh uh, shows it is a bacterial and this is just a representative picture of gram positive. The second one is a, a scraping picture from this uh, patient showing multiple septate hyphae. Third also showed fungal filaments. So now we have a cause. We have identified what is causing the problem. Next step is to address this cause. How do you do that? Start. How do you start treatment in these cases? You start with antibacterial where you know it is a bacterial or in cases where you, your initial evaluation of smears is negative. You've not got any organism. In such situations, you start with antibacterial therapy and that too broad spectrum. What is preferred is a combination therapy with the cephalosporin and amy amnoglycoside. Monotherapy with fluoroquinolones uh, is also explained, but with the racing incident of resistant to fluoroquinolones, probably it is not a good idea to start a monotherapy in frank corneal ulcers. Antifungals, the preferred antifungal of choice in our setup is definitely natamycin because what we have in majority of cases is a separate fungal uh, uh, infections. So natamycin is the drug of the choice, uh, like as has been shown by the MUTT trial. Ozol or voriconazole, which is a commercially available pre pre preparation, can be used probably as an additive or a second agent rather than as a first line of therapy for these ulcers. Systemic agents are generally not preferred except in cases of very deep mycosis when there is threatening to, of limbers or when there is a frank clear involvement, lack of response with rapid progression and in endophthalmitis cases. 
uh, assess the improvement. Uh, symptomatic improvement is the first. Then there is a change in character of inf uh, infiltrate from, you know, the yellowish to white area. The edges become well defined. Edema reduces, inflammation reduces. In in 48 to you know 72 hours, if you get a response, continue the medication. If it is worse, see the sensitivity and change the antibiotics accordingly. And once there is a definitive therapy, I mean response, reduce, reduce the antibiotics from you know hourly to probably two hourly then probably to four hours or six hourly and stop that abruptly there is no further tapering like a steroid to making it to three two one that is not recommended and not advised because this tape slow taper induces uh, or favors uh, uh, bacterial resistance to antibiotics or anti anti uh, microbials inflammation is another devastating factor which causes tissue damage and probably that needs to be addressed and the and the what is used is steroids, very controversial. But in a bacterial ulcer, where you have a proper uh, you know uh, sensitivity and on bacterial serial drugs, once there is a clinical response, you may start steroids to reduce the inflammation. But it is absolutely contraindicated fungal impending perforations, and in cases where you have no etiological agent identified. To restore normal structure and function, you may have to resort to multiple types of surgical intervention. If there is a thinning, you may have to do a glue to stabilize. Or like in our case, if there is a rapid progression in fungal early therapeutic uh, uh, penetrating keratoplasty may be needed. So what favors uh, um, uh, uh, surgical intervention in these cases? It's been shown that old age delay referrals, treatment with steroid, poor vision, central location, presence of hypopion, large size, perforation, desmetrosis, limbal involvement are risk factors for uh, surgical intervention or the need for surgical intervention. Now I have, uh, I have to, when, so in these cases, when do you think of referring these patients? Definitely when there is a, a lack of response to topical agents, one-eyed patients, fulminant infections, threatening the visual axis, uh, impending perforation or desmetrosis, threatening the limbal uh, tissue, or if there is clear an involvement and in the front of thalmitis, if the facilities for further surgical and microbiological workup is not available, these patients have to be referred to centers where it is possible. So to take two few take home messages are, you may decide on empirical broad spectrum antibiotic if it is a small infiltrate or small ulcer, not threatening the visual axis and all other ulcers require microbiological workup. Always reassess if you're starting empirical therapy and if in 48 hours there is no response, they need microbiology and do not start topical steroids if there is no definitive causative diagnosis. And there is no role of cocktail of medicines. I mean, if no response in 24 to 48 hours, don't just change the medications without a proper my microbiological workup. And definitely do not hesitate to refer them to the nearest center for further work. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay, for that uh, crisp and very, uh, I think it has covered, he has covered everything very nicely. But for the time constraints, uh, a few points as a panelist, I would like to add is uh, uh, in the history taking also, he has uh, mentioned the importance of history taking. History taking, even though the optometrist is taking the history for us, we have to ask specific things like what are the modes of types of uh, uh, injury. Like uh, if, if it is a broomstick injury, think of any, uh, uh, you, you can give a clue to some of uh, some of the etiological agent like bacillus, uh, broomstick injury uh, and contaminated water or soil. It can, um, uh, it can be a nocardia, think of a nocardia infection. And uh, also in examination, the periocular in uh, examination, uh, the adnexia, always uh, the blinking, the, because uh, blinking uh, is a protective phenomena. Uh, as we all know, it is a first line of defense. The def defense, the precorneal tear film will be, uh, will be uh, intact if there is proper blinking and also look for any um, ectropion or lag of thalamus or uh, trichiasis and remove such causes. And also the hypopion, since the clinical scenario, it has, uh, Gopal has specifically mentioned about the hypopion. 
in fungal hypopion, it will be a bit different from the bacterial hypopion, like it will be thicker, it will be dome shaped, and it will not be uh, as a size to the, uh, uh, the si disparity between the size of the infiltrate and the hypopion. And uh, since it, the hy fungal hypopion is full of fungal hyphae, it will be immobile. Uh, any other points you have you would like to add? Vinay, can I just ask a question, Vinay? Yes, sir. When you initially itself, you mentioned the classification as infective and non-infective. Right. Now, hypopion, which are the non-infective causes? I mean, what, what, what should we keep in mind? Uh, one are you of looking the, at the masquerades or? Masquerades is definitely, uh, 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 you know, one of the causes. But the major causes, when you have a central ulcer with a hypopion and uh, non-infective cause, one of the major thing is toxicity. Okay, depending upon duration of the treatment, uh, the ulcer might have started as infective and has been on medication for long. So uh, the classical teaching of you know the epithelial defect and hypopion as signs of uh, resolution of infection is not always true. Epithelium defect may persist when the ulcer is sterile or once it has been sterilized, and uh, it may be because of the toxicity that the epithelium is not growing, or the base of the ulcer may still be quite necrotic, which prevents the epithelium from growing. And uh, seeing the a defect, you know, we have a, a thing to believe that there is active infection, and we keep on pumping them with all sorts of medication, which induces the inflammation, you know, and uh, causes cause severe persistent inflammation. Other causes, uh, autoimmune diseases. Okay, severe autoimmune diseases causing peri usually peripheral ulcer, rarely central ulcer, can cause, along with keratitis, severe uveitis, hypopian uveitis. Okay, these are the two major things. Well, I'm recently reading a, a case report about uh, um, keratitis with hypopion in a diabetic, uncontrolled diabetes, and they thought it was a sterile infiltrate when the diabetes is controlled, it healed. Has anyone seen such cases? Or? Not yet. No. The report came recently, I was reading. You can get this kind of scenario in a neurotrophic keratitis also. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The yeah. only thing that I want to use about the thing from that case is to be, sometimes we don't, we tend to ignore the diabetes or we don't check the diabetes. We just ask the patient if the diabetes is under control and they say yes. And uh, I think we should be more meticulous in checking the diabetes and make sure it's under control, especially in uh, diabetic corneal ulcers. But how many of us will really not give antibiotics in the presence of a hypopion? I mean, uh, what is your take-home message on that? Because the natural tendency is to, the moment you see a hypopion, I mean, you always think of an infection. And many in the periphery would definitely start presumptive antibiotics. And then only as a cornea specialist, you get to see these patients. So what is your uh, you know, message for, for that? It, it uh, depends upon the uh, you know, facility or the uh, facilities available around at least, sir. Okay, if in any way it is possible to do a microbiology, I'm, I'm talking very specific about the question which has been asked, central ulcer with hypopion. Okay, these cases need microbiological workup. That is absolute must. Okay, now if you have facility, please do the scraping. There is no, no second thoughts about that at all. But if it if you are in a setup or you know place, especially in the present situation where you know you can't send the patient out for a microbiology workup or the patient cannot go to a center where there is you know facilities are available, then the answer is to start a broad spectrum antibiotic. Okay, I would prefer uh, personally to start a combination medication, but uh, again that needs a reconstitution and all those stuff, uh, painful procedure. If it is not possible, uh, fluoroquinolones are the, is the answer. Frequent antibiotics. Uh, and then, yes, uh, 
probably you can wait for 24 hours or maximum of 48 hours. If there is no response, then there is no other excuse. We have to organize something somehow. Yeah, it would be better to err on the side of infection in such cases. Right? I think we'll go on to the next talk. Uh, yeah, can I share this the screen? Yeah, yeah, please, Sujit. Okay, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hope I'm audible and visible uh, in the screen. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, COC, for this opportunity. And uh, let me go to this case directly. I've been given a hypothetical case of a severe red eye with a discharge in a 10-year-old boy. Uh, Dr. Gobal didn't mention whether it's unilateral or bilateral. So uh, the question is whether it's unilateral or bilateral or is it an isolated episode or the first attack. So uh, for all practical purposes, uh, as a clinical diagnosis, it looks to me like a, a, a acute conjunctivitis. Uh, let me say that all the pictures which I'm showing here are representative. Uh, since this being a hypothetical case. So from the picture, what I'm, I understand or from the clinical scenario, what I understand, it's a case of acute conjunctivitis. Uh, that is a clinical diagnosis, but I don't know whether it's a bacterial allergic or viral. Being a uh, discharge being highlighted, I, I would give more importance to a bacterial conjunctivitis. And if at all the, in the list, it'll come, allergy will come as second and viral will come as the last because viral normally doesn't give a, a, a prominent discharge as a, uh, a characteristic symptom. So uh, the age group has been uh, shown as 10 year old boy, which shows that it's an active age group, school going age group, contact sports and trauma is a part of the life. So uh, this should also be kept in mind. So um, allergic conjunctivitis, again, all these uh, boys playing in the playground may be uh, allergic to many uh, dust or many other uh, pollen. So they may be having an allergic background, allergic conjunctivitis with a ropey discharge. Maybe they are on steroids and got a secondary infection uh, with bacteria. So these are the possibilities that came to my mind uh, with this question. So in the relevant uh, uh, history part, I may uh, ask them like um, uh, exposure to the co uh, contacts with similar uh, conjunctivitis at home or at school or exposure to any contaminated water and unused ponds of water from the well, any travel history, any use of contact lens uh, for cosmetic purpose or for uh, correcting the refractive error, uh, any associated upper respiratory infection, which may be seen in most cases, or in a urinary tract infection or a genital symptoms, if any. So uh, if I take it as a first and a single episode, uh, I, I may not go into a detailed uh, clinical examination with, uh, I mean, uh, for vision recording, uh, IOP and all those things. I'll just, main things I may look for uh, is a corneal staining, whether the cornea is involved. If there is an epithelial defect associated with that, um, uh, the uh, conjunctivitis, corneal epithelial defect associated with the conjunctivitis, is there any pre-auricular node? Because I cannot completely rule out the viral etiology. Maybe a secondary infection start, which started as a viral. The ethnic sum must be quickly looked into. Also, the nasolacrimal duct patency must be ensured if there is any regurgitation. And I must also, uh, I think, uh, rule out uh, the uh, bad red eyes, like the episcleritis, scleritis, uveitis. I may not be misguided by the discharge part and uh, miss something which is more serious than a conjunctivitis. Uh, if I uh, have a diagnosis of acute conjunctivitis and let me uh, come to the treatment, what I would say is like with a bacteria, within a working diagnosis of acute bacterial conjunctivitis, uh, there has been a, a few studies and a Cochrane uh, systemic review based on a lot of um, uh, RCTs that antibiotics versus placebo for acute bacterial conjunctivitis, which concluded that this meta-analysis concluded that actually there is it's only a value of pl a placebo. Topical antibiotics are of benefit in mildly improving the symptoms, likely the symptoms improve uh, two or three days earlier. But most of the cases are self-limiting, so actually doesn't need any antibiotics. And uh, uh, 
the preferred practice patterns of American Academy also shows that there is indiscriminate use of uh, the topical antibiotics and corticosteroid, which should be avoided. And they found that there is no evidence to show a superiority of any particular topical antibiotic agent. With this in background, when we start the treatment, in a way, it will look awkward when a patient comes like this and you don't give any um, antibiotics. So obviously, we'll start uh, our practice demands, our patients demand some sort of medication and we'll start an antibiotic. One thing which, uh, like what uh, Vinay told in con uh, corneal ulcers, what I would like to stress here is to avoid a uh, cocktail treatment. We have seen patient, uh, people starting two or three antibiotics, one uh, fluoroquinolone, one to uh, tobramycin, like that. There is no need for that. You can start with a topical single agent and stress more on the good ocular hygiene, washing, cleaning the uh, discharge and all the supportive measures. Maybe you can add some lubricant also. There is no actual uh, need for multiple agents. There is no need for systemic antibiotics in a simple case of uh, a presumed bacterial conjunctivitis. And uh, obviously, the uh, choice of treatment is empirical with broad spectrum antibiotics uh, with supportive therapy. And uh, probably in the second stage or something, which I will be discussing later, you can think of doing a culture sensitivity and go for a specific therapy. Which, as we already discussed, choice is empirical. The uh, available options with us are the various fluoroquinolones, dobramycin, and chloramphenicol, which may be easily available and affordable, uh, may be chosen. The next important question, whether it is unilateral. Uh, if unilateral, uh, the parents always ask whether we should put the drops in the other eye also. Personally, I would say no. Unless there are any symptoms, redness or any other symptoms, grittiness and any, any symptom is there, you may start. Otherwise, there is no role for any prophylactic antibiotics. So uh, the, uh, to, um, the summary of uh, using antibiotics is that it speeds the recovery by two or three days. It gives some sort of early uh, symptomatic relief and sort of psychological um, um, relief for the patient that uh, the treatment has been started. And probably it may help in joining your work back or the classes in this case uh, a little early than uh, uh, waiting for it to uh, uh, self-resolve. In this scenario, we should also keep in mind this particular cause of COVID-related conjunctivitis, which I am sure all of you know, but it's more uh, of a follicular conjunctivitis that has been reported in uh, COVID-related conjunctivitis. But you cannot, again, uh, deny a, being a secondary bacterial infection coming in such cases. That is more important uh, for us to uh, take our own precautions in such cases. But if it becomes chronic, if it becomes unilateral, if it is a recurrent, and if it is persistent and not responding to initial antibiotic therapy, then you have to look in detail for all these uh, like um, uh, various aspects why it is there. And with special mention to uh, urinary tract infection, upper respiratory tract infection, and arthritis. And some uh, some uh, quick things which we can rule out is, is a blepharitis, a mevomitis, a tarsal foreign body, a, a hidden NLD block, a nasal polyp which is causing that uh, block for one side, molluscum over the lids and the pubic lies over the lashes. So this may all be uh, causes that we may have to rule out. In these uh, recurrent cases or a chronic cases, it is definitely a mandatory to uh, do a conjunctival swab. It's always a good practice to take a swab in all cases. I actually do for academic interest. But in recurrent cases or uh, persistent cases, you have to do it and look for the sensitivity of the uh, medicine which you are using. There may be some cases of moxifloxacin or gatifloxacin um, resistance that uh, you may be um, uh, encountering like MRSA and gonococcal. Such uh, rare etiology should also be. It is not actually rare these days and uh, should also be kept in mind. And these are the, some rare cases like uh, chlamydia uh, and um, the gonococcal infections, the Reiter syndrome. When you uh, say so when this persistent, you have to check for the uh, genitourinal uh, tract infections, UTI. You have to keep, keep in mind the joint pains and ask for it. You may not ask all these things for a child who comes in with an acute conjunctivitis for the first time. But if it is persisting and if it is recurrent, then probably these are the things which you have to rule out. You have to always, if you think of uh, uh, severe conjunctivitis with uh, gonococcal, you have to think of child abuse. Uh, and all these conditions are the situations where you may need systemic treatment and not just topical treatment. Herpetic etiology is something we should not forget and it's very common uh, and it may cause secondary bacterial infections and recurrent infections. 
uh, you have to also look for the ominous signs when uh, it is persisting or getting chronic. It includes uh, associated visual loss, uh, severe purulent discharge, the corneal involvement, uh, the conjunctival scarring. And uh, you have to also look for whether the child is having any hidden uh, immunocompromised status. And as I already mentioned, a herpetic history of a herpetic eye disease. So the take-home messages, which I would like to stress is that infectious conjunctivitis are mostly self-limiting and we may take it lightly also. But the treatment, sometimes we may complicate it by doing unnecessary treatment and doing co cocktail treatments. So treat judiciously. There is no actual treatment role for any systemic medications. Avoid all treatment-induced complications as far as possible. Recurrent and refractory cases should be uh, seriously worked up systemically and microbiologically. And child abuse and COVID should be at the back of your mind in this present scenarios. So let me open the case for the panel to discuss whatever I have missed. Thank you. Thank you, Sujit. It was a very nice, very nice uh, preferred practice presentation. And I would like to uh, ask the other panelists also. Uh, nowadays, we are we seeing more of viral than bacterial conjunctivitis? And in that case. Depending upon the age, can you tell that uh, if a uh, uh, younger age, more pro younger and uh, towards the elderly side, they are more prone for uh, bacterial conjunctivitis, whereas in the young uh, adult or the adult age, more prone for viral conjunctivitis. Uh, I have read somewhere in a textbook, I think, uh, uh, according to your clinical experience, is it true? Uh, question is to me on yeah. whole panel. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. If I if I if I, uh, I take my personal experience, I think I am seeing more of viral conjunctivitis. Uh, very bad uh, conjunctivitis with discharge and bacterial is probably less. Um, I've not done any particular study or not kept any records for that to say the percentage wise. But I think uh, it will be more of a viral conjunctivitis uh, that is more seen in the OP. I'm not sure about uh, what was the second question, madam. Uh, the age. Is there any age-related, age-related, like uh, we can compartmentalize age-related. If a patient comes for, comes with a purulent conjunctivitis in the elderly type, is it a bacterial mainly? Uh, I think so. It, like in a in a like a, um, a, a elderly patient, diabetic patient with a purulent discharge, the bacteria and a herpetic. If they have got a herpetic previous history, these should uh, should be the uh, first and the uh, differentials actually. And similarly, the um, I must say the extremes of age. If you look at a very neonate or a young baby or a toddler coming with infection, it's more of a bacterial that we see rather than a viral actually. But the school-going age group uh, um, or uh, teenagers, I think uh, what we see most is uh, viral conjunctivitis. I think that's my observation. I... And any experience with fungal conjunctivitis or an HSV conjunctivitis? Con HSV, yes. HSV, few times I've uh, probably I have mistreated as bacterial conjunctivitis, not uh, looking into it in detail during the first visit, then not responding properly. Then if you look at it seriously, you can see the actually there may be a little bit of blepharitis and you can see that skin uh, excoriations in the margin, which can be a clue to that it has got an underlying herpetic. And when you add a little bit of uh, SEV ointment or something, it improves very well. I have had few uh, instances which uh, this viral etiology has been picked up similarly, but uh, fungal no. Can I just can add I one ask point? A question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, for sure. Yeah. Uh, what is the indication for a conjunctival swab? I'm not asking in specific for this case uh, and not definitely for a pre op, cataract pre op, but other than that, when someone comes to you with a conjunctivitis, non-resolving or you have given a course of treatment and it is not coming down I mean, what is the real indication for doing a conjunctival swab and how does it help in the management yes sir, that's exactly what i told in my presentation like uh, i personally do conjunctival swab in all sort of uh, all these types of cases with discharge but that is not the recommended you may not do conjunctival swab in all cases but chronic cases recurrent cases uh, recurrent unilateral cases and persistent refractory cases that you which you think is not responding to your initial empirical treatment you have to do a swab uh, either your treatment or the medic medicine which you use may be uh, resistant to that particular um, organism 
or it may be something in unusual which uh, it's not covered by the normal spectrum of uh, your antibiotics uh, um, which in the normally which you, we use like for example gonococcal or something which we have to add a systemic medication as well so uh, unless you get a microbiological proof of what you are uh, dealing with it is difficult and it is not ideally uh, justified to do uh, take i mean uh, the child for a systemic treatment with uh, cephalosporins or something like that and uh, especially when you uh, it's all comes under this four category chronic recurrent uh, recurrent unilateral and uh, mm -hmm. refractory like chlamydia is one another cause in cases uh, there's not much benefit of doing a connective sir because you might get the common cells and half epidermidis and all you might get even if yeah, yeah. in in common in yeah i agree i agree in uh, normal cases every cases that's why it's not recommended by this preferred practice patterns not to you may not do it uh, if you are doing it it's only for your academic interest and you just want to know what is actually there and um, for institutional practice and all for keeping it uh, for records and basically for academic purpose only if it is a first one time episode i totally agree yeah can i add can just I... one one point uh, in a case of a unilateral uh, purulent conjunctivitis in such a child one differential diagnosis we must always keep in mind is the nasolacrimal duct obstruction uh, we may not actually check the roplas and many times it may be the source of the discharge that that should be kept in mind is yes, definitely yeah yeah just uh, can i add a small point regarding uh, anita's uh, mention about the pediatric age group pediatric yes. age group definitely bacterial is more common that is what the literature says uh, and also what we clinically see is also i'm not very sure but i think probably we see more discharge but i think if you look at the literature again h influences seem to be much more in pediatric age group Uh, just like it causes uh, bronchitis and lung infections, it can cause uh, conjunctivitis also. So any associated upper respiratory symptoms also they might be having that also can give a clue. Clue regarding that. Yeah, and uh, I have one more point regarding the taking of the swab. Also, the method of taking of the swab is also important. I think you should take deep from the. Ponesis and uh, the provider patient will have some discomfort, but you should not uh, just uh, uh, scratch it from the surface deep from the phonix. And also in chlamydia, you can take it from the upper tassel. That uh, avert the elite and tassel conjunctiva should be scored nicely and take this well. For the chlamydia, you may actually require uh, you may require a little scraping. In fact, rather than a just a swab, cotton swab, uh, you may need actually a scraping and on the just like what you do on a, uh, a corneal ulcer. Yeah. I mean, it requires special media to culture. Normal media, if not, you need cell culture media. Also, need special staining technique. All this can be done. The media doesn't grow in smaller in regular blood agar. it's cell it only it's an intracellular organism yeah you're right abrishul uh, only thing is i think uh, this uh, gm cell stain would be very helpful if you are uh, really thinking of chlamydia you have to inform the lab uh, that you are actually looking for it otherwise they don't uh, look at these things uh, they will just report that normal way any role of steroids what are, when are you uh, dr freddy what is the role of steroids in a conjunctivitis when will you consider steroids in giving a conjunctivitis in a conjunctivitis patient not bacterial anyway in uh, viral only if i see a lot of membranes yes. uh, severe inflammation and um, spk involving the center center when we think is going to uh, threaten the vision so the cases again we use as far as possible only surface steroids low doses And uh, taper it over a period of time. Don't abruptly stop it. You must uh, explain to the patient, especially viral conjunctivitis. They tend to go from doctor to doctor, just because I think the first doctor should explain to the patient it's going to take time. It's not going to go in a day or two. And if you explain to the patient, I think most of them will understand. It's going to be a long process. Laila Madam has asked a question in the chat box whether anyone has encountered any COVID-related uh, conjunctivitis. <laughs> so far, maybe me, Madam, missed. <laughs> we cannot just ask them to do a COVID test. 
Uh, Every conjunctive is you can't ask them to do COVID yeah. test. <laughs> so unless and even if you do a test and found positive, you cannot relate whether this conjunctive is yeah. due to COVID or not. So you have to actually take your yeah, tears for PCR and all. Probably Dr. Anil can do it in Amrita once you have got <laughs> COVID cases there for academic reasons. <laughs> in a private practice, it's very difficult, I think. I think it is one person, no? People who present with conjunctivitis, it's less than one person. So they are actually not looking into it, sir. I think uh, none of the COVID patients they are afraid to first of all afraid to go <laughs> to the patient. <laughs> now they don't want to take the tears and uh, do all this experiment in this. I, I think if you really look at it, you may find out more cases actually. No, I think I just read two papers in initial uh, period, you know, in March April yeah. time. That yeah, one case is reported like day by day. It is reported like they have taken multiple uh, RT PCRs from the tiers and all. But they and say related. around 0.85% of something people yes. can present with conjunctivitis. Okay, shall we go on to the glaucoma session if the discussion in cornea is over? We didn't discuss the nice case. <laughs> oh, you didn't discuss his case. <laughs> is, is it uh, is there a time limit, sir? I mean, have I overshoot? Yeah. Uh, Vinay, are you keeping tab of time? Vinay's videos. Oh, yeah. Vinay, what uh, are we shooting time or uh, do we have time for a few questions or discussion on your case? A discussion, uh, discussion can we can have to any extent, but I'm not sure. Sure yeah, about the time. Uh, hmm. now, the major limitation what people have is regarding the microbiological support. Even though we know that it is best to do it, uh, I think uh, if you are in a, a eye hospital and you send it outside, the chance of you getting a positive result is very less. Uh, while working in Chaitanya for about seven years, that's what my experience is. About ten to fifteen percent is turning out positive, which tells you that you have to depend more on clinical. I think. But if you have got an ocular microbiologist or people with experience in ocular microbiology, you really can be uh, really it can be beneficial and deciding the treatment. That is true. No, you know, no second thoughts. Uh, are other thing that is like, uh, I think, uh, I think there is always a bias for the clinician, you know, you, as soon as you see a patient, you tend to label it as something which actually we should try to avoid. We should step back and see the other possibilities, dissect it, and then look at it. I think uh, that is some good way of, because I think as human beings, we have a lot of biases. First of all, the one most important things would be the confirmation bias, bias in which you basically, you look for positive signs and you, you, you look for anything which is favoring your diagnosis and uh, you label it as one particular fungal or bacteria. So you should always look back, look at the other option and then think of it. Because uh, nowadays, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, this, uh, I think it is basically for a convo confocal microscopy. In vivo confocal microscopy, they are looking with artificial intelligence and they are finding that the, uh, the chances of uh, getting a good result is close to 95%, which is excellent. For a clinician, it is close to around uh, 65 to 70%. I think what Sir said is a very important point, the confirmation bias thing. Uh, if you read through Kragmer, actually, after listing all the signs of bacterial and fungal ulcers, and I think the last sentence is, uh, do not, I mean, it, it, microbiology is the last word. That, that is what it, it says. Uh, that uh, The studies have shown that your uh, clinical correlation may not be superior to a properly done, properly done, that, that is very important, properly done microbiology. It, it's like you're depending uh, on the uh, depending upon the experience of the microbiologist as well. Yeah, now I'm cool. into a small practice, but institutional practice and a small practice differences I already know because it depends. When I, whenever an, uh, a new microbiologist come, they'll always tell KOH all the uh, artifacts, everything they will relate to the fungal filaments. Right? Uh, so microbiology even if you uh, scrape and give a good specimen there there won't be enough uh, experienced micro ocular microbiologists in our sector it's like an oncologist depends on a biopsy report with uh, from a pathologist like 
his whole treatment depends on the biopsy report yeah that is true <laughs> yeah. and uh, to what uh, sizer asked to vinay i think sir uh, in a sterile ulcer with um, hyperpion it's not about uh, whether you will dare to start or continue the antibiotics probably you have to keep an antibiotic coverage anyway it's about daring to start a steroid in that cases because most of us may not be uh, especially people sitting in uh, periphery single practicing uh, one man practice they may not be able to uh, decide whether it's just an infective or inflammatory even if it is an inflammatory we'll give a antibiotic coverage and start uh, once you have uh, made your mind that it is more of an inflammatory cause that is causing the hyperpion then you may uh, start steroids surface steroids soft yeah. steroids like that under antibiotic coverage actually okay then uh, thank you so much i think we'll move on to the glaucoma team uh, thomas arun yeah. girija manoj bindu ajit can you please take over thomas yes thank you thank you everyone can you all hear me now yes sorry, yes very problem. good yeah yeah sorry i had some problem earlier so we got uh, uh, two uh, dr dr girija from uh, the lf angamari and dr bindu from comtrust dr george putran unfortunately due to some personal reasons is unable to uh, be with us today so dr girija will start with the first case presentation over to dr girija and we also have dr manoj who is and myself we are in the panel <coughs> Over to Dr. Girija. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gopal and the COG for giving me this opportunity. Actually, I'm a last-minute substitute for Dr. George, and they couldn't uh, present the case due to some personal problems. So I got it's actually a very uh, short notice presentation. So please bear with me for the shortcomings. So the case scenario that is given to me is a 60-year-old man who is presenting with defective vision. severe pain in the eye and on examination there is shallow ac and an intraocular pressure of 55 mm so an old person who is coming to you dr arun what are the possibilities that will come to your mind first okay apun i assume this is uh, unilateral i mean unilateral with this age group uh, with a high iop the also the very symptomatic patient uh, we are thinking of uh, possible uh, angle pressure uh, glaucoma of, of course we need to do uh, i check uh, check the gonioscopy and uh, also look at the anterior chamber whether it's a uniformly anterior chamber or just they are deep uh, shallow in the middle deep in the periphery so dr girija you can probably give us some more information or the type of patient that you have seen so this patient the you have to take when a patient comes to you like this first you take a detailed history You, did, you ask for any similar complaints in the past, so uh, we are all we are all sure that it's an angle closure glaucoma. So first thing you have to make sure is whether it's a primary angle closure or is it a secondary angle closure. So history taking is very important in this aspect. You have to ask for similar complaints in the past. That is any history of pain, headache, etc. Which was if the patient gets a positive history of getting relieved by speak sleeping or by going into bright light situations, then that clinches the diagnosis of an angle closure glaucoma so with from the history which can be confirmed with later with clinical examination so in an acute angle closure disease girija madam you can make it full screen slide show slide show you can put slide show yeah very good yeah uh, so in case of uh, and uh, so when you are suspecting an angle closure disease you have to in all cases you have to do a thorough slit lamp examination so the if the ac is shallow you have to do a gonio and the gonioscopy has to be done in both the eyes not in the affected eye alone but the other eye also has to be examined and try to do a indentation gonioscopy with the four mirror lens so you can differentiate between a positional and a synechial closure so in this case if the angle is ac is shallow and the angle is closed in the affected eye and if the fellow eye also shows a shallow anterior chamber an occludable angle then most probably it's a primary angle closure glaucoma so it's an acute angle closure crisis which has led to this uh, painful defective vision and all these symptoms and in such cases the gonio will show you a closed angle in the affected eye and 
the cello eye showing an occludable angle. The other diagnosis that should come to your mind in this situation is uh, phacomorphic glaucoma because that age group is that of a cataract uh, age group. So <coughs> look at the lens, see whether there is an intumescent cataract which can produce a shallow AC and a narrow angle and an ankle closure uh, glaucoma, secondary angle closure glaucoma. So, but in this case, always, that is why I said, gonio has to be done in the other eye also. So look at the other eye. If the other eye is normal, then most probably with a mature intumescent cataract in the affected eye, it is a phacomorphic glaucoma. And there will be a history of pre-existing defective vision also in case of a cataract. So these two are the important two differential diagnosis in this clinical scenario. But I'll just look at the other possibilities also. Uh, that is, uh, it can be an inflammatory glaucoma. It can be due to a subluxation. That is also, these are all causes of secondary angle closure. Uh, and uh, then it can be some other condition which is, which is causing retinal diseases, which can cause a uveal effusion. Like, uh, and also, if it is a post-operative patient, you have to think about malignant glaucoma. And also, uh, in a post-VR surgery, you have to think about uh, uh, expansion of the uh, intraocular gas or silicon oil, which is causing a uh, forward displacement of the lens iris diaphragm and causing a secondary angle closure. And if these are all assuming that this is bi unilateral, suppose it's a bilateral angle closure presentation, then you have to think of drug-induced angle closure glaucoma. So that is why I said a proper history taking is very important. You have to um, ask about any history of medications which the patient might have been taking for some other disease. So these medications, mainly the uh, sulfonamides, even the acetazolamide that we give for ankle closure disease can cause uh, uh, ankle closure glaucoma, secondary ankle closure. And uh, all these drugs, that is topiramate is the main ingredient that we, that we all of us have seen commonly in this case, uh, it's causing a bilateral ankle closure glaucoma but other drugs also can result in angle closure glaucoma. And also ask for any history of trauma, which can lead to a subluxation and present in a similar manner. And family history of angle closure disease also, maybe you might sometimes get that parents have undergone laser iridotomy and all that patients can tell you. So uh, the family history is also important. So a thorough evaluation has to be done under the slit lamp and look for all the signs which can lead you to the diagnosis. So always do a careful examination of the cornea and look for any, um, any keratic precipitates which can point you towards an inflammatory glaucoma. And gonioscopy always has to be indentation gonioscopy with a formula and look for signs in the iris like patches of iris atrophy. Sometimes you can see a spiraling and alteration in the pattern leading to a spiraling which again points to a previous uh, sub subacute attack or a post congestive glaucoma, then you have to look for new, new vessels in the iris. Then, iris bombay is another thing that you will get in secondary angle closure, or in, uh, that also uh, points to the diagnosis. Then, look for sphincter tears in the pupil, which can uh, suggest a trauma, previous trauma. Fundus examination, usually in such situations, because of the edematous cornea, will be typically difficult. Uh, and pachymetry also can differ. Anterior segment imaging modalities like ASOCT, UVM, etc., sometimes help you to find out the causative factor in secondary angle closure glaucoma. So I'll just go through the uh, briefly through the clinical features of the main uh, DD. So in angle closure glaucoma, all of you are familiar with how the patient presents. Uh, usually, it is a sudden, uh, painful, defective vision, and the patient will be uh, presenting to you with. Uh, sometimes with nausea, vomiting, sometimes may be referred from other specialty. So uh, eyes will be congested, there will be corneal edema, um, shallow anterior chamber, and pupil will be vertically oval, sluggish or non-reacting. With iris showing patches of atrophy, iris edema, there will be a loss of iris pattern. Lens can be clear or it can show uh, glaucom flecken. And uh, IUP is definitely very much ele elevated. So what to, how will you proceed, uh, Dr. Arun? How will you proceed in such a case? Okay. I mean, uh, in, in the, the high IOP like this, uh, we, have to we have to give a systemic treatment. So we can either give an IV mannitol 
in the hospital setting or you can give uh, oral diamox and then uh, aim is to get the pressure down and also then you have to get the pupil constricted uh, with the pilocarpine and you can also use the beta blockers and you get uh, maybe a combination of brimonidine as well. Uh, preferably mm -hmm. prostaglandins are avoided uh, because it is eye is already inflamed. So with the systemic and topical treatment is to get the pressure down, pupil constricted. Obviously, you have to treat the other eye also. If it's a primary angle closure, important thing is to use pilocarpine in the other eye uh, and get the pupil down. And once the uh, IOP has come down, the cornea has cleared a little bit, obviously to do a, a gonioscopy and then uh, do a peripheral iridotomy as soon as possible. Obviously, do the other eye first. Uh, even while we are waiting uh, for the uh, acute uh, eye with the acute attack and uh, do the other eye. And as the inflammation has come down, in the eye with the acute attack is to do the uh, PI. You can use, also use hyper, uh, agents like a uh, hypertonic 5% uh, saline to clear the corneal edema. And uh, obviously, uh, re-evaluate re the patient as you're going along on, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Dr. Uh, Manoj? Yes, sir. Uh... Like Acute angle closure, if they're present early, it is yes. very much better to easier to manage than when they're present later. Sometimes they will keep the pain, they will think it's something else, maybe it's migraine, and they will present yes. to us 24 hours later. By that time, yes. uh, most of the damage is done, and then it is very resistive to treatment. So, yes. uh, if you ask me about an acute IOP control, I would also add uh, analgesics to the patient. The apprehension of the patient. She needs to be addressed. They may not, may, may be dehydrated. They may be hypoglycemic. They may take that uh, anti glaucom anti uh, diabetic medicines, but they might not be able to eat or they may be vomiting all the time. So these needs to also be uh, addressed. But I agree with you, sir. The first thing to do is to have the acute IOP as uh, controlled earlier as possible. Give IV mannitol and diamox with topical uh, uh, anti glaucom medications, uh, aqueous suppressants typically. And then once the pressure comes down, give pilocarpine to. Uh, pull the iris away from the uh, peripheral angle and then abort yes. the attack. And along with that, give steroids to control the inflammation. And uh, we can do a uh, laser peripheral aerodotomy uh, maybe a couple of days later so that it is easier to do. So once that uh, yeah. attack is aborted, they are safe for a couple of, I mean, uh, further, further up episode because we'll be keeping them on pilocarpin. And then we can yes. follow them up over two days once the inflammation iris the volume has come down, it is easier to do the laser peripheral aerodotomy. There is no harm in doing the laser peripheral aerodotomy in the other eye on the same day. Uh, okay. But on the, on the eye that is affected, I would uh, differ for two days. Yes. Uh, so what do you think about the role of uh, systemic steroids in uh, controlling the iris edema? Because sometimes we find that iris is so edematous, doing a PI even after one week becomes very difficult. I have not yet uh, given systemic steroids for that matter. Uh, if it is helpful, and what do you think? No, sometimes I had to give I had to give uh, systemic steroids because of this uh, severe edema in the iris and the IOP not getting controlled. Sometimes what I, uh, I have the problem that I have faced, madam, is uh, the pupils will not come down. Uh, even once you reduce the pressure, because the sphincters have damaged, they are fixed and dilated, and those iris are much more thicker. And how much ever we give, we are just in, inducing more inflammation. We are not able to make an opening, and then pass develops and the pressure rise is uh, kind of constant. And then we have to consider doing a trabeclectomy early in those patients because these yes. high pressures can immediately damage the optic nerve head over the next uh, few weeks or a month. So we need to intervene early. So timely treatment is very important because the development of PAS has to be prevented. Otherwise, this medical treatment will not be effective. So uh, Dr. Arun and uh, Dr. Manoj has uh, uh, somewhat enumerated the, man uh, the management. So um, I have one, uh, one, one thing to add, one thing to ask actually. Sometimes the patients have a renal disease and we cannot give a mannitol, we cannot give diamox. So how will we manage an acute IOP in those cases? It's very difficult Let because if the patient is on uh, dialysis, usually we ask the nephrologist and uh, we start them on astrocylamide with careful monitoring of the electrolytes and everything. Uh, if they are on dialysis, it's easier actually because they are doing uh, twice a week dialysis and we can give drugs. But in other cases, it is very difficult because mannitol, uh, the glycerin, diabetic means you can't give glycerin. Uh, and uh, isosorbide, I think, is not available in our case. And uh, mannitol, some cases, if mannitol is also contraindicated, then we are in a... Especially congestive cardiac failure, kidney disease, mannitol mm -hmm. cannot be given. 
Yes. Manoj, can I... What is the role for parasynthesis in such cases? Manoj, can I just... Yes, sir. Say something, Thomas? Yes. Yes, Dr. Sai. No, first thing is, I've tried actually two, three, in two, three cases. One is, you know, just pressing the center of the cornea with a bud for some time. It is mentioned in books also. One or two cases I have, I found that it was effective. Not in every case, but in one or two cases. I tried peripheral iridoplasty in a few cases where you know, I put some burns in the periphery. It worked in one case, but the inflammation was very severe. The, already the eye is an inflamed eye, and you know, I had very, very, very severe inflammation. And third, like, uh, like you mentioned, is the role for parasynthesis. So, uh, and I personally, I have not done so far, but in case you are going in for a parasynthesis, probably you can also do a surgical PI along with that. I'm not very uh, sure whether you can do a... Technically, you can do it in your outpatient department. But in case you're doing a proper parasynthesis inside the OT, you can, uh, you know, just go in and uh, do a surgical iridotomy also along with that. And that might uh, create a lot of difference. Because doing a YAG PI in, in these cases is sometimes extremely difficult. You have a very thick, boggy, edematous iris. Cornea is not very clear. So you you have real problems. Bindu, any comments one. from you? Actually, we find to see more of um, angle closure patient. I usually do a B scan before doing a procedure because a lot of cases we do have this RCS thickening with uh, VKH presenting, posterior scleritis presenting. You have in mind that it is angle closure, but it turns out to be something different. It's not very uncommon. So I prefer doing a B scan also. You see if there is, because you can't dilate and see, you see if there is an edema, see if there is an RCS thickening. Even if it is nanophthalmos, you take a little more care if you're planning surgery. So all this can be made out with the use of B-scan. That's what the point of... I have had one patient who had uh, used a dilating probe uh, and developed an uh, acute attack. And that pupil was not constricting. So because the pupil was not constricting, the IOP was not coming down. We are not able to break that cycle. So that patient, I did a, a parasynthesis. The only thing that we have to take care is not to injure the iris because the peripheral iris, cornea and the iris are touching. We need to go slightly longer track to enter the entry chamber. And immediately, once that uh, chamber was entered, the pressure came down. Patient was immediately asymptomatic. Then on the on the table, and then we used pilocarpine and the pupils came down. And that patient again, the conventionally what what we do gave steroids and then did the PA after two days. Theoretically, chance of expulsive is more when you. Uh, because this is in a closed chamber, madam. Once the PA uh, needle is entered and we are taking it out, it again becomes a closed chamber. So you do it in the closure. Uh, even a small gap is enough. I'm Especially not saying, saying that we should do this as a routine, but only in cases where we cannot break the acute IOP medically. I'm, I'm sure in difficult situation, we have to take the chance. Okay. And uh, differentiate, madam, but differentiate between this uh, uh, pupe. So, sorry. You also see the lens thickness. Because in so many studies show that lens, if it is too thick, you can go for lens extraction. There are so many people who practice this even in angle closure. So I'm not. Yeah, there are some who actually do with the, after uh, doing a vitrectomy, uh, slightly decompress the, the eye and then do a thick emulsification. Uh, yeah. In the NAS OCT, you can see the lens thickness. If it's very thick and the lens is causing this much of problem, you can always do a cataract extraction also. There are people who are doing it for this. But uh, you have to bring down the IOP initially. And uh, I think in all uh, ankle closure cases, you have to consider an early cataract extraction. You cannot wait like in other cases because as the lens size increases, again, there is more chance of patient getting a PAS and all that. So a careful follow-up is very much required in all cases of angle closure. Even after you have done a PI and if the IOP is controlled after that, a follow-up is very much essential to assess the uh, status of the optic disc and visual fields and also the development of the PA. So gonia has to be repeated even in presence of a patent PI. So I usually ask the patients to come at least every six months for a repeat PI, IOP, uh, repeat uh, gonio IOP evaluation and optic disc evaluation. So I think that has to be done because it is not a disease that is cured, but a uh, patient is always in uh, risk for developing a uh, 
chronic glaucoma just to add to what uh, uh, thomas sir uh, uh, sir has told before uh, when the patient comes to with us with us with an acute iop and a and a shallow or an angle closure glaucoma there are two mechanisms especially like what uh, girija madam said it could be a pupillary block mechanism or a without pupillary block mechanism so the key or the easy technique clinically to identify it is look at the shape of the anterior chamber and the shape of the iris uh, in pupillary block we typically have a convex iris shape uh, because the posterior chamber pressure is more than the anterior chamber and the iris balloons up into a convexity whereas in this uh, pull mechanism or a push mechanism the shape is different especially in the pull mechanism it is a uniformly uh, ch shallow chamber the periphery and the central is uniformly shallow in the pull mechanism like in uh, nvg closed chamber uh, closed angle the peripheral ac you will have a, a shallowing whereas the central ac is essentially deep or normal normal depth and always we have to do investigate also we can do a b scan is very good and uh, ubm is also very helpful in this situation and uh, asoct can be done it is not i i prefer a ubm over asoct because we can see the ciliary body area as well Uh, yes, it is very good because it's non-contact. We can take the measurements and keep and uh, see for uh, see the follow-up, especially in top or mid, and all how the patient is doing. We can follow up with the ASO CT. Yes, UBM is very effective in uh, finding out the cause. And you are suspecting a UV effusion, all that you can find. ASO CT actually gives only that up to the iris. So only the anterior segment findings are given in ASO CT. So, so uh, um, the how do you find? Uh, other, I mean, cases where you suspect uh, primary angle closure. Have, how often do you come across other uh, from your based on your UVM uh, other causes? Yes, just uh, just out of interest. Drug drug induced angle closure. We have seen a uh, quite a lot of cases. We are seeing now because of the increased incidence and uh, the all the drugs. Uh, when you look at the list, anything can cause an angle closure glaucoma, and you all. we also tend to get scared because the usual drugs that we take even those uh, drugs can cause mafenambic acid is something that an analysis that i usually take for uh, my migraine but uh, actually that is also there in the list so all these yes. drugs can cause a defective vision and a sudden angle closure so drug induced is um, a one such condition that we see commonly then uh, this uh, because of this increased uh, retinal surgeries in our hospital we are seeing all these complications of retinal uh, post uh, secondary glaucoma following retinal surgeries are seen more frequently in our, uh, that also we are seeing frequently and uh, this uh, silicon oil actually uh, that is another interesting thing that i have noticed silicon oil actually we are removing uh, so that we are removing the emulsified silicon oil but till then the patient may not be having any increased iop but after the silicon oil is removed after one or two months the patient starts developing glaucoma which is very much intractable and very difficult to control and uh, it takes around 6 to 8 months for the patient uh, the iop to come down but i don't know the reason for that uh, we don't see any emulsified uh, it has been removed but there may be particles of the oil still remaining in this thing but why the patient was not having glaucoma before that and developing months later is uh, something that uh, puzzles me This is inflammatory PAS, uh, Girija. Pardon? Because we, are, I think it's inflammatory PAS. No, PAS Because is we, not there. Actually, we also with... have patients like this after oil removal. It's by it has to be inflammatory. Because, yeah, it's inflammatory uh, only. But why yeah. is it coming months later? Uh, uh, you get like... intractable glaucoma following uh, retinal yes. surgeries. No, after silicon oil intense, removal, yeah, 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 intense steroid uh, is to remove the silicon oil completely. <laughs> it's not possible, but mm. till then the with the silicon oil patient was not having glaucoma. But after the uh, partly at least removing it, patient is getting glaucoma. That's all. The more and the number of procedures that we do in that, the chance of getting glaucoma is also high. Yes, uh, as I have said, uh, this uh, inflammatory glaucoma causing a uh, PAS and Iris Bombay. That uh, a few cases I have seen. That's also very, very common following retinal surgery. Yes, Iris Bombay yeah. patient why, comes with severe pain. I think Doctor Manoj has presented a similar case. Uh, uh, yes, last time. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I remember. We do that. PA it again blocks. PA again yeah, blocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, because I was also having a similar case. And I did a sinusoidal exercise. I did one. Yeah, I did a sinusoidal exercise. Then again, it blocked. <laughs> I think we should move on What? to the yeah yeah uh, yeah. Next, Can we uh, move on yeah. to Doctor Bindu's case? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Bindu. Yes. 
So thank you, COC, for including me in this. So the scenario given is a 45-year-old person with an intraocular pressure of 30, no symptoms, and gonio open. So what to do next? Or what are the possibilities we can think of? The first thing itself, the intraocular pressure 30 could have been an error. A single reading we should not rely upon. The source of error can be like, you are putting a lot of pressure or the stain is too much. All this has, even though trivial, has to be taken care of when you're taking a reading of intraocular pressure. Now, when we move on to the scenarios, it could be a pressure high with a disc and field change, which we come to a diagnosis of primary open angle glaucoma. Or it could be a scenario where the disc has changes, but the fields are normal. It could be a preperimetric glaucoma or a scene where there is a normal disc and normal field <clears throat> and you come to a diagnosis of ocular hypertension. I'll just go into details of the few cases. So in this case, what is different is the intraocular pressure 30 was not a single reading, but during the process of facing or during the process of diurnal, you picked up a reading of 30. And this is a case where there's a mild glaucomatous changes. And the other scenario is, a 47 year myopic patient and you see the field effect is close to fixation and here again if the pressure is 30 the way you manage these two patients does not depend only on that 30 but on many other factor so that is what we are going to look into now so what is target pressure so the target pressure what is in our mind is a pressure which decreases the progression but we don't think of the factor that and how much it affects the patient's quality of life. So what the definition is, it is the estimated rate of progression that is likely to affect the patient's quality of life. So there are a lot many things which we have to consider before setting our target intraocular pressure. We have to see the, what the initial IOP was, what the life expectancy is the patient, uh, the patient has, the risk factors, and so many other things before we set into the target pressure. So it is main thing is we have to maintain the quality of life of the patient rather than bringing the pressure down, down, down. And it is not same for all the patient. And for the same patient itself, it does not remain a single number. You have to keep on changing it according to the response the patient shows. So now when we set the target pressure, the next, our job is to start treatment. How do we start treatment? Usually the algorithm is you start with a single drug though we sometimes we don't do it, but we have to stick to it because we have a tendency like the previous corneal speakers are telling a cocktail of medicine. Everyone has a tendency of starting many medicines together and we don't know which drug is acting, which drug is not acting. So it's better to start with one single therapy and see if the patient is tolerating it well and what is its effect on intraocular pressure. It can be you have reached the target intraocular pressure and then you can start periodically verifying the patient with a visual field, optic disc, and definitely the quality of life of the patient. The next option possibility is your target pressure is not reached, but it has brought down your pressure to some extent. So that is a time when you want to add another drug. You add another drug and see if your pressures are reached. Again, if it is not reached, again, you can consider other options of surgeries or laser. Now you might see so have a scenario where the patient does not tolerate that single drug which you have started or does not produce any effect on that intraocular pressure. This is the moment when you don't start on adding the drug, but you switch from that drug to a different drug. 
and then if that also doesn't work you can consider possibility of surgery and laser so our aim is not to bring the pressures down like previously i told in advance our aim is to bring to the lower teens in a moderate stage you bring it below 18 and in the early stage it's you keep it around 20 21 but you have to consider the level of comfort that patient has when he is using multiple drops so use always one drug at a time see the effect of the other drug and yes definitely fix a drug combination help us to improve the adherence of the treatment so you can move to it once you know which drug is acting or if that drug is acting in that patient or not so when now when we started treatment you want to know how frequently you want to follow up the patient what is the protocol so when your target iop is reached and there is no progression you can follow them up at the range of 6 to 12 months but if your target iop has reached and still there is progression you have to follow up the case little more earlier about 1 to 2 months interval you have to follow it up and if your target pressure is not reached and your progression is still continuing again you have to have a frequent review but once you don't have a target you have not reached the target pressure but there is no progression also you need to keep on adding drugs you can follow it up at a 3 to 6 intervals 3 to 6 months interval time so that is number c number 1 the second scene is a scenario where you have a fund is normal with an intraocular pressure of 30 or you do an automated standard automated perimetry and it turns out to be normal so what next you want to know whether this patient is having a risk of progression to glaucoma so what do you do usually we have to take a optic disc photography this reveals so many of the details which we would have missed by just examining it with a 90d so you always follow the rule of 5 give importance to subtle ch changes in the disc especially so in a small disc where you tend to miss so many of the findings so this disc when you just look at the disc area you don't see the subtle rnfl change which could have been easily missed similarly in a small disc you get to have a nerve fiber layer defect which you can trace it to the notch or here there is a subtle change of hemorrhage and then there is a notch which could be easily missed unless you take a photograph and see it redo we see it that is what is so again the other thing which we usually do is pallor cup discrepancy you go by the color of the cup but what you should be doing is a go by the bending of the vessel and identify the cup which would have been much larger so your normal fundus would change to a glaucomatous fundus so that is regarding the fundus now the other factor which give we give more importance is the cct or the central corneal thickness the oht study has shown that that is a most potent predictor for it is not just to convert your pressures to minus 1 minus 3 plus 1 and all it gives you an idea how much risk that patient has to convert to an open angle glaucoma so if the ct is thinner than 555 the risk is higher if it is more than 558 the risk is lesser so that is what the study shows this is just to show you a case where we did a field and the field did not uh, hfa did not pick up but the oct has picked up a superior nerve fiber loss and we did a swap of the blue on yellow perimetry and you find a field defect so this is the pre perimetric glaucoma so functional testing if the disc is normal field is normal you feel you do a functional testing you can do a swab but that is not actually tolerated well with the patient especially so when he has a cataract so with the advent of oct we started picking up more of pre perimetric changes so it is easier with oct the both the rnfl and now with the new oct you have the macula ganglia cell complex which helps you to detect glaucoma at an earlier stage so the the famous continuum here we were picking it up this stage now we started picking it up the undetectable stage with the ganglion cell loss you detect start detecting that also so this is the, with the help of the newer octs so now we have covered the pre perimetric then you will have a scenario where the funds field is normal whatever oct everything is normal and then you come to a diagnosis of an ocular hypertension now the question is do we need to treat all patients with just an intraocular pressure of 30 with no other findings so the study tells you that you need to treat patients only who have the risk factors with them 
So what are the risk factors you have to look into? The older the age, the risk increases. The thinner the cornea, the risk increases. The greater the IOP, the risk increases. So if there are associated other risk factors also which we have put up on. So if a patient presents with a vascular occlusion, yes, you definitely have to treat the pressure. So there is a um, helping you to uh, decide whether you have to treat or not treat. There are so many calculators available, but then this is just, uh, they are given some points to the factors of the, what the intraocular pressure, if it ranges from 22 to 28, the CCT values carry some points, the mean vertical distance, the mean PSD, and the sum of, and then you total all the sum. If you get a point score of say zero to six, it is estimated raised of the risk of that patient developing into an open angle glaucoma is just less than 4%. If it is coming to a 7 to 8, it comes to 10%. And the, if it increases, the score increases to 11 to 20, it comes to 20%. So now what to do when you have the score? Do you treat all patients? If the score is less than 50, uh, more than 15, you have to treat the patient. If it is less than 5, you only follow up the patient. And around 5 to 15, it is an individualized care. You see other risk factors, what the patient wants. If he wants it to be treated, then you have to treat. If he is available for follow-up, all this factor comes and it becomes a customized treatment. Now, how do you follow up the patient with an ocular hypertension? If the patient has very few risk factors and there is no progression, a yearly visit will be enough. But if you think the patient has multiple risk factors, a more frequent follow-up of four to six months is, in, is needed in the first few years. And now the next category of patient who can present with a high intraocular pressure is a steroid-induced glaucoma. At this age, might not be the patient who's on allergic conjunctivitis, might be that you get it in a much younger age. But the people who are steroid responders, even a short duration of steroid can cause an increase in intraocular pressure. And then with the advent of intravitreal steroids, again, you have more of steroid-induced um, glaucoma. And now we have more patients with renal disease and transplant patients who are both on systemic steroids. And you hear you get an associate cataract also, and that's not possible to stop the steroids in them many of the time. So that is when you end up treating them surgically, both the glaucoma and the cataract together. Now, the next scene is... When you open, you shouldn't stop it there. You get to see more things when you see more detail into the glaucoma, gonioscopy. So there are a lot of plethora of cases which we could detect by just the gonioscopy. So for want of time, I might just skip some slides. Like uh, Girija told, it can present the angle, um, angle closure, but you can also uh, see traumatic glaucoma with an angle recession, which you just pick by doing a gonioscopy. And then there is the pigmentary glaucoma. And then you have a pseudo-exfoliation glaucoma, which also can present. Then subtle changes like Cox screw vessel, it might not present to you as a florid chemosis, florid cases, mild CCF and thyroid disease also can present to you with just intra increased intraocular pressure. And we also had a case of Sturge Weber by Klippel-Knoy, where it was a slow progressive glaucomatous optic atrophy in that time. And the patient didn't have any symptom. And this was an interesting patient who just presented has occasional blurring of vision. And then when we see it during that time, his pressures are high. We had a diagnosis of postular Strassmann for refuse. I even did an uh, AC tap, but we couldn't come to a diagnosis for this patient. Another thing which I got is a microspherophic patient, IOP is 32, myopic patient just dilated, got a microspherophakia. So this is a patient who presented with profuse pigmentation in the anterior chamber and the gonioscopy, and gonioscopy was open. Gonio was open. Then we went in search of literature and find the... Uh, actually, I heard a um, talk by Dr. Neetu from Arvin, and then I went and searched again. It is uh, Bates syndrome and Bardi syndrome, where it presents with profuse pigmentation and involvement of the pupil. So how do you differentiate from pigmentary glaucoma? It's more stormy and pigment in uh, pupillary involvement. So this is another patient where you uh, where got a uh, post viral with a lot of KPs presenting as intra high intraocular pressure. So these are some of the plethora of cases. I think I'm not overshooting your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bindu. That's an excellent talk. Uh, covering a wide variety of cases. 
uh, I think we also should keep in mind that uh, obviously we're making the diagnosis of open angle uh, based on gonioscopy. In some some cases, you can have a combination. For example, pseudoexfoliation. That is the open angle component plus the zonal weakness can cause some uh, an element of angle closure as well. It can be intermittent. So these are some uh, cases where you have a combination of uh, mechanisms which can cause the uh, uh, glaucoma. Manoj, I'd like to add. You can stop sharing the screen. And we'll have two quick comments before we move on to the next uh, topic because we are almost running very close. Manoj, would like to add something? Sir, uh, in a situation like this, our patient is asymptomatic and uh, high pressure. Uh, the possibility is one is ocular hypertension, it can be primary or secondary, or a glaucoma, uh, asymptomatic stage, again, primary or secondary. Um, so, if the patient has normal disc and high pressure 30, uh, what would be the ideal drug to start and what is the target pressure in such a situation? See, we all know uh, mid-teens, uh, high-teens, uh, low-teens for mild, moderate, severe glaucoma. But in ocular hypertension, what would be the target pressure and what would be the ideal drug to start? Would you like to answer that? Dr. Bindu? Yeah. Like we don't go very aggressive uh, to low teens in ocular hypertension, but we want to follow up the patient and see if he's developing the signs of open angle glaucoma. So my initial choice is usually prostaglandin analog. Because what would be a comfortable pressure, madam? 24, 23? No, we start when the pressures are about 30. 30, yes. This yeah. patient has 30. So now what would be your comfortable pressure? With prostaglandin, it usually comes to 20 or below also. Yeah, I think we have had a very good discussion. I just like to give a very summarize a few important points. Dr. Hilja especially said about history. So history can tell you a lot, especially history of prodromal symptoms, also history of any retinal surgery. All this is very important. And sometimes if people just start jumping into examination, history can give us important clues. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Bindu especially said the uh, importance of this photo. I think that is extremely important point, this photos, because uh, some things which we miss in, in the indirect uh, 90-day examination, sometimes we pick up in uh, when we the this photo. Because at this photo, we can take our time and look at it. Uh, Dr. Manoj also said the important, in some cases, difficult cases, we have to go for procedures like paracentesis, and sometimes we have to think of a surgical PI or, uh, or, or uh, a trabeculectomy in cases where there's an angle closure which we cannot be uh, treated medically and with, uh, and not responding to and not unable to do an iridotomy and things like that. Anything you'd like to add, uh, Dr. Girija? So you have quite uh, you have summed up the whole thing, I think. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank yeah, you, all yeah. the panel. And Manoj, Bindu, Girija. Thank you. Girija, thank you for last minute replacement for Dr. George. Yes. Thank, thank you. you so much. Can we go on to the next session? Yeah. Patmaja, madam, uh, can start sharing the screen. We have Patmaja, madam, and uh, Dr. Lethika talking to us on uh, common situations. Like Patmaja, madam, is speaking to us on um, uh, eye strain in an 18 year old who is studying for exam. Now it is very important because most of them are online all the time and uh, online studies are replaced face to face uh, teaching. So Patmaja Madam will speak to us on that and Lithika will talk to us when a seemingly normal looking eye with a decrease of vision, what all should we keep in mind? Uh, good morning, sir, Good afternoon. The panelists uh, but my madam, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Shashi, sir, uh, Sudha, madam, and sir, Sunam, sir. Gopal, would you like me to wait or can I start? No, no you can start, ma'am. You can share, start sharing your screen and uh, start. I have no screen to share at the moment okay. other That's than fine. my face. Would it be okay if I switched off my video and spoke? No. Or would you prefer that the video was on? It's only my face that I have to show. Okay, anyway, uh, without wasting much time, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Gopal and Team August of Thalmika for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, my, what I have to discuss is how do we manage eye strain 
in an 18 year old not mentioned whether it's a man or a woman or a, a male or female but preparing for an exam and i think most 18 year olds will be preparing either for their first year professional exams or they will be preparing to retake the entrance exam so usually at that stage the final exams will induce in themselves a lot of stress and the first thing that i would like to know if i was treating such a patient is what is eye strain to me eye strain is any symptom related to the eye brought about by the use of the eyes whereas to my patient eye strain is any kind of headache all headaches are assumed to be from the eye all pains in and around the eye are assumed to be due to not wearing the proper glasses so i would like to define eye strain or what when i treat my patient as consistent symptoms related to the eye in and around the eye brought about by use of the eyes and if it happens half an hour after watching television and um, having fun that should be repeated when that same half an hour is on a tablet preparing for the exam so if i'm preparing for the exam and i have headache but it's not so severe when or not present when i'm having playing a video game or just having fun on the computer i would not attribute that to eye strain similarly any pain that occurs on waking in the morning again i would i would attribute that to the stress of the exam more than the actual uh, problem with the eye so the first thing i would do is to take a history to find out whether this is acute onset whether this has been the same pattern with previous exams or previous periods of using the eye and then once i've satisfied myself that yes this is eye strain these are symptoms that come on after using the eyes the big three for me which could cause these symptoms are a true refractive error convergence problems and finally with our age of using uh, devices dryness of the eye so the first i will deal with is refractive error and about refractive error there is a lot that i have to say well prescribed glasses for even small refractive errors will definitely cure eye strain but very often small refractive errors which were not causing problems or were of a kind which did not necessarily translate to the kind of symptoms the patient had usually end up being placebos and all of you must have this experience of them telling us we had glasses pattam class il padikkumbo kannada kurichu vannu aaru maasam vekkan parannu anna oru rendu maasam okka vechu adu kaini ippi rendu vella i been doing plus 2 i been going for everything ippa prashna onnum illa appo ippa adhe ee pariksha vannappo i am having symptoms so i would like very much to know whether these symptoms may not be due to and the kind of glasses that i know usually have nothing to do with eye strain are a small minus sphere a minus 0.25 sphere which i think all of you should appreciate will actually improve vision in any one of us ditto for a minus 0.25 cylinder with axis 180 that is a with the rule cylinder even very small against the rule cylinders with virtually normal vision in young people will cause eye strain as also will all hypermetropia so for me when it comes to refractive error the refractive errors that are high degree will bring down the vision and patients are usually picked up early when they go for eye tests the refractive errors which are small in degree are likely to be missed because young people have the resolution not just to read 66 but sometimes even 65 so the fact that they read the 66 line comfortably or sometimes even by screwing their eyes does not necessarily mean that they don't have a refractive error and in this context therefore i would like first to know whether they have myopia to me never causes eye strain myopia when it causes eye strain is in very high degrees when you need to converge out of proportion to accommodation or when it is associated with a convergence problem otherwise the poor myope his horizon is closer than for any of us but there's nothing that he can do to improve the vision for distance and he is usually comfortable for near 
unless, like I said, he needs the accommodative convergence to help him to read comfortably for me. So the refractive errors that I would like to find out and I would like to treat are against the rule astigmatism of even very small degrees, not so much with the rule. And with the rule, I don't know whether uh, most of you would have had this experience as well. Many patients with, with the rule astigmatism with high degree, even minus three, minus 3.5, I've had so many of them. When they first come to us, it's bilateral. They have some amount of amblyopia, but they never complain of eye strain. They're not even aware that their distance vision is poor. And I've had children to whom I first prescribed the glass. And the child says, I don't like this glass. So with the rule astigmatism, I would definitely treat if the patient complains of symptoms, but not if it is just a 0.25. Of course, once in a way, when you have no other option, you do prescribe and then I'm 100% certain it's only a placebo. It doesn't actually treat the refractive error as a cause for the eye strain. So this uh, ones that I would treat against the rule astigmatism and hypermetropia. And when it comes to hypermetropia, the only way to find out the hypermetropia is to do a cycloplegic refraction and at the postmetriatic test to do a fogging. And for fogging, I usually would put a plus 1.5 to the correction so that I fogged it to the 618 line, keep the 1.5 in place and then put a 1.25. So I decrease by 0.25 and the smallest plus with which they will continue to read the 618 line is what I would prescribe. Uh, again, this I'm sure most of you would know this too. I have to mention in this context, one problem that you might have faced, which I've been facing with many of my medical students. They keep coming back to me worried that their myopia is increasing. And this is about every three months, every four months. They come, they get a pair of glasses, they read 6 6, they say it's very clear. And then three months later, they're back saying, no, the last line is not clear. And the optometrist says from 1.5, it's become 1.75. And to me, I thought that this was because they were over accommodating. We did cycloplegic refraction, and then the refractionist says there's probably a slight increase. But many of these, when you change their glasses, they're happy for a while and then again they come back. I don't know whether when you gave them the full minus, they're over accommodating. And at a certain stage, I say, look, the 0.25 makes no difference. Leave it on for a year, come back and we'll see what to do. Okay, so, so much for refractive errors and eye strain. Convergence, I'm sure all of you know about convergence insufficiency. Apart from asking them to do pencil push-ups, I also advise that they hold their reading matter at least two inches further from what they've been using now. And after reading for a while, because convergence insufficiency causes symptoms after using the eye for a while, I advise that they rest their eyes. And if they're preparing for exams, to me, it makes immense sense that you read two pages, you close your eyes and think of what you read, summarize what you have understood before you go back and read it. So that it helps both to understand, to retain what you have read, as well as give rest to your convergence. Uh, dry eye again, we are seeing increasingly because unlike when you read a book and you have to turn your page, you automatically blink. The page is now fixed and you have to concentrate very much in the same place so that your blink rate comes down. Uh, at this age, most of them have enough tears and frequent blinking should do the trick. Now, these are for me the usual causes of what patients would interpret as eye strain. But there are some other reasons as well, which could be causing problems. And for me, the chief among them, because I suffer from it too, as do many members of my family, is cervical muscle spasm. Uh, again, using devices, you keep your head in the same place for long periods of time, and the neck muscles get strained. And the end result is a headache, feeling dizzy at times. And this can be easily overcome by neck exercise. And the last I have to say is anybody who comes to me with sudden onset of symptoms and I don't find anything, I would reassure. And I find that reassurance given competently, like I've said this at so many meetings, there are so many people who tell me, I feel like a quack, but I'm 100% certain that when it happened to me, I've had medical issues recently, 
and when somebody tells me look madam it's nothing it's going to go away but as someone else tells me madam you'll have to live with this you're old now you have to live with this for the rest of your life as against when somebody says madam adinanda you just do this and it will go away and believe me in another half an hour or one hour i feel so much better my husband says i always knew you were a hypochondriac whatever the reason i am saying that reassuring people that there's nothing seriously wrong is not wrong but if the symptoms don't go away you must reassess so when i've said there is nothing i say please wait to be see if sim- symptoms are coming down if they are not i would definitely like to see you again so what are my take home messages when people complain of eye strain make sure it's eye and eye strain find out the type of refractive error find out whether there are convergence problems uh, dry eye which makes the eyes pretty uh, tired which come on in the evening in the absence of any of the others consider that also treat each of these to begin with consider other issues like neck problems and if they do not get better bring them back in a couple of weeks reassess and make sure of course that there is nothing serious that you are missing thank you very much thank you thank you madam for uh, encapsulating the practical aspects of uh, a case of eye strain uh, into a 10 minutes talk i mean uh, i would say that uh, eye strain is the is the uh, most common symptom that most of the world is face in their uh, in their opd and uh, you have mentioned it in the most inimitable way which you only can do let's see if uh, dr sahasram he has got a vast experience uh, in uh, uh, medical colleges and let's see if he can contribute something more in this uh, uh, topic of asthenopia over to dr sahasram please so um, good morning to all of you am i audible yeah yeah sure so uh, so at the outset um, thanks and congrats to uh, coc thanks for inviting me and congrats on all your uh, scientific uh, fees you are arranging in this lockdown era okay so um, uh, madam patmaja madam from her uh, um, vast experience of um, three four decades no she had um, shared her practical uh, things in uh, eye strain in uh, we when we say eye strain no uh, this is a common thing which we have been seeing for years together for the for the few decades ago we are talking about um, students teenagers as well as children being brought by their parents uh, for eye strain and now the new age phenomenon of more of uh, screen and monitor time producing and different type of entity all together so madam was telling about eye strain so uh, what i would like to add is like eye strain uh, is essentially eye muscle strain or eye muscle fatigue which we commonly uh, in our terminology we call as uh, asthenopia so if you if you try to uh, define asthenopia asthenopia would be something like a group of symptoms uh, originating out of the conscious striving of the visual apparatus to clarify vision so when we say that the eye attempts to clarify vision and when i say there is an eye muscle fatigue it involves fatigue of the extraocular muscles and as well as the fatigue of the intraocular especially ciliary muscle in this phenomenon so when we say the eye is trying to clarify vision we will also think of a lot of um, uh, children which we see lot of uh, teenagers which we see or a lot of adults even um, with 66 vision n6 vision so then why should the visual apparatus try to clarify vision when you have an 66 vision n6 vision and get eye strain because many of the eye strain and the asthenopic people we see they are going normal vision so uh, then again so it can be due to two things one thing normal vision distant vision as well as near vision remaining normal but if we think about children studying you no know, we can talk about environmental factors like illumination so they they read it in all types of illuminations they view the monitor in all types of illuminations so the contrast problem so that is normal vision with environmental factors and we may have normal vision 6x and n6 both eyes with eye problems like as madam was saying convergence problems fusional inadequacies phorias maybe near normal vision 6x partial with subtle uh, refractive errors 
subtle um, astigmatism, astigmatism producing problems. So, and uh, another thing, as, as Madam was saying, a lot of um, uh, students are brought by their parents to us for, uh, for, um, for, the, for, the, for years together for a headache. Headache, so they say we have seen the ADHD in even the neurologist, there is no problem. They say and a spectacle will cure my, uh, my uh, child's headache. So uh, if we uh, look at headache as an asthenopic symptom, headache as an asthenopic, because um, um, eye strain can produce uh, defective vision like uh, the, 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 the students complaining like uh, my uh, vision after reading for some time, it becomes blurred. There is running of letters. Once in a while, I have diplopia in reading. So all those visual symptoms, they complain. But the common thing we see is uh, parents bring their children with headache. And they want to rule out whether it is due to an ocular problem. So if you look at uh, the asthenopic symptom of headache, uh, it would, uh, we us um, why uh, headache should occur in eye strain or as a symptom of asthenopia, yes. We usually, um, like, uh, we look up uh, cardiac problem. We say um, you uh, get uh, an um, MI, CAD, you get a referred pain in the uh, left upper limb. So similar to that, asthenopic headache is actually a referred uh, symptom. It's a referred symptom of um, asthenopia. Where you get a referred symptom as, uh, as I told you, extraocular muscle fatigue as well as intraocular muscle fatigue, especially ciliary muscle. And that tends to be referred to the uh, off-tapping division of the trigeminal as well as to the um, upper cervical nerves. So that's why in eye strain you get uh, pain around the eye, frontal headache, occipital headache. So all these types of headaches you can get with eye strain. So headache of um, asthenopia is essentially a referred uh, symptom. And if you rule out the, um, the refractive errors, if you rule out even small refractive errors, subtle refractive errors, the near normal vision. So if you rule out those refractive errors, if you rule out convergence problems, if you rule out fusion in cases, if you rule out four years, then you can say for sure that this headache is probably not due to asthenopic uh, symptoms. So um, I think uh, the other panelists can also add on to what uh, Madam has uh, said. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your uh, 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 tips on, uh, practical tips on uh, asthenopia. So now the, 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 there is a new normal that has been brought out by COVID, Corona and COVID-19. I just changed the teaching method as Madam has said, online classes have come and uh, uh, it has created a fresh crop of ocular symptoms. Uh, most of the dormant refractive problems have become manifested in most of the children and pe people come with uh, uh, acute esotropia. I've seen patients with acute esotropia and even um, uh, accommodative spasm, which is very common. And uh, some of the uh, uh, computer professionals, they, they get uh, this eye strain and there are a lot of lenses in the market which come with low plus additions, plus 0.4 additions, which can be, which are available for uh, those uh, who, who need the computer work for long. And there are blue blocker lenses, which uh, uh, they, they say that it is beneficial for them, but there is no scientific document for that. And uh, uh, I would invite Dr. Sudha, who has a uh, uh, lot of experience in dealing with such uh, uh, people with uh, near vision, the, the computer vision problems and online classes, problems with online classes. Uh, Sudha can comment on that. Sir, uh, as you said, sir, these classes are now the reality. So we have to learn how to adjust. And the best way to do that is to first educate what exactly are we planning. So if you're having a 12-hour session, I mean, the child is going to get tired. So I feel we should space it. There should be only half an hour classes for each. Then enjoy, let the child enjoy. The other thing is we have to stress the fact that it should not be done in a closed room. Because uh, the environment outside and the sunlight, the air, all this is very important for a child to grow. So comparing to young children have started online classes, I feel we should think of the idea that this classes should not be in a dark room with no other uh, or disorientation. That's what parents feel. So that's not what it should be. It should be in a good natural light scenario, maybe outside a little bit, enjoy themselves, half an hour orientation. And the teacher should also be aware. 
she should be able to know that a child is having eye strain and the frequent dropping of eyes. So she should be aware that there are problems which are occurring. As Madam said, astigmatism in a year, the thing may be eye strain, cause of eye strain. So all these things, looking at the uh, computer for so long, dryness, all these are problems which the teacher also should be able to be aware that these things are occurring. Yes, sir, Professor Sai. I just want to have uh, an opinion from the panel. I recently gave a talk uh, about this in one of our Rotary Clubs, non-doctor non audience. Three, four people came and asked me, can you advise what is the ideal lighting for uh, you know, viewing all these things? Uh, is it an LED light? Is it a, a tube light? You know, all those things. I said, I'm not, uh, I'm not a very you know, expert in all these things. Uh, the only thing that I note, note is you know, it should be a comfortable lighting. Is there any scientific evidence to say what is the what the room lighting should be, uh, what is what the computer backlit uh, lighting should be, and things like that? Is there any scientific evidence as to what is the best, you know, to reduce eye strain, as far as the new uh, you know online classes and all these computer viewing is concerned? No, uh, I think they are uh, saying the iPad system, the retinal display is the best. That is supposed to have a good uh, resolution. So that resolution, if it is good, it uh, decreases eye strain. But more important for a child is not just the ambient lighting and everything. The important fact is that it's a she, she or he is a child. And it should not be confined to sitting in one room and looking at a screen for such a long time. So it's not wrong if the child looks around. That is the important point to highlight. There should be something where he is also exposed to surrounding environment, natural sunlight, and possibly the seating arrangements are also very important. If the child keeps on sitting in a uh, crooked position, looking at something, that is also going to cause side strain. And as for your saying on the light of the screen, it should be actually the ambient surrounding and the screen should go together it should not be one should not be more bright than the other so if the screen is brighter then it becomes strain for the patient if the light is brighter then what happens is they're getting a glare in that area so it should be both going together comfortable for the patient uh, for the person and should be where the child should be well seated and natural light is falling that way yes. Madam. Sir, I think we should move on. Yeah, I think I think we can move on to the next talk. Latika will be speaking on uh, vision loss in a in a seemingly normal eye. So the the, yes. the what what we are taught is that the patient doesn't see anything and the doctor also doesn't see anything. Exactly. Latika is having a mobile prompter in front of her. No, no, I don't have. <laughs> no, I was just... Uh... Is that your screen, Ma, Letika? No, I'm just taking my presentation. So I thank uh, Team COC and uh, Dr. Gopal for this wonderful opportunity. So as uh, Shashi has said, this is what we're dealing with uh, now. And uh, when the doctor does not see much, he has no option but to look again and look again better for the role that was not taken actually. So uh, when the eye looks normal, but there is a defective vision, why are we missing things? Because it may be in the eye and that may be too subtle or something that is beyond the eye that is where we cannot see it and something that is in the patient's head. So all these are quite uh, complicating things and they all warrant a foolproof second look also. That is what this talk is about, a structured clinical approach to this perplexing situation. Now, uh, it should start with the examiner, actually. The examiner should brace himself for a dedicated and detailed examination, should not be led by the watch, should not call his favorite PG, no shortcuts in examination, and go all the way when investigations are warranted.
the audio clear oh, uh, somehow we have lost connection with latika i think yeah, i think the net is uh, down i see internet problem um i think now she is moved out i think maybe a current got yeah maybe maybe disturbed or something like that uh, should we move on to the next talk and then bring back latika when she comes no she has come back she has come, she has back. come back okay yeah latika unmute yourself yeah now you can share your screen okay so uh, and you should miss nothing as i was saying no, and the screen is not screen it was the share is okay. Okay, can I can you uh, see my screen now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, if it's a transient visual loss, actually, that it's a very quick guide you you can have. Is first you should gauge how much serious it is, and this how long is a very important question. For example, if it's just lasting for seconds, you know it's the optic nerve that you should focus upon. If it lasts for minutes, it's probably uh, due to an impending is. Schema, and you should focus on the vertebral base rest system. And if it's more than fifteen minutes, think of migraine. So similarly, we can draw very uh, important clinical conclusions, that are even from the history. For example, you should differentiate a blackout from a whiteout. A blackout is your classical amaurosis, whereas a whiteout can mean something much serious. Now, coming to the examination, please have a checklist. to do before dilatation because the minute we hear that this uh, patient has uh, not improving with classes our first instinct is to say dilate so before dilatation please make sure all these checks have been done because that's when they yield best results and regarding color vision it's a very subtle thing so it's best that you recheck yourself and even the speed of recognition of colors is important in early disease and macular diseases also can have color vision defects now uh, this is just a small case history where a 17 year old boy had attended our op with headache and a recent onset defective vision for distance which was bilateral and symmetrical and it was improving to minus 5 uh, to 6 6 with a minus 5 sphere but he was a class 9 patient so we were, as madam was saying we were thinking of all these things and we were planning a dilated retinoscopy but that's when an ac uh, exam straight line examination uh, came up with a bilateral shallow ac and interestingly this was a white eye and we we were attributing the uh, headache to the migraine so uh, topramate was discovered in his list of drugs and what helped you and the takeaways here are in a migraine all headaches need not be migraines all defective vision need not be aura and a sudden onset bilateral myopia even if it is a white eye can warrant a, a careful a drug history also so going forward to the anterior segment second look uh we again have to look at the anterior segment both before dilatation and after because otherwise many of these things can get masked now second thing is you have to fine tune your second exam based on that proper history you have taken for these are just illustrative examples if it's a suspicious toxic keratopathy you should look for the deposits otherwise you will miss it that verticillata can be missed and corneal thinning can be missed in a suspected keratoconus if you don't look for it so on and so on and so forth now pupil is a very vital clue in these cases and i have uh, seen many patients who were referred uh, for a second look and they were all mostly dilated 
So when you have, when I see a dilated patient for a second opinion, I can't really uh, have uh, that clue from the pupil. So you have to always record pupillary status if you're going to refer out a patient uh, for defective vision curry cause. And pupillary examination requires that uh, it should be done in a dim room with a bright light. And individual pupillary assessment for, should be first done. And look at size differences and assess each pupil before you go into RAPD. And as far as RAPD is concerned, uh, you should relax accommodation and avoid standing in front of the patient or distracting him by moving or swinging the torch all the way with very weird movements. It can be just a gentle movement and it can you can start with either eye, but I generally start with the normal eye and a loop for press biopsy like me, it is better to have a loop. Now, uh, this is, a, this is something that I want to highlight. No RAPD, just, does that mean that the optic nerve is healthy? It does not really mean because there are many bilateral symmetric optic neuropathies where the RAPD cannot be elicited. And labos is a disease where there is no RAPD most of the time. If it's a unilateral eye with no RAPD, you must think of situations where the pupil is already damaged also. That's also a difficult situation, like trauma, surgeries, etc. Pupil sphincter is already damaged, it's uh, difficult. So in such cases of bilateral RAPD, probability of a bilateral RAPD, what you can assess is the briskness of pupillary reaction and something better would be the pupil cycle time. And also you can note the light near comparison of the pupillary response. So this is just a pup pupil cycle time is actually a very simple test. You have to make your slit lamp beam horizontal and focus on the inferior edge of the pupil. So that will, uh, that will elicit a, a cycle of dilatation and constriction, dilatation and constriction. And you just record the number of times this pupil does this in one minute, and that's your pupil cycle time. And uh, anything that's more than 8, 40 milliseconds is supposed to be abnormal. Now, go, moving on to the fundus, we will first look at the difficult discs. So this is a situation we are all familiar with, nothing difficult there, actually. There is an onset of gross defective vision, RAPD is present, this looks normal. RBN is the first thing that crops up. But what I want to stress is that a mild and diffuse optic disc swelling does not change your diagnosis. It can occur in many cases of RBN. And the second thing is PION is a diagnosis. We have to consider if the history is suggestive. This, in both these cases, the fundus can be looking very quite normal in the acute phase and the pallor will set in much, much later. So that's when to distinguish between these two fields are sometimes helpful central field loss, more suggestive of a PION because every PION is not surgically induced or it can be also like our AION, it can be uh, non-arthritic and arthritic too. So in this cases, this becomes more important and VEP can also help. That is latency problems are more with the myelin and amplitude reduction small with ischemia, that's it. So now one more thing, RAPD with a normal disc, don't just confine yourselves to this, uh, this, you know, you should think out of the box and always ask what else. So keep in mind that all these neuropathies in their early stages can be normal. So a normal disc does not exclude optic neuropathies. That's the takeaway I have to give them. And uh, now let's, uh, come to the second set of discs. This is a very common scenario, a middle-aged man coming with chronic progressive defective vision and a slight, I mean, minimal lenticular opacity, but the disc has a temporal pallor. So we come back and see again, there is no RAPD. So what next? Can we post for cataract surgery or is this temporal pallor significant? Is it some ongoing disease or is it a sign of previous ischemia? So that's when your drug history comes in. If he's on any of these drugs, please think twice because it could be a toxic optic neuropathy or if you have this history, think of a nutritional optic neuropathy. In these cases, always do a field examination and confirm because this is something that's quite reversible at early, in early stages and it can make a difference to the patient's life. Now, this is rare, but I have seen patients with uh, the young patients come with an acute visual loss first in one eye and then a week later in the other eye. Uh, so this sort of sequential bilateral defective vision. And mind you, there are there may, the pupil and the disc may even be normal. And even in such cases, please think of Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy too. 
So evaluation in such cases is of course perimetry and VEP uh, does help. As I said, demyelination is, uh, up, uh, I mean, increased latency is more suggestive of demyelination. And it's, uh, you, uh, we generally do a neuroimaging for many cases, but not in all cases. But whenever you do it, you mark your clinical impression correctly, if possible, uh, talk with the neurologist and the radiologist and be a team. Now, uh, OCT is not really mandatory, but sometimes it helps in follow-up. Blood only in suspected cases of uh, nutritional optic neuropathy. Now, going on to the macula, uh, macula is uh, so only rarely can it be normal in a patient with uh, entirely normal in a patient with defective vision, but most of the time you're not very sure whether it is normal or whether it is uh, pathological or physiological water. Uh, so, fovea is actually a pitfall, literally. So uh, I'm now focusing more on acute visual loss patients in this because otherwise it will become very, very vast. So, so uh, in this patient, uh, consider the scenario where a young adult comes with an acute visual loss and that too for half an hour duration in unilateral one night. Eyes are absolutely within normal limits. And here there is no doubt that the macula is normal because it is a gleaming FR. So in such situations, please don't forget to look for the caliber of retinal arteries and record it because narrowing uh, of the retinal arteries may be the only sign of a retinal migraine. There may not be even a headache associated with it. Now, this is another situation which is not, uh, again, very frequently encountered, but we have had patients. We had a young female patient recently with an acute unilateral moderate defective vision. The fundus uh, was uh, showing uh, some sort of abnormality, which actually I could not put a finger to. And this patient also had a sore throat, a fever just before that. So uh, that's when we should think of some rare conditions like acute idiopathic maculopathy and acute retinal pigment bactylitis and OCT is vital in the diagnosis of such cases. Now, another uh, cause of uh, acute visual loss uh, in a normal looking macula can be a subtle SMD or a solar retinopathy, which you cannot diagnose unless you have a proper history and OCT. Now coming to the chronic uh, visual loss, I will just uh, only uh, see if the, there are very easy misses in the retina. So that's why history and exam is absolutely important. They will tune you to look at the macula um, very, very seriously. And photostress test is an undervalued, undervalued test in our uh, examination. It's very easy. You have to ask the patient to look at the smallest possible line in the near vision chart, then bleach the eye for 10 to 15 seconds. Ask the patient to read the same line of print and the recovery time is noted. If it's more than one minute, it is pathological. Now, this slightly sort of mottled maculas, are they normal in patients with chronic visual loss? Actually, they may not be because all these dystrophies, both in adults and children, can present with uh, normal looking macula. Also, early MACTLs, early ERMs, early phobias and subtle VMTs can be missed. Very, I mean, they're all easy misses. And this is a situation which we encounter very often. We are looking for this. We are looking for a bullseye. But what we see may be not very dramatic, you know. So such patients also we can miss. So that's where multimodal imaging becomes important with the ERG, the centrocecal scotomas, et cetera. So uh, the, uh, the point is, if you have a near normal macula and uh, if there is a suggestive history or exam, don't hesitate to go for an SPOCT and electrophysiology when needed. The rest can wait. That is the FFA, FF, etc. So at this point, we can decide whether the eye is normal or not. And if it is normal, you have to look beyond quite seriously. That is a set of patients where there is acute bilateral defective vision where everything is normal, including the pupil and the fundus. So your idea would be now to uh, see whether this is transient or whether this is a real cortical blindness arising from an occipital lobe pathology. So what next? Again, perimetry is useful, once you but you should choose it well and may need multiple pro programs. And patients with too poor vision or patients with uh, bad higher functions may not be good uh, candidates for that. So neuroimaging is a must and as is neuroreferral. BEP is not very reliable, but if it is normal, then it is uh, good. But abnormal VEP is not of great value. So this, I just took the slide only for this purpose. That is the, uh, this uh, sort of 
uh, small uh, occipital tip lesions may be sometimes there. And in such cases, in patients with defective vision, you are suspecting cortical uh, defective vision. A full field alone is not enough. You have to go for a central field also. This patient had, uh, may come with just a reading difficulty, for example. And migraine is another great mimic. It can be anything, but as you can see, the field effects in migraine have very fuzzy borders. So that is uh, not a, a neurological field. In migraine, the borders will be very fuzzy. Now, I, this is one of my favorite uh, cases, so I must uh, present it here because this lady uh, was a young uh, lady after postpartum second day, I think. She came with a bilateral visual loss, counting fingers, one meter OU. And uh, we diagnosed clinically, we diagnosed cortical blindness and uh, asked for an MRI and a neuro consult. And the MRI comes back with the signs of cerebral edema and hyperintensity in the occipital cortex and a diagnosis of PRES or posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. So this patient, uh, the BP was controlled, reassurance was given, and she recovered completely in one week. So why I mentioned it here is because generally, if it's a cortical visual loss, we almost, uh, you know, we uh, it's doomsday prophecies for uh, the patient. But this there can be cortical blindness that is reversible, and this is one such. And all ophthalmologists should be aware of it, provided they have all these uh, predisposing conditions and associated neurological symptoms and if they have to recover, you have to stop the predisposing factor. That's also very important and control any un uncontrolled hypertension that's there. It will not recover just on its own. So if the cortex also looks like it's normal, then you uh, think everything is in the patient's head. But remember that it is not just a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to prove yourself before you grant because you're granting for life. And it can be very complex situations that are for the patient to so we have many clinical tests for that, of which I would prefer uh, pupils, the menace reflex, and the proprioception test. There is a finger finger and the finger nose test that are very easy to do in the OPD. And fogging, pinhole, etc. we also do. We uh, do routinely. So these tests can actually uh, help you in uh, these patients. And further evaluation feels in hysteria has a particular appearance called a clover shaped appearance. Earlier, we used to say spiraling of visual field and tunnel vision, etc. And OK in drums, theoretically, yes, but I've never done one uh, for this purpose. And VEP, as I said, normal VEP is more significant. But more importantly, the message I would like to share is once you have come to a diagnosis of functional visual loss, don't trivialize it. Don't just send the patient home, but give a proper neuropsychiatric referral because this is where the patient's actual treatment journey starts. And beware of a functional overlay. That means though there is a functional component, the patient may still be having an organic disease. So these are the pitfalls in this. So we have reached the end of the road. And if you have followed this and uh, did such an examination sincerely, then when you write eyes are within normal limits, it, well, WNL would really mean within normal limits and not that we never looked into that aspect of the eye. So thank you all for your kind attention. Ladiga, that was an excellent talk and a very comprehensive one. And most important, I'd like to say is that we should stress on the fact that history and examination, as has been stressed by all of us, including Girigar sir, Dr. Patnaja, and uh, uh, Charles Naman sir, that we should, examination, actually the patient is telling us something and we are not listening. So we should listen to the patient. We should not listen to our residents. We should start yeah. looking for the patients rather. So that is very important. And before, my opinion is that before you send for an investigation, you should make a diagnosis. Let that diagnosis be ready before you send. What are you sending it for? And just going and saying, okay, do an OCT and dilate the eye without even looking at the angle, without even looking at the slip lamp for a narrow angle, it is going to lead to problems. So you should be able to do all that complete examination. And I would stress on the protocol that a complete thorough examination, including a best corrected visual acuity every time should be done. Onioscopy, at least one should be possible. So with that, Gopal, should we end this program with this session? Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> uh, we will move on to the next session. Thank you very much. Uh, these were very difficult topics indeed, which is taken care nicely. Uh, next on, I would uh, stop uh, sharing. Uh, Let the guy you can stop sharing your screen, please. Yeah.
and uh, dr rehna can start uh, sharing her screen dr rehna yeah dr rehna and dr risha will take us through the last uh, session latika yes yes yeah. yes and uh, dr mv francis dr sandhya and natasha dr natasha radhakrishnan will uh, discuss that rehna will be talking about optic nerve edema and uh, risha will be talking to us about a case of uvitis so and please screen share martha yeah it is in the it's in the top part yeah 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 you can just go up yeah, yeah stop share yeah thanks good afternoon everyone um first of all let me thank coc for giving me an opportunity here uh the causes of disc edema in a 20 year old is my topic so this can range from infections to vascular to malignant and finding or making a correct diagnosis is very important as a patient's vision or most of the time the life may depend upon timely diagnosis and treatment the disc edema can either be bilateral or unilateral it can affect the vision or the patient may pres at presentation the vision may be unaffected it can present with or without surrounding retinal features for example in case of central retinal retinal vein occlusion the patient can present with disc edema and there will be a lot of hemorrhages and cotton wool spots and the diagnosis is very obvious or in case of papillitis associated with uveitis there will be other inflammatory signs and the diagnosis is clear so but ultimately the diagnosis in a disc edema depends upon the history the clinical examination both ocular and neurological and ancillary test The causes of bilateral disc edema are numerous in a 20 year old but um, we will go through the common ones uh, papilledema papilledema we know it is the disc edema due to raised ict pseudo papilledema and in these condition usually at presentation the visual acuity will be normal other causes are toxic optic neuropathies diabetic papillopathies inflammatory and infiltrative optic neuropathies severe anemias and in these conditions usually the patients present with decreased visual acuity and uh, they can also present unilaterally Unilateral disc edema, the most common cause is optic neuritis in a 20-year-old. Uh, it could be the demyelinating, viral, infectious, para-infectious, or idiopathic, and it can present bilaterally as well. The other causes are neoplastic like optic disc glioma, inflammatory like sarcoidosis and SLE, ocular um, papillitis in uveitis or hypertony, and orbital tumors. So when examining a patient with disc edema a full ophthalmologic and neurological history including headache type duration onset the time of the day when it occurs vision loss sudden or gradual pain or movement of the eyes feel loss any neurological symptoms like symptoms of stroke or numbness or weakness is required check the vision color vision and contrast sensitivity visual fields look at the type of the visual field defect look for rapd extraocular movements look for any cranial nerve palsies and assess the disc disc for color the margins nerve fiber layer of pacification obscuration of vessels on the disc the spontaneous venous pulsation present or not if it is present it can rule out papilledema abnormal vasculature which is suggestive of pseudo papilledema do a slit lamp examination looking for cells or vitritis or any vasculitis which could uh, give the clue and do a neurological examination so in this presentation i'll be going through four typical common cases and how we go about with it So we have here the first case is a 22 year old girl with high body mass index presenting with headache she complained of occasional fussiness in the vision but her visual acuity was normal 6 by 6 color vision was normal pupils normal extraocular movements were full no cranial nerve palsies slit lamp examination and blood pressure was normal and this is a fundus picture there is bilateral disc edema the disc appears full elevated and spontaneous venous pulsations were absent dilatation and tortuosity of the vessels were there OCT confirmed peripapillary arnophil thickening in both eyes and a Humphrey visual field was done which showed enlarged blind spot which was more so in the left eye so here we are dealing with a young overweight female with normal visual functions and bilateral disc edema with enlarged blind spot this is very consistent with idiopathic intracranial hypertension or IIH but this diagnosis should never be be made without ruling out other causes like space occupying lesions infections or venous sinus thrombosis so she need an mri and mrv 
a lumbar puncture to look for the opening pressure and CSF analysis to look for the CSF composition. And if the demographics is not that of an overweight female, history of medications that can cause ICT should be taken too. In our patient, there was no space occupying lesion. There was slight widening of the perioptic CSF space in the left eye, which could be suggestive of IIH. Opening pressure was raised and the CSF composition was normal. So that's the case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, where the treatment is acetazolamide, 500 milligram twice daily, along with advice on losing weight. She was followed up and she was continued on acetazolamide for six months, after which it was tapered and stopped. And she, her headaches improved and dyskedema resolved. Now we will go to the second case. This is a young girl who presented with a decreased vision of few days duration. Um, her visual acuity was five by 16 both eyes. Uh, she is a known case of kidney disease. And this is the uh, fundus appearance. The disc was elevated. Um, so this was disc edema, massive disc edema. Lots of exudation around the disc and extending to the macula. But when we are looking at the vessels, the arterioles were narrowed and there were AV crossing changes and the blood pressure was high, which was 220 bar 120. So this is a case of grade four hypertensive retinopathy. This highlights that always check blood pressure in a bilateral disc edema cases and look for any changes of hypertensive retinopathy, which will give the clue. And the third is a uh, case which uh, as general ophthalmologists, we will come across in the clinics where the patient present with, uh, comes for a routine examination or uh, for glass checkup and we see disc like this, might be fussy here. You can see fussiness and halo here and sometimes hyperemic. And uh, we will think, are we dealing with a case of uh, early papilledema or is it a pseudo papilledema? So how will we go about with these cases? If you see a clear drusence on the surface, the diagnosis is obvious and autofluorescence will show this hyper autofluorescent lesions on the disc. It's a case of pseudo papilledema due to disc drusence. Or if it is a buried drusen where you can cannot obviously see them, the B scan would help, which will show this hyper echoic lesions on the uh, disc. In our patient, we did an OCT and it showed RNFL thickening in two quadrants. And study says that if the, there is no RNFL thickening in OCT, it is not papilledema. And if there is RNFL thickening in four quadrants, it's likely to be papilledema. But in our case, we are still left with confusion whether we are dealing with papilledema or not. In such cases, FFA frequently helps. As papilledema, the disc will leak, but in pseudopapilledema, the disc will not leak. So we had a patient with pseudopapilledema and the patient was advised to follow up. And another uh, diagnosis which we should bear in mind when dealing with bilateral optic disc edema is bilateral optic neuritis. But the picture is entirely different. The patients will complain of decreased vision, pain or night movements, and there will be visual function problems as well. So now we'll go to the ca third case. Here, this young girl presented uh, with decreased vision in the right eye with pain on movements of the eye. And the visual acuity was 624 in the right and 66 in the left eye. There was relative afferent pupillary defect in the right eye and defective color vision. There was no neurological symptoms. She had a Humphrey visual field which showed centrocecal scotoma and peripapillary arnafil thickening on OCT was confirmed. So how do we go about with this patient? In such cases of typical, this is a case of a typical optic neuritis uh, with pain movement, young female, defective color vision. So such cases of typical optic neuritis or uh, clinical isolated syndrome, the patient should undergo MRI of the brain with contrast. One to look for the explanatory cause for the optic neuritis. Here we can see enhancement post contrast and T2 images. And also we should look for any white matter lesions in the brain uh, to diagnose MS and also for risk assessment of MS. All these patients with optic neuritis, we refer them to neurology um, for further evaluation. CSF examination is done for this patient. It is not a must in typical optic neuritis, but it would help in risk assessment of multiple sclerosis. And if oligoclonal bands are seen in the CSF, which are not seen in the uh, uh, serum, it can help in refining the risk assessment and for starting early treatment, uh, early disease modifying treatment. But what will we do if the patient is uh, not having a typical optic neuritis? How do we go about with a typical optic neuritis. A typical optic neuritis is if the optic neuritis is outside the age criteria, 18 to 45, severe bilateral vision loss, no pain or night movements. It's not improving with steroids. They require extensive inflammatory infectious workup, bloods and CSF needs to be done. Also they need MRI. So a complete blood count, ESR, TB quantiferone, autoimmune profile, ACE, syphilis, serological and CSF tests for Lyme's disease, syphilis and viruses. And NMO antibody testing is done for patients who have bilateral severe vision loss. NMO is neuromyelitis optica. It's a severe demyelinating condition which affects the 
uh, optic nerve and the spinal cord. So treatment as per ONTT, IV methylprednisolone for three to five days followed by oral steroids. And in poor responder cases, if it is not responding or is having poor vision, even after three to five days of oral steroids, IV, IG and plasma exchange can be considered. In cases of chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuritis, long-term suppression is uh, immunosuppression um, is required. Now we will rush through a few fundus pictures. This was a case of toxic optic neuropathy. The patient presented four weeks, four months after starting ATT and presented with decreased vision and with this disc edema, slight disc edema with some haziness. This was an optic neuritis due to ethambutol. And we are seeing more cases of ethambutol toxicity nowadays as ethambutol duration has been increased to six months. And in here, the treatment is stoppage of the authentic drug that is ethambutol. And luckily in this patient, vision improved after um, one month. Uh, this is a case of diabetic papillopathy, which uh, we should suspect in young juvenile diabetics. Uh, typically, they will have disc edema with telangiectatic vessels on the surface, and usually the vision loss will not be there, or they may present with mild vision loss, or in certain cases, severe vision loss may be there if there is an ischemic component associated, and observing is uh, what we do for these patients. And here, the diagnosis is obvious, inflammatory. You can see this periphlebitis infiltrates and this is an inflammatory disc edema. And this was a case of compressive optic neuropathy in a patient with mild proptosis, defective vision, disc edema, an MRI showing mass lesion in the orbit, and that was an optic nerve glioma. And never forget infiltrative optic neuropathy, especially in patients like AML who come to us with defective vision, uh, or if this clinical <coughs> like this occurs, a peripheral smear need to be done. So to summarize, if, when dealing with a case of uh, disc edema, a good history of presenting complaints, past ocular history, underlying systemic conditions like diabetic mellitus, uncontrolled hypertension, any vasculitis, underlying malignancies and systemic medications is required. Ocular ex examination, including proptosis, extraocular muscles, movement, slit lamp examination. Do not forget PP and RPD. Don't hesitate to investigate and work along with neurologists as and when required. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Rehina, for that uh, wonderful presentation. So uh, in, when you see a patient with a disc edema, it is very important to look for associated signs, like signs of inflammation. And then you should dilate and see the fundus in all cases. Because if you just look at the disc, you may miss the findings associated with the vascular occlusion, like hemorrhages, and you may miss cotton wool spots, uh, all these things. So it is important to have a complete uh, uh, ocular examination when you see a disc edema. And another thing is you should uh, differentiate it from pseudopapillary edema. That is, when you, if you can see the vessels that is from the disc to the peripapillary area clearly, then that rules out uh, pseudopapillary edema and then the presence of capillary telangiectasia, presence of hemorrhages, all these favor uh, true disc edema. Also, if you see patterns lines, that is retinal folds, uh, that, is, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that is seen usually in a case of established disc edema, but then that indicates true disc edema. So thank you, Dr. Rehina, for that wonderful presentation. Now let's look into some of the practical aspects of neurophthal in detail. Now, there are various causes of headache. Now, when a patient with headache comes to you, Natasha, when do you suspect idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Yes, um, as ophthalmologists, we tend to trivialize headache a lot because we get a lot of headaches in the OPD. And uh, first thing, of course, we will be ruling out a refractive error. In Rahina's patient, you can see that the vision was six by six. So in that patient, if you see a disc edema, it is quite... Uh, like you can think that you should investigate for IIH, but when a patient has a small refractive error, we tend to think that, okay, that is probably the cause. <coughs> so here, the things that can guide you in thinking of IIH would be one is the history, because you should find out what time the headache happens. Is it in the morning? Is it associated with vomiting? Is the patient uh, like prone to getting migraine? Or if it is in the if it's a morning headache and it is not associated with eye strain, you should be thinking of uh, IIH. The other misleading thing is this fatty, fertile female thing because uh, uh, we have a lot of patients in all age groups who have. Uh, have been diagnosed with IAH. So it should not guide you that, okay, this is not the age group. Even six-year-old, seven-year-old children have been diagnosed with uh, IAH. 
So again, uh, your index of suspicion should be high when a patient with headache comes and very careful examination of the disc is essential when a patient uh, with headache comes to the OP. You need to look for mild papilledema. Some of these cases can be very subtle. You will easily send them off with glasses. So we have to look very carefully for any subtle uh, disc edema. The OCT RNFL will help you in guiding you if there is any uh, disc edema. And if there is any sign of disc edema with or without a refractive error, we should be investigating for uh, IIH. The most important thing is when we sit in the OPD and a headache comes to us, we should not trivialize it. And we should remember that underlying IIH can be missed and can end up in uh, uh, gross defective vision later on. Anna, can you stop sharing the screen? Yes. Natasha, then how do you proceed in confirming the diagnosis? Trisha, uh, you can start. intracranial sharing. hypertension is a diagnosis of exclusion. So uh, first of all, we have to rule out other things that can cause headache and uh, disc edema. So the uh, most important thing would be to investigate other than our ophthalmological investigations, like we said, the um, OCT, the HFA is a very important investigation that we can do that will give us an uh, enlargement of the blind spot. And if it's a long-standing IAH, it will give you construction of the fields as well. And then you have to rule out any space occupying <coughs> lesion with the MRI. The uh, IAH has only uh, the basic uh, thing about IAH is that the MRI should be normal. The only thing that is allowed is uh, uh, flattening of the cella and uh, uh, flattening of the gyri and the um, impression on the bone. Uh, that is the that those are the only things that are allowed uh, in I, uh, MRI in uh, diagnosis of IIH. The clinching diagnosis, of course, will be with a LP with a high opening pressure and a normal uh, CSF. Uh, it is important to start treatment and it's also important to monitor the treatment along with the neurologist if the neurologist is the starting, uh, is starting treatment and you have to follow up with fields and serial OCTs to see that the patient is well controlled with the medical management that is being given. And if it is extremely vision threatening, if the patient has reached you late and it is vision threatening, uh, we should be thinking of, uh, we can think of other uh, shunt-like drainage uh, to reduce the uh, CSF pressure. So anything basically it is... Answer, sir, would you like to add anything? Uh, I think uh, most important is papilledema symptoms. When you have a problem differentiating between papilledema and pseudopapilledema. You have, you know, five classical symptoms uh, a patient can tell you. Only if you ask. Transient blurring of vision, transient diplopia, tinnitus and uh, postural photopsia and uh, back pain or neck pain, interscapular pain. If you get one of these uh, symptoms, then you know the suspicion is very high that you are going to deal with a papilledema patient. Second is, you know, there are red flags for uh, CVT. If you are not getting an obese female patient in the reproductive age group, you have to be careful because one third of this IIH can be uh, CVT. So when you try to rule out CVT, you also have to ask for, again, papilledema symptoms and any prothrombotic state, any prothrombotic symptoms in the patient. That is uh, very important when you have a uh, uh, suspicious CVT. Secondly, any male patient with the bilateral papilledema, CVT has to be in mind. Any pre-menarche, you know, usually it is 20 to 40, uh, reproductive age group, if it is pre-menarche or post-menopause, again, you have to be careful. That is the time you have to go in for MRI contrast plus MRV. Because MRI contrast, you can get 90% of the thromb thrombotic lesions, but 10% you can miss. For that, you have to go in for MRV. And there are five signs in uh, uh, IIH. I think Dr. Uh, Nadasha discussed, but then I just highlight that again. Two in the brain. One is empty cella. Second is uh, transverse sinus stenosis, which can be physiological, but in a papilledema case, you know, this is very important. And three are in the orbit. One is, you know, subarachnoid space widening, perioptic subarachnoid space widening because of the CSF there, extra CSF there. Secondly, uh, posterior growth flattening because of CSF pressure. And third is 
optic papilla, protrusion of the optic papilla. So these are the three orbital signs where you can uh, confirm that it is IAH. And the other two are the brain signs where you can correlate. Thank you, sir, for giving us this very important practical pearls. And then, sir, uh, we see commonly demyelinating optic neuritis. Then how do you differentiate demyelinating optic neuritis from other optic neuropathies due to systemic and idiopathy causes? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandhya. You know, the commonest is always uh, demyelinating optic neuritis, where you have that classical uh, patient profile. The young patient or 20 to 40 year old patient, you know, presenting with uh, pain on eye movement. Some of them can get uh, orbital pain or headache prior to blurring of vision. So any blurring of vision uh, with disc edema, unilateral, the patient is in the 20 to 45 age group and uh, pain on eye movement, then you suspect, you know, retrobulbar neuritis or optic neuritis of demyelination. Now you go into inflammatory causes where you have, you know, age group can be any age group. So that is uh, uh, not very helpful if you look at the age. So if the patient is not fitting into 20 to 45, then you have to have this inflammatory origin uh, other than demyelination. Second is you go into the history, very important, because 20% of the optic neuritis can be the first manifestation of MS, multiple sclerosis. And uh, most of the MS patients will get optic neuritis over a period of time. So you have to be very careful about eliciting MS symptoms. There are six symptoms, all CNS symptoms, which I think uh, better to keep in mind. One is sensory symptoms, sensory disturbances, paresthesia, numbness, tingling. That is the commonest. Second is recurrent vertigo. So patient coming with blurring of vision, you diagnose optic neuritis. So you have to ask for the symptoms, recurrent vertigo, and diplopia on and off, three. Then for this trigeminal neuralgia, they can get trigeminal neuralgia, usually bilateral. And uh, fifth is lermit sign. You flex the neck, you get an electrical shock-like sensation shooting down the back. And also Uthoff phenomenon, heat and exercise exacerbating CNS symptoms. Now, if you go into inflammatory, you have mostly autoimmune inflammatory conditions like SLE, sarcoid, I think Dr. Lediga discussed, discussed it properly. And you have uh, giant cell arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, Kawasaki. So, you know, they are all autoimmune. So you get, other than CNS, other systemic symptoms. So if there is any other systemic symptom, then you consider that as inflammatory, other than demyelination. Then the third is, you know, uh, the visual blur and pain will stabilize in optic neuritis of demyelination by second week or third week. If it is not stabilizing, if it is progressing, then you have to give importance for inflammatory optic neuritis. Then response to steroids. In optic neuritis, you know, it is spontaneous recovery. But in inflammatory, it is a dramatic response. But more importantly, you stop the steroids, you know, the symptoms, visual blur and pain recur. So that is very important, that response to steroids. Then if you look at the MRI, you know, you have to look for uh, MRI uh, brain and MRI orbit. That is why you, are, you have to give uh, contrast. When you give instruction to the radiologist, contrast is important and dedicated orbital cuts are important then only you can get optic nerve enhancement in optic neuritis. At the same time, you look at the brain, the white matter hypersignals or MS, and also cerebellar plaque-like lesions of MS. And in uh, inflammatory lesion, what you get is perineural enhancement, especially when the inflammation is confined to the orbit, like idiopathic orbital inflammation, that is known as perineuritis. So where you get you know, perineural enhancement or optic nerve sheath enhancement, and also you can get uh, uh, fatty enhancement. The retrobulbar fat will get enhanced and some of the muscles also can get enhanced. So this is the way you roughly differentiate between inflammatory origin, Excellent, sir. autoimmune Excellent, sir. origin. And, uh, I yeah. think we should keep some uh, for the neuro-ophthalmology uh, emer uh, emergency neuro-ophthalmology meet also that we are having on 16th. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Thank I think you. we should move to the next case. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Thank you, COC here. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah.
Yeah, this was the case scenario given to me, 29-year-old lady with unilateral redness, pain and flutters with AC reaction and vitreous case. Luckily, he didn't mention about any uh, status of retina. So uh, I think these, uh, these clinical features in various combination, we can explain the whole UVA entities. And I will start in a stepwise manner how to approach a case of uveitis. So um, we should start with uh, identify the uh, uveitis, then identify the location, whether it is anterior, intermediate, and posterior. Find out whether it is active or inactive, uh, whether it is infectious or inflammatory or masquerades, whether systemic evaluation needed or not. And then based on all these, uh, decide on the treatment whether local or systemic steroids or immunosuppression and monitor it accordingly, then look for the complications. This right protocol can prevent permanent vision loss. So we'll start from history as mentioned by various speakers. History taking is very important in managing a case of uh, uh, uveitis. This uh, middle-aged man presented with severe non-granulomatous acute anterior uveitis and in history he gave recurrent episodes prior, and he also had low backache and uh, neck stiffness, especially in morning hours. So the clue is HLA-B27 associated uveitis. But eliciting history may not be as easy always. Uh, for example, this young engineering student presented with grade two vitritis and fundus examination showed a patch of uh, exudate in the peripheral retina. And in the third visit only, we could elicit the history of IV drug abuse. So the initial evaluation all were within normal limit, but after that history, we could diagnose it as endogenous endophthalmitis. And in treatment history, this middle-aged lady uh, presented with acute onset, mild anterior uveitis of one day duration. And she also gave a history of CA breast treated five years prior and she had taken an injection solidronic acid one day prior, and that is the cause for anterior uveitis here. We need not have to work up any further in this type of uveitis. And uh, regarding the onset of the disease, uh, this post cataract surgery patient presented with recurrent episodes of uveitis, but all the episodes started only after cataract surgery. And on examination, we could see some deposition on the uh, posterior capsule and it was P acne and ophthalmitis. Sometimes history may mislead us also. For example, this lady presented with uh, uh, defective vision. She was uh, vaginous granulomatosis patient on immunosuppression, even though the history uh, more of like uh, inflammatory condition. Uh, on examination, she had minimum vitritis with a lot of retinitis patches and it was a CMB positive uh, CMB retinitis. Now come to general examination. Along with the history, a proper general examination is also a must for the uveitis diagnosis. For example, a young male presented with a hypopion anterior uveitis, grade two vitritis and extensive vasculitis. On examination, he had a painful aphthous ulcer with a genital ulcer and joint involvement. So it was best such. But VKH syndrome, uh, of course, in the initial stages may not present with uh, uh, very much uh, systemic, eval uh, systemic involvement, but in later cases may present with alopecia and vitiligo. This young lady presented with occlusive vasculitis like picture and on examination, we could see the malar rash. So it's an SLA retinopathy. A child presented with a chronic uveitis with white eye and there is features of band-shaped keratopathy on examination. He had swollen joints and deformity. So it's a JIA associated uveitis. A meticulous slit lamp examination is also very important. Uh, for example, uh, we should be able to uh, detect, identify whether it is granulomatous or non-granulomatous anterior uveitis so that we can cut short the list of investigations. For example, uh, this is a typical example for uh, granulomatous uveitis with mutton fat KPs. And patient may have uh, first planar snow banking exudate, corridor nodules, and on evaluation, uh, he had uh, uh, hilar lymphadenopathy. And sometimes the clue will be hiding somewhere, like in this case, the lepra nodules 
seen in a mild anterior uveitis patient and that's a leprosy associated anterior uveitis. And these days we are seeing many patients with a pigmented KPs and pigmented AC reaction with a high IOP. It's a, an example for viral anterior uveitis and uh, checking IOP in the initial visit as well as in the subsequent visits are very important. And after examining the eye proper, also we should uh, have a look into the other eye also because, uh, uh, for example, in this granulomatous pan uveitis, other eye uh, showed a thysical eye with the history of trauma. So it's an example of sympathetic ophthalmia. Uh, again, a proper indirect ophthalmoscopy and uh, proper peripheral uh, fundus evaluation is also very important in each and every visit of a uveitis patient. For example, this child presented with very minimal vitritis, but in the periphery, there was a cyst. Uh, it was a cysticercosis patient. Yes. And uh, another patient presented with very minimal uh, floaters and fundus examination in the periphery, there was a retinitis patch and it was a VZB positive case. We could uh, uh, prevent a, uh, total vision loss if we detect early. A proper fundus examination, if not done, we can miss all these uh, active toxoplasma retinitis patches. And uh, this type of rare presentation, sensibility chorioretinitis also, we may miss it without a proper uh, peripheral examination. We all know that uh, TB can have various manifestations from anterior segment to posterior segment as uh, anterior scleritis, granulomatous or non-granulomatous anterior uveitis, iris nodule, intermediate uveitis, vitritis, uh, uh, choroiditis, vasculitis, neuroretinitis, or even as choroidal abscess. So we should rule out TB in all uveitis cases. And sometimes re repeated uh, fundus evaluation in the same visit or a fundus photography may give us some clue regarding the diagnosis. For example, this in this uh, patient, uh, the retinitis patches are arranged in a peculiar pattern and uh, on careful examination, we can see the worm. So the diagnosis is DUSM. Of course, we, uh, FFA has a role in the diagnosis of all posterior uveitis and it is. But uh, it's an, since it's an invasive method, non-invasive method investigations like OCT with EDI may help you to identify the early recurrence of an inflammatory pathology. And fundus autofluorescence can pick up early recurrence of serpiginous choroiditis. And uh, it can also pick up an early re reactivation of toxo. And uh, FFA can give you, at least sometimes FFA can give you the, uh, an idea about the actual extent of the disease. Sometimes fundus examination uh, it looks very silent, but FFA shows extensive vasculopathy. Of course, uh, we scan uh, to look for T sign in a suspected posterior scleritis. And uh, remember about non-UVIT conditions also. Uh, commonly, chronic uh, CSR and multifocal CSR may mimic exactly like uh, choroiditis, but there won't be any inflammatory signs and FFA will give you a clue. And we should keep it in mind, other masquerades like retinoblastoma can present as uh, hypopion uveitis. And here, a 55-year-old male presented with a hypopion uveitis, not responding to steroids. And it was a chronic myeloid leukemia. And again, a chronic smoker presented with a choroidal mass. And there was no evidence of any inflammation. And later proved to be choroidal metastasis from a uh, CLM. Intraocular lymphoma may mimic exactly like choroiditis, vitritis, But the FNAC uh, will help you uh, for the diagnosis. And while treating uh, uveitis, uh, we should identify the complications also in healed as well as in the active stage. Uh, these are some of the complications like CNVM and uh, secondary C cataract. While starting treatment, we should not forget about the side effects. We should monitor the side effects. Uh, by checking BP, blood sugar uh, routinely, we should uh, supplement calcium. We should include either a physician or a rheumatologist in the treatment team and should discontinue treatment in case of serious side effects. And should not hesitate to start steroid sparing agents, at least in uh, some cases, so that we can avoid a vision loss. 
should uh, consider sustained release steroids also, uh, especially if there is a chronic CME not resolving. So there is no need of any take home message. So the pearls are uh, proper history taking, physical examination, meticulous of ocular examination, exclude uh, an in infectious cause, and do not miss any active inflammation and do not forget nasquerades. Think about non-uveitic conditions, identify complications, and monitor treatment for a better outcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Risha and Dr. Rathana, both of you presented excellently. Now I have two questions to uh, Dr. Santhya. Uh, first question, uh, in toxoplasmosis, how will you manage and the role of IV clindamycin in toxoplasmosis? Dr. Santhya, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, the diagnosis toxoplasmosis is basically clinical. As uh, Dr. Risha showed, the typical yellowish white retinitis lesion with overlying vitreous inflammation, giving a headlight in fog appearance, should raise the suspicion of uh, toxoplasmosis. And you can also see the surrounding retinal edema. There can be evidence of vasculitis, and there may be uh, nodular periarteritis like chiriliasis arteritis. And uh, previous scar may or may not be present. So in these cases, you can go. Uh, you can straight away start treatment. Meanwhile, you can send the patient for serology. And if the serology comes uh, negative, then you should rule out other causes of retinitis like syphilis, uh, herpes, CMV, etc. Now, there are various treat treatment regimens for toxoplasmosis. You can give either cotrimoxazole, double strength twice daily, or clindamycin, or azithromycin. Then the treat uh, dosage of azithromycin is slightly different that you get from the normal. You should give 500 milligram once daily for three days. This is followed by 250 milligram once daily. And the treatment should be continued for an adequate period of time, as Dr. Giridas has said. So minimum for a period of six weeks. This is very important. And another thing is the collateral damage that is produced is mainly because of inflammation. So you should uh, uh, you need to add oral steroids along with antibacterial. So you can give oral steroid at a dose of one milligram per kg which should be tapered according to the inflammatory response over a period of four to five weeks. Now, how do you assess the response? Uh, the response, uh, when, there is, when the patient starts responding, there'll be reduction in the vitreous inflammation and the toxo lesions start healing from periphery to center. So the margins uh, becomes rounded and it becomes more sharp. The edema comes down and the color slightly changes to grayish white and then it, uh, this, there will be reduction in the size of the lesion. So you can follow up accordingly and then con uh, continue and uh, it should be continued for an adequate period of around six weeks. Now, uh, intravital clindamycin, it is usually given in pregnant ladies and in those who are intolerant to oral medications. It is given at a dose of one milligram in 0.1 ml. You can repeat it weekly for three to four weeks till you see an adequate response. Now, toxoplasmosis in immunocompromised, uh, there is a slightly atypical presentation. The lesions will be multifocal and they coalesce to form larger confluent lesions. The vitreous inflammation will be minimal. You may not see, most probably, you may not see the old healed scars uh, in these patients. And the lesions tend to be perivascular uh, in such immunocompromised patients. So in these patients, you need to continue treatment for a long period of time. You can give the same uh, uh, medicines like or trimoxazole, double strength, et cetera, but it should be continued for a long period of time. Then uh, toxoplasmosis, one word about toxoplasmosis in pregnancy. So the management depends on uh, the time of infection. That is whether it, the patient has occurred it during pregnancy or three months before conception. That is if it is a reactivation of chronic toxoplasmosis, then you can, the risk of uh, transmission to fetus is minimal. So you can treat it with intravitreal uh, clindamycin. But if the, uh, it is a primary acquired toxoplas uh, toxoplasmosis during pregnancy, then the risk of transmission to the fetus is less in the first trim trimester, but the consequences are devastating. But in the last trimester, there's a high chance of transmission around 60 to 80% uh, to the fetus. And most of these uh, affected uh, fetus, their uh, children, they manifest, may manifest the disease in the late childhood or in early adolescence. So if you see uh, primary acquired toxoplasmosis in pregnancy where IgG and IgM are positive, 
you should treat the patient uh, uh, treatment patient so spiramycin is uh, the most safest one but uh, it can be given 1 gram three times a day throughout the period of gestation but if the availability is a problem then other options are azithromycin and clindamycin this can be given and then if you suspect or if you confirm diagnose uh, infection of the fetus by pcr from amniotic fluid with supportive evidence of ultrasound showing hepatosplenomegaly hydrocephalus etc then you need to add cortrimoxazole along with spiramycin so okay thank you i have one more question for you uh, surgery in a complicated cataract what are the difficulties and what precautions will you take in complicated cataract okay sir uh, around 40% of uh, visual loss in uveitis is because of cataract and there are three important aspects in this one is uh, the type of uveitis uh, and the other thing is what are the associated comorbidities that the patient has and then uh, uh, the perioperative control of inflammation that is type of uveitis sudden uveitis like fuchs uveitis they have got good prognosis uh because the chance of because there is uh, unlikely to form posterior synecha and macular edema whereas more severe uveitis like pan uveitis j associated uveitis basets etc they uh, the prognosis is uh, not that good so uh, next thing is that you should uh, uh, give the patient a uh, an idea of what to expect after surgery for that it is important to look for other uh, associated uh, features like macular atrophy optic atrophy epithelial membrane band keratopathy etc that are associated with uveitis so you can give the patient a realistic realistic expectation after surgery so in these cases the oct and ultrasound will be of great help and the patient should be informed that they um, require more frequent follow up than normal uh, cataract patients now coming to the perioperative control that is the most important aspect of uh, surgery in complicated cataracts so uh, in patients with fuchs uveitis so you can go ahead with cataract surgery even when there are few cells because uh, it will not produce too much of post op inflammation so you can uh, give uh, topical steroids one week before surgery and you can continue it after surgery according to the response according to the response and now but in patients with jaa what we aim is zero tolerance to inflammation that is there should be no cells for a period of minimum of 3 months prior to surgery this is very important because in these patients there is high chance of membrane formation posterior synecha formation cyclitic membrane formation etc so the should be absolutely inflammation free for at least a minimum of 3 months so this is the most important uh, aspect in the management of uh, uvat cataracts and then coming to some of the uh, then another aspect is uh, how do you control this inflammation that is if the patient is already on immunosuppressive therapy you should not stop it you continue it at the same level and if the patient is already having uh, already on chronic steroids then what should you do you should do is you should step up the steroids around 3 days prior to surgery and then maintain it for a few uh, weeks post op and then taper it very slowly according to the clinical response to the pre surgery level and then uh, even if the eye is quiet in patients when there is extensive synecha uh, uh, organized membrane etc there is high chance of post operative inflammation so you should treat them with perioperative steroids and then uh, if the patient cannot tolerate high amount uh, dose of steroids what you can do is you can uh, especially the patient is having re refractory cystoid macular edema to prevent recurrence and uh, to uh, prevent worsening you can give uh, intravitreal osudex along with the cataract surgery or another option is you can give posterior subtenant strams in alone 3 uh, to 5 days prior to surgery and then go ahead with surgery so coming to, uh, shall i talk about the I surgical think, uh, aspect dr gobal we have time yeah i think i, I think we should go to the last question to dr nadasha okay. 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 okay 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 so last question to dr nadasha uh, dr nadasha how you approach a case of pediatric uveitis be very brief okay um thank you sir pediatric uveitis uh, we should remember uh, in adult uveitis when the patient comes we often get a very good history we often are able to examine very nicely so uh, most of the time during our examination itself we get a clue as to what the diagnosis is the difference in pediatric will be that it is very difficult to examine the child in the first place as well as to get a good history 
So here we have to be very uh, diligent in doing that, especially dilating and seeing the fundus. Many times pediatric uveitis is uh, sent off as an anterior uveitis without having a look at the fundus. So uh, dilated examination at, at the first visit itself will give us a clue as to what the cause is. Uh, the white eye, red eye differentiation in pediatric uveitis, of course, is very uh, known to everybody. So the most common thing that we see in the white eye is a JIA uveitis. Uh, the, the systemic examination of the pediatric uveitis is also important. Most of the time, we are not able to do it ourselves. So you should get the colleague pediatrician or rheumatologist to do a thorough systemic examination. Not all uveitis is uh, uh, simple in children. They, they will be associated with a lot of systemic conditions other than JIA also like sarcoidosis. Some of them may have some parasitic infection. They may be post-viral. There are a lot of other causes also, which you may miss if you do not do a complete systemic examination for the child. The other important thing in uh, pediatric uveitis is, of course, the masquerades, because if you have not done a thorough examination, you will miss an underlying uh, retinoblastoma or a juvenile xanthogranuloma. So I would say that pediatric uveitis should not be taken lightly. Every case of pediatric uveitis needs to be investigated in detail, both systemic as well as ocular. Okay, thank you. I, I think I, uh, can I ask one doubt? Up. Yeah, Prisha, please. Um, uh, the literature says uh, secondary CNVM due to toxoplasma scar uh, while injecting uh, anti-VEGF. We are supposed to give, uh, give a coverage of uh, uh, antibiotic and detox or antibiotic also, even though there is no activity. Any opinion regarding that or any experience? Even though the, it's, it's a scar. I feel it uh, completely depends on whether the toxoplasma is active. When there is a CNVM, you cannot be completely sure whether the it's basically part of it is toxoplasma activity or see definitely there is a cnvm but is the cnvm on top of an active toxoplasma or a scarred toxoplasma we may be we not we may not be able to completely uh, tell that that is why probably uh, you know you add that anti toxoplasma treatment uh, to that that is all it says injecting anti vegf can trigger an active reactivation of okay okay that is also possible it is an excellent uh, uh, yeah, yeah. August of Talmika, sir. Uh, like uh, all all topics covered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, right from the major uh, credit. Of the major credit uh, for organizing this obviously goes to Dr. Gopal. He was the one who envisaged the entire program, selected most of the faculty, even the topics. So Gopal has pulled off another great CME. But then the, the work is not over. Every Sunday. <laughs> as long as there are Sundays. Every Sunday till September, uh, we have something or the other. So, uh, we have to keep going in the same momentum. But anyway, uh, it's a, it was a great program. Uh, I think uh, and we have to thank all the faculty and uh, especially Zibira for having... Uh, uh, yeah, there are about 1,800 views uh, so far on uh, YouTube. And uh, then there may be a lot more on Facebook as well. So we, our program is covered uh, to about 2,000 ophthalmologists. Uh, so that is a very good number, I think. Excellent, excellent. I think Omar has about 30, 30 hours in a day. Even if we all have 24 hours. <laughs> so uh, Thomas, uh, you can just uh, conclude, chairman of our scientific committee, you can make the concluding remarks. Yeah. Thomas could not welcome us properly, so let him. <laughs> at least, at least I'll conclude. conclude today. <laughs> no, one thing I want to tell: when I thanked, I I did not thank my president, Dr. Sai Kumar. <laughs> no need to thank me. Of course, all my feelings and you know, whenever anything is said, he will he will be just beyond that and tell yes. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. That that is the teamwork that we have. Yeah. That is a wonderful, wonderful uh, CME, probably the first August of Talmika on a Zoom platform, and uh, it is just wonderful. Okay, uh, and we, um, uh, Gobal expected this to go up to three o'clock, but we have finished, somehow managed to finish by almost two. That's again by, a great by achievement. Two, we have managed to wind up. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks a lot for the wonderful uh, program. Closing remarks, uh, Thomas. Well, uh, uh, big thanks to everyone, especially Gopal, 
uh, as I said, he's got a few extra hours in a day. Unlike, uh, unlike, like we all have 24. I think he has 30 hours in a day, and his energy is uh, unmatched. And Dr. Saikmar, of course, leading from the front, and uh, all the faculty, all the speakers. A special thanks to outside faculty, M. Francis sir, Sarsanam sir, and all the all the all the uh, senior teachers. And of course, uh, Girdar sir is a very deserving uh, person for this award. I think it makes the prestige of the award go up. Um, and also for the excellent participation from all the of all the viewers. Thank you very much, and we we'll hope to see you again next Sunday. Thank you. Suturing webinar. <clears throat> Thank you. Suturing webinar on next Sunday. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's a going to be a unique program. So whoever watching today, uh, uh, we'll share, share the link, uh, YouTube and Facebook links. And please join us uh, for the suturing webinar. Uh, Gopal, the time is for evening, no? Six to nine. Mm, I need to look at it. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it's an evening. It's, a, it's, all, uh, it's Marianne, like a super Sunday. You know? no? It is yes. mainly for the PGs. It's in the afternoon. 2 p.m. onwards. Uh, 3 p.m. onwards. I think, yeah, I think it's 3 p.m. onwards. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's we'll 3 p.m. onwards. And we'll the week the week after that is a neuro ophthalmology yeah. meeting. Yeah, that yeah. is on 16th. That is on that is between six and nine p.m. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. For thank you. Thank you. It was a long day, Sony. <laughs> As is any other day. <laughs> uh, now there is a problem. Now I can end the meeting. Then everybody will just go.